They marched after dark. Donahue insisted on coming, and fifty of his men came too. More would have marched, but Sharp wanted most of the Real Compagnie Irlandese to stay behind and guard the families and baggage. Everyone and everything left in the San Isidro fort had been moved into the gatehouse, just in case Lou did come back to finish off his previous night's work. Which will be just my bloody luck, Sharp said. Me marching to shoot him, and him marching to geld me. He had his riflemen ranging ahead as scouts, just in case the French were returning to the San Isidro. What do we do if we meet them? Donahue asked. Hide, Sharp said. Seventy of us can't beat a thousand of them, not in the open. An ambush might work this night, but not a far fight on open level moonlit ground against an overwhelming enemy. And I hate night fighting, Sharp went on. I was captured in a bloody night fight in India. We were blundering around in the sodding dark with no one knowing what they were doing or why, except for the Indians, and they knew well enough. They were firing rockets at us. The things were no bloody use as weapons, but at night their fire blinded us. And the next thing I knew, there were twenty big buggers with fixed bayonets all around me. Where was that? Donahue asked. Saringa Patam. What business did you have in India? Donahue asked in evident disapproval. Same business I've got here, Sharp said curtly. Killing the king's enemies. El Castrador wanted to know what they were talking about, so Donahue translated. The partisan was suffering because Sharp had refused to let anyone ride a horse. So El Castrador's horse, like the horses of the Spanish-Irish officers, was being led at the column's rear. Sharp had insisted on the precaution because men on horses were liable to ride away from the line of march, and the sight of a mounted man on a crest could easily serve to alert a French patrol. Sharp had similarly insisted that no man carry a loaded musket, in case a stumble snapped a lock and fired a shot that would carry fire in the still, almost windless night. The march wasn't hard. The first hour was the worst, for they had to climb the steep hill opposite the San Isidro. But once over the crest, the road kept a fairly level ground. It was a drover's road, grassy, wide, and easy marching in the cool night air. The route wound lazily between rocky outcrops where enemy pickets could have been hidden. Normally Sharp would have reconnoitred such dangerous places. This night he pushed his scouts urgently ahead. He was in a dangerous and fatalistic mood. Maybe he thought this reckless march was the aftermath of defeat, a kind of shocked reaction in which a man lashed out blindly, and this daft expedition under the half-moon was undoubtedly blind. The Sharp knew in his inmost soul that the unfinished business between himself and Brigadier Lou would almost certainly stay unfinished. No man could expect to march by night towards a fortified village that he had not reconnoitred and then spring an ambush. The odds were that the small expedition would watch the village from afar. Sharp would conclude that nothing could be achieved against its walls or in the nearby defile and in the dawn the guards and riflemen would march back to San Isidro with nothing but sore feet and a wasted night. It was just after midnight when the column reached the low ridge that overlooked the valley of San Cristobal. Sharp rested the men behind the crest while he climbed to the top with El Castrador, Donahue, and Harper. The four men lay in the rocks and watched. The grey stone of the village was blanched near white by the moonlight which cast stark shadows from the intricate web of stone walls that marked the fields around the small settlement. The lime-washed bell tower of the church seemed to glow, so clear was the night and so bright the half-moon that hung above the glimmering hills. Sharp trained his telescope on the tower, and though he could plainly see the untidy stork's nest on top and the sheen of the moon glancing from a bell suspended in the tower's arched opening, he could see no sentries there. But nor would he necessarily expect to see a picket, for any man keeping watch through a cold, long night in a high, vulnerable place would be likely to huddle for shelter in a corner of the tower. San Cristobal looked as though it had been a pleasant village before Lou's brigade came to evict the inhabitants and destroy their livelihood. The sturdy field walls had been built to keep fighting bulls safely penned, and those bulls had paid for the church and houses that all showed a touch of affluence in the lens of Sharps's telescope. At Fuentes de Onoro, the tiny village where he'd first met El Castrador, the cottages had been mostly low and virtually windowless, but some of San Cristobal's houses had two stories, and nearly all the outward-facing walls possessed windows, and even in one case a small balcony. Sharp assumed there'd be pickets in half those windows. He traced the line of the drover's road with his telescope to see that where a track left the road to become the village's main street, 
A stone wall had been built between two houses. There was a gap in the wall, but Sharp could just make out the shadowy hint of a second wall beyond the first. He made a zigzag motion with his hand as he looked at El Castrador. The gate, senor. See, si. three walls. El Castrador exaggerated the zigzag gesture to show how complicated the maze-like entrance was. Such a maze would slow down any attacker while loose men poured musket fire down from the upper windows. How do they get their horses inside? Donahue asked in Spanish. Around the far side, El Castrador answered. There is a gate, very strong. And the defile, senor, is on the far side of the village. Where the road goes into the hill, see? We should go there? Right now, Sharp said. His hope in El Castrador's defile had vanished the moment he saw where it was. The gorge might be a perfect place for a surprise attack, but it was too far away, and Sharp knew he'd have no chance of reaching it before daylight. So much for his hopes of ambush. He turned the spyglass back to the village just in time to see a flicker of motion. He tensed, then saw it was merely a puff of smoke coming from a chimney deep in the village. The smoke had been there all the time, but someone must have dumped wood on the fire, or else tried to revive a hearth of smouldering embers with a pair of bellows, and so provoked the sudden gust of smoke. They're all tucked up in bed, Donahue said. Safe and sound. Sharp edged the telescope across the village roofs. No flag, he said at last. Does he usually fly a flag? he asked El Castrador. The big man shrugged. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. He plainly didn't know the answer. Sharp collapsed the telescope. Put a dozen men on guard, Donahue, he ordered, and tell the rest to sleep a while. Pat, send Latimer and a couple of the lads to that knoll. He indicated a rocky height that would offer the best view of the surrounding country. And you and the rest of the rifles will come with me. Upper paused as though he wanted to ask for details of what they planned to do, then decided mute obedience was the best course and slid back off the crest. Donahue frowned. I can't come with you. Someone has to take charge if I die, Sharp said, so keep watch. Stay here till three in the morning, and if you haven't heard from me by then, go home. And what do you plan to do there? Donahue asked, gesturing towards the village. It doesn't smell right, Sharp said. I can't explain it, but it doesn't smell right. So I'm just going to take a look. Nothing more, Donahue, just a look. Captain Donahue was still unhappy at being excluded from Sharp's patrol, yet he still didn't like to contradict Sharp's plans. Sharp, after all, was a fighting soldier, and Donahue had only one night's experience of battle. What do I tell the British if you die? he asked Sharp chidingly. To take my boots off before they bury me, Sharp said. I don't want blisters through eternity. He turned to see Harper leading a file of riflemen up the slope. Ready, Pat? Aye, sir. You'll stay here, Sharp said to El Castrador, not quite as a question, but not quite a direct order either. I shall wait here, senor. The partisan's tone betrayed that he had no wish to get any closer to the wolf's lair. Sharp led his men southwards behind the crest until a broken stretch of rocks offered a patch of shadow that took them safe down to the nearest stone wall. They moved fast, despite having to go at a crouch, but the shadows of the stone walls offered black lanes of invisibility that angled towards the village. Halfway across the valley floor, Sharp stopped and made a cautious reconnaissance with his telescope. He could see now that all the lower windows in the village had been blocked with stone, leaving only the inaccessible upper windows free for lookouts. He could also see the foundations of houses that had been demolished outside the village's defensive perimeter, so that no attacker would have shelter close to San Cristobal. Blue had taken the additional precaution of knocking down the dry stone walls that lay within close musket range of the village. Sharp could get as near as sixty or seventy paces, but after that he'd be as visible as a blowfly on a lime-washed wall. Bogger's taking no chances, Harper said. Well, can you blame him? Sharp answered. I'd knock down a few walls to stop El Casador practicing his technique on me. So what do we do? Harper asked. Don't know yet. Nor did Sharp know. He'd come to within rifle range of his enemy's stronghold, and he could feel no prickle of fear. Indeed, he could feel no apprehension at all. Maybe, he thought, Lube wasn't here. Or maybe, more worryingly, Sharp's instincts were out of kilter. 
Maybe Lou was the puppet master here, and he was enticing Sharp ever closer, lulling his victim into a fatal sense of security. Someone's there, Harper said, anticipating Sharp's thoughts. Else there'd be no smoke. Sensible thing to do, Sharp said, is for us to bugger off out of here and go to bed. Sensible thing to do, Harper said, is get out the bloody army and day in bed. But that's not why we joined, is it? Speak for yourself, sir. I just joined to get a square meal, Harper said. He primed his rifle, then similarly armed the seven-barrel gun. Getting killed wasn't really part of the idea at all. I joined so as not to be strung from a gallows, Sharp said. He primed his own rifle, then gazed again at the village's moon-washed walls. Damn it, he said, I'm going closer. It was like the game children play when they tried to see how close they could creep to a victim without their movements being observed. And suddenly, in Sharp's mind, the village assumed a childlike menace almost as though it were a malevolent but sleeping castle that must be approached with enormous stealth, in case it stirred and destroyed him. Yet why bother to risk destruction, he asked himself, and he could give himself no answer to the question, except that he had not come this close to the stronghold of the man who had made himself into Sharp's bitterest enemy just to turn and walk ignominiously away. Watch the windows, he told his men. Then he sneaked along the base of the shadowed wall until at last the stones ran out, and there was only a spill of fallen rocks to show where once the wall had stood. But at least that spill of stones offered a patchy tangle of concealing shadows. Sharp stared at that tangle, wondering if the shadows were sufficient to hide a man. And then he looked up at the village. Nothing stirred except the haze of wood smoke tugged by the night's small wind. Come back, sir, Harper called softly. But instead Sharp took a breath, lay flat and edged out into the moonlight. He was slithering like a snake between the rocks, so slowly that he trusted no watcher would detect his moving shape amidst the patchwork of shadows. His belt and looped uniform kept snagging on stones, but each time he eased himself free and crept a few feet onwards before freezing to listen again. He was anticipating the telltale sound of a musket being cocked, the heavy double click that would presage a crashing shot. He heard nothing except the soft sound of the wind. Not even a dog barked. He went closer and closer until at last the jumbled stones ended and there was only moonlit open ground between himself and the high wall of the nearest house. He stared up at the window and saw nothing. He could smell nothing but the rank odour of the dung heaps in the town. No smell of tobacco, no saddle sores, no stink of unwashed uniforms. There was the faint hint of wood smoke sweetening the stench of dung, but otherwise no suggestion of human presence in the village. Two bats wheeled close to the wall, their ragged wings flickering black against the lime wash. Sharp, now that he was close to the village, could see the signs of neglect. The lime wash was wearing thin. Slates had slipped from the roofs, and the window frames had been torn apart for firewood. The French had displaced St. Christopher's inhabitants and made it a village of ghosts. Sharp's heart thumped hard, echoing in his ears as he lay straining for any clue as to what lay behind the blank, silent walls. He cocked his rifle, and the click sounded unnaturally loud in the night. But no one called a challenge from the village. Bugger it! He had not meant to speak aloud, but had, and as he spoke, so he stood up. He could almost sense Harper taking a nervous breath a hundred paces behind him. Sharp stood, and waited. And no one spoke. No one called, no one challenged, and no one shot. He felt suspended between life and death, almost as if the whole spinning earth had become as fragile as a blown glass ball that could be shattered by a single loud noise. He walked towards the village that lay just twenty paces away. The loudest noises in the night were the sounds of his boots on the grass and of the breath in his throat. He reached out and touched the cold stone wall, and no one fired, and no one challenged. And so Sharp walked on around the village's edge, past the stone-blocked windows and the wall-barricaded streets, until he came at last to the maze-like entrance. He stopped five paces short of the gate's outer wall. He licked his lips and stared at the dark gap. Was he being watched? Was Lou, like a sorcerer in a tower, drawing him on?
Were the French holding their breath and scarcely believing their luck as their victim came to them, step by slow step? Was the night about to explode in stark horror, in gunfire and slaughter, defeat and pain? The thought almost made Sharp walk away from the village, but his pride stopped him from retreating, and the pride was monstrous enough to make him step one pace closer to the labyrinthine gate. Then another pace, and another, and suddenly he was there, in the gate's opening itself, and nothing moved. Not a breath stirred. In front of him was the blank second wall with its enticing opening off to Sharp's left. He sidled into the gap, closed off now from the moonlight and from the sight of his rifleman. He was in the maze, in Lou's trap now, and he edged down the narrow gap between the walls with his rifle pointed and his finger on the trigger. He came to the gap and saw a third blank wall ahead, and so he stepped through into the last narrow passage that led to his right and thus to the final gap in the last wall. His feet scraped on stone. His breath boomed. There was moonlight beyond the third wall, but inside the labyrinth it was dark and cold. He had his back pressed hard against the middle wall, and he took an odd comfort from the solid feel of the stone. He edged sideways again, tried to ignore the pumping of his heart, then took a deep breath, dropped to one knee, and threw himself sideways in one motion, so that he was kneeling in the last entrance to Lou's village, with his rifle aimed straight down the stone-paved street towards the whitewashed church. And in front of him was nothing. No one called in triumph, no one sneered, no one ordered his capture. Sharp let out a long breath. It was a cold night, but sweat was trickling down his face and stinging his eyes. He shivered then lowered the rifle's muzzle. And the howling began. Chapter 6 He's mad, Hogan, Wellington said. Stark mad. Gibbering should be locked up in Bedlam where we could pay sixpence to go and mock him. Ever been to Bedlam? Uh, once, my lord, just the once. Hogan's horse was tired and fretful for the Irishman had ridden long and hard to find the general, and he was somewhat confused by the abrupt greeting. Hogan was also in the disobliging mood of a man woken too early, yet he somehow managed to respond to Wellington's jocular greeting in a similar vein. My sister wanted to see the lunatics, my lord, but as I recall, he only paid top and siege. They shall lock us, get up, Wellington said grimly, and charge a popular stop and piece to view him. Still, even Erskine should manage this job, eh? All he has to do is stop the place up, not actually capture it. Wellington was inspecting the grim defences surrounding the French-held town of Almeida. Every now and then a gun would fire from the fortress town and the flat, hard sound of the shop would echo across the rolling country a few seconds after the shot itself had bounced in a flurry of early morning dew and bounded harmlessly off towards fields or woods. Wellington, attended by a dozen aides and gallopers and starkly lit by the long slanting rays of the just-risen sun, made a ripe target for the French gunners. But his lordship ignored their efforts. Instead, almost in mockery of the enemy's marksmanship, he would stop wherever the terrain offered a view and stare at the town, which had possessed a peculiar flat-topped appearance ever since the cathedral and castle on Almeida's hilltop had exploded in a massive eruption of stored powder. That explosion had forced the British and Portuguese defenders to surrender the fortress town to the French, who in turn were now ringed by British troops under the command of Sir William Erskine. Erskine's men were under orders to contain the garrison, not capture it, and indeed none of Erskine's guns was large enough to make any impression on the massive star-shaped fortifications. How many of the scoundrels are in there, Hogan? Wellington asked, ignoring the fact that Hogan would not have ridden hard across country so early in the day without bringing some important news. We think fifteen hundred men, my lord. Mm. Ammunition? Plenty. And how much food do they have? And my sources say two weeks and half rations, which probably means they can last a month. The French do seem able to subsist on nothing, my lord. Might I suggest we move before a gunner lays an accurate sight, and might I claim your lordship's further attention? Wellington did not move. I am claiming the gunners' whole attention, the general said with heavy humour, as a means of encouraging them to improve their aim. That way, Hogan, they might relieve me of Erskine. General Erskine was usually drunk, perpetually half-blind, and reputed to be mad. 
Also, the horse guards confessed to me, Wellington said, expecting Hogan to follow his erratic train of thought. I wrote to them, Hogan, and uh, complained of being provided with Erskine, and you know what they wrote back. Wellington had told Hogan this story at least half a dozen times in the last three months, but the Irishman knew how much the general enjoyed the telling of it, and so he indulged his master. I fear their reply has momentarily slipped my mind, my lord. They wrote Hogan, and I quote, that no doubt he is sometimes a little mad, but in his lucid intervals he is an uncommonly clever fellow. But he did look a little wild as he embarked. Wellington gave his great horse neigh of a laugh. So, will Massania try to relieve the garrison? Hogan understood from the general's tone that Wellington knew the answer as well as he did himself, and so he sensibly said nothing. The answer, anyway, was obvious, for both Hogan and Wellington understood that Marshal Massania would not have left fifteen hundred men in Almeida just so they could be starved into surrender, and thus forced to spend the rest of the war in some inhospitable prison camp on Dartmoor. Almeida had been garrisoned for a purpose, and Hogan, like his master, suspected the purpose was close to its fulfilment. A blossom of white smoke marked where a cannon had fired from the ramparts. The ball showed itself to Hogan as a dark vertical line that flickered in the sky, a sure sign that the shop was coming straight towards the observer. Now all depended on whether the gun layer had judged the elevation right. One half turn too many on the gun's elevating screw, and the ball would fall short. One turn too few, and it would scream overhead. It fell a hundred yards short then bounced up over Wellington's head to tear through a grove of oaks. Leaves scattered as the shot whipped the branches to and fro. Their guns are too cold, Hogan, the general said. They're under firing. Not by a great deal, my lord, Hogan said fervently, and the barrels will warm quickly. Wellington chuckled. Value your life, do you? Well, ride on. His lordship clicked his tongue and his horse obediently walked on down the slope past a British gun battery that was screened from the enemy by an earthwork topped by soil-filled baskets. Many of the gunners were stripped to the waist. Some were sleeping, and none seemed to notice the army commander passing. Another general might have been annoyed by the battery's casual air, but Wellington's quick eye noted the good condition of the guns, and so he merely nodded to the battery commander before waving his aides out of earshot. So... What's your news, Hogan? Too much news, my lord, and none of it good, Hogan said. He took off his hat and fanned his face. Marshal Bressier has joined Massania, my lord. Bought a deal of cavalry and artillery with him, but no infantry as far as we can gather. Your partisans? Wellington was inquiring about the source of Hogan's information. Indeed, my lord, they shadowed Bressier's march. Hogan took out his snuff-box and helped himself to restorative pinch while Wellington digested the news. Bessier commanded the French army in northern Spain, an army devoted wholly to fighting partisans, and the news that Bessier had brought troops to reinforce Marshal Massenia hinted that the French were readying themselves for their attempt to relieve the siege of Almeida. Wellington rode in silence for a few yards. His route took him up a gentle slope to a grassy crest that offered another view of the enemy fortress. He took out a spyglass and gave the spreading low walls and the artillery shattered rooftops a long inspection. Hogan imagined the gunners hand spiking their guns around to lay on their new target. Wellington grunted, then snapped the spyglass shut. So, Massenia's coming to resupply these rascals, is he? And if he succeeds, Hogan, they'll have enough supplies to last out till hell goes cold, unless we storm the place first, and storming it, We'll take until midsummer at least. And I can't storm Almeida and Ciudad Rodrigo at the same time. So Massenia will just have to be stopped. It'll go low, I warrant. This last remark referred to a cannon that had just fired from the walls. The smoke jetted out across the ditch as Hogan tried to catch sight of the missile. The round shot arrived a second before the sound of the gun. The ball bounced on the slope below the general's party and ricocheted high over his head to crack against an olive tree. Wellington turned his horse away. But you know what it'll mean, Hogan, if I try to stop Massania in front of Almeida? The Coa, my lord. Exactly. If the British and Portuguese army fought the French close to Almeida, then they'd have a deep, fast-flowing river Coa at their backs. And if Massania succeeded in turning Wellington's right flank, which he would assuredly try to do, 
then the army would be left with one road, just one road, on which it could retreat if it suffered defeat. And that one road led across a high, narrow bridge over the Coa's otherwise uncrossable gorge. And if the defeated army, with all its guns and baggage and women and pack horses and wounded, were to try and cross that one narrow bridge, then there would be chaos. And into that chaos would plunge the Emperor's heavy horses with their sword wielding troopers, and thus a fine British army that had thrown the French out of Portugal would die on the frontier of Spain, and there would be a new bridge over the Seine in Paris, and it would bear the odd name of Pont Castello, born in commemoration of the place where Andre Massena, Marshal of France, would have destroyed Lord Wellington's army. So we shall have to beat Marshal Massena, won't we? Wellington said to himself, then turned to Hogan. When will he come, Hogan? Soon, my lord, very soon. The stores in Ciudad Rodrigo won't allow them otherwise, Hogan answered. With the arrival of Bessier's men, the French now had too many mouths to feed from Ciudad Rodrigo's supply depots, which meant they would have to march soon or starve. So how many does Massena have now? Wellington asked. He can put fifty thousand men into the field, my lord. And I can't put forty thousand against them, Wellington said bitterly. One day, Hogan, London will come to believe that we can win this war and will actually send us some troops who are not mad, blind, or drunk. But tell them. He left the question unanswered. Any more of those damned counterfeit newspapers? Hogan was not surprised by the sudden change of subject. The newspapers describing the fictional atrocities in Ireland had been intended to disaffect the Irish soldiers in the British Army. The ploy had failed, but only just and both Hogan and Wellington feared that the next attempt might be more successful. And if that attempt came on the eve of Massena's crossing of the frontier to relieve Almeida, it could be disastrous. Nonsense, Hogan said. Yet. But you've moved the Real Compagnie Andesa away from the frontier. They shall be arriving at Fila Formosa this morning, my lord, Hogan said. Wellington grimaced. At which juncture you will apprise Captain Sharp of his troubles. The general did not wait for Hogan's answer. Did he shoot the two prisoners, Hogan? I suspect so, my lord, yes. Hogan answered heavily. General Valverde had reported the execution of Lou's men to the British headquarters, not in protest at the actual deed, but rather as proof that Lou's raid on the San Isidro fort had been provoked by Captain Sharp's irresponsibility. Valverde was riding a high moral horse, and loudly proclaiming that Spanish and Portuguese lives could not be trusted to British command. The Portuguese were unlikely to worry over much about Valverde's allegations, but the Junta in Cadiz would be only too eager for any ammunition they could use against their British allies. Valverde was already passing on a litany of other complaints, how British soldiers failed to salute when the holy sacraments were being carried through the streets, and how the Freemasons among the British officers offended Catholic sensibilities by openly parading in their regalia but now he had a more bitter and wounding allegation. That the British would fight to the last drop of their allies' blood, and the massacre at San Isidro was his proof. Damn sharp, Wellington said. Damn Valverde, Hogan thought. But Britain needed Spanish goodwill more than it needed one rogue rifleman. I haven't talked to Sharp, my lord, Hogan said, but I suspect he did kill the two men. I hear it was the usual thing. Lowe's men had raped village women. Hogan shrugged as if to imply that such horror was now commonplace. It may be the usual thing, Wellington said acidly, but that hardly condones the execution of prisoners. It's my experience, Hogan, that when you promote a man from the ranks he usually takes to drink, but not in Mr. Sharp's case. No, I promote Sergeant Sharp and he takes to conducting private wars behind my back. Lou didn't attack the San Isidro to destroy Oliveira or Keeley, Hogan. He did it to find Sharp which makes the loss of the Casadores all Sharp's fault. We don't know that, my lord. But the Spanish will deduce it, Hogan, and proclaim it far and wide, which makes it hard, Hogan, damned hard for us to blame Runciman. They'll say we're hiding the real culprit, and they are cavalier with allied lives. We can say the allegations against Captain Sharp are malicious and false, my lord. I thought he admitted them, Wellington retorted sharply. Well, didn't he boast to Oliveira about executing the two rogues? So I understand, my lord, Hogan said, but none of Oliveira's officers survived to testify to that admission. So who can testify? Hogan shrugged. 
Achille and his whore, Ronsomon and the priest. Hogan tried to make the list sound trivial, then shook his head. Too many witnesses, I'm afraid, my lord, not to mention Lou himself. Belvedere could well attempt to get a formal complaint from the French, and would be hard put to ignore such a document. So Sharp has to be sacrificed? Wellington asked. I fear so, my lord. God damn it, Hogan! Wellington snapped. Just what the devil was going on between Sharp and Loop? I wish I knew, my lord. But aren't you supposed to know? The general asked angrily. Hogan soothed his tired horse. I've not been idle, my lord, he said with a touch of tetchiness. I don't know all that happened between Sharp and Lou, but what does seem to be happening is a concerted effort to sow discord in this army. There's a new man come south from Paris, a man called Duco, who seems to be cleverer than the usual rogues. He's the fellow behind this scheme of counterfeit newspapers, and I'll guess, my lord, that there are more of those newspapers on the way, designed to arrive here just before the French themselves. Then stop them, Wellington demanded. I can and shall stop them, Hogan said confidently. We know it's Keeley's whore who brings them over the frontier, but our problem is finding the man who distributes them in our army, and that man is the real danger, my lord. One of our correspondents in Paris warns us that the French have a new agent in Portugal, a man of whom they expect great things. I'd dearly like to find him before he fulfills those expectations. I'm rather hoping the hall will lead us to him. You're sure about the woman? Oh, quite sure, Hogan said firmly. His sources in Madrid were explicit, but he knew better than to mention their names aloud. Sadly, we don't know who this new man in Portugal is, but given time, my lord, and a touch of carelessness on the part of Keeley's whore, He'll find him. Wellington grunted. A rumble in the sky announced the passage of a French round shot. But the general did not even look up to see where the shot might fall. Damn all this fuss, Hogan. And damn Keeley and his damn men, and damn Sharp, too. Is Ronsomon trust for the sacrifice? He's in Villa Formosa, my lord. The general nodded. Then trust Sharp, too. Put him to administrative duties, Hogan, and warn him that his conduct will be the subject of a court of inquiry. Then inform General Valverde that we're pursuing the matter. You know what to say. Wellington pulled out a pocket watch and clicked its lid open. An expression of distaste showed on his thin face. I suppose if I'm here, that I'll have to visit Erskine. Or do you think a madman is still in bed? I'm sure his aides would have apprised Sir William of your presence, my lord, and I can't think he'd be flattered if you were to ignore him. Yes, touchier than a virgin in a barracks room, and mad as well. Just the man, Hogan, to conduct Sharp and Runciman's court of inquiry. Let's see, Hogan, whether Sir William is experiencing a lucid interval and can thus understand what verdict is required of him. We must sacrifice one good officer and one bad officer to draw Valverde's fangs. Oh, God damn it, Hogan, God damn it, but needs must when the devil drives. Poor Sharp. His lordship gave one backward glance at the town of Almeida, then led his entourage towards the besieging forces' headquarters. While Hogan worried about the narrow bridge at Castello Bomb, about Sharp, and even more, about a mysterious enemy coming to Portugal to sow discord. The house with the smoking chimney lay where the street opened into the small plaza before the church, and it was in there that the howling had begun. Sharp, who'd been rising to his feet, had crouched instantly back into the shadows as a gate beside the house creaked open. Then the hounds had poured out. They'd been pent up too long, and so ran joyously up and down the deserted street. A figure wearing uniform led a horse and a mule out, and then turned away from Sharp, evidently planning to leave San Cristobal by the gated entrance on the village's far side. One of the hounds leapt playfully at the mule, and received a curse and a kick for its trouble. The curse sounded plainly in the street. It was a woman's voice. The voice of the Doña Juanita Delia, who now put her foot in the stirrup of the saddled horse. But the hound came back to plague the mule again, just as she tried to haul herself up into the saddle. The mule, which was loaded with a pair of heavy panniers, brayed and shied away from the hound, and pulled its leading rein out of Juanita's grip. Then, frightened by the excited dogs, it trotted towards Sharp. Juanita de Elia cursed again. Her plumed bicorn hat had fallen off in the commotion, so that her long black hair began to come out of its pins. She pushed it roughly into place as she hurried after the frightened mule, which had come to a stop just a few paces from Sharp's hiding place. 
The hounds ran in the other direction, baptizing the church steps in their joy at being released from confinement in the yard. Come on, you bastard! Juanita told the mule in Spanish. She was wearing the elegant uniform of the Real Compañía Irlandesa. She leant to pick up the mule's leading rein, and Sharp stepped out into the moonlight. I never know, he said. Whether Donya is a title or not, do I say good morning, my lady, or just good morning? He stopped three paces from her. It took Juanita a few seconds to recover her poise. She straightened up, glanced at the rifle in Sharp's hands, then at her horse thirty paces away. She had left a carbine in the saddle holster, but she knew she had no chance of reaching the weapon. She had a short sword at her side, and her hand went to the hilt, then stopped as Sharp raised the rifle's muzzle. You wouldn't kill a woman, Captain Sharp, she said coldly. In the dark, milady. With you in uniform, I don't think anyone would blame me. Juanita watched Sharp carefully, trying to judge the veracity of his threat. Then a means of salvation occurred to her, and she smiled before giving a brief, tuneless whistle. Her hounds stopped and pricked their ears. I'll set the dogs on you, Captain, she said. Because that's all you've got left here, isn't it? Sharp said. Lube's gone. Where? Juanita still smiled. I've seen my bitches pull down a prime stag, Captain, and turn it into offal in two minutes. The first to reach you will go off your throat, and she'll hold you down while the others feed on you. Sharp returned the smile, then raised his voice. Pat, bring him in. Damn you, Juanita said. Then she whistled again and the hounds began loping down the street. At the same time, she turned and began running towards her horse. But she was slowed by the spurs on her heavy riding boots, and Sharp caught her from behind. He put his left arm round her waist and held her body in front of his like a shield as he backed against the nearest wall. Whose soap will they go for now, my lady? he asked. Her tousled hair was in his face. It smelt of rose water. She kicked at him, tried to elbow him but he was much too strong. The fastest hound came running towards them, and Sharp lowered the rifle with his right hand and pulled the trigger. The sound of the shop was brutally loud in the confined street. Sharp's aim had been confused by Juanita's struggles, but his bullet caught the attacking animal in the haunch and sent it spinning and yelping to the ground, just as Harper led the rifleman through the entrance maze. The Irishman's sudden appearance confused the other hounds. They slowed down, then whined as they clustered about the wounded bitch. Put the bugger out of his misery, Pat, Sharp said. Harris, go back to Captain Donahue, give him my compliments and tell him to bring his men into the village. Cooper, get her ladyship's horse, and Perkins, take her ladyship's sword. Harper waded into the hounds, drew his saw bayonet and stooped to the bleeding, snapping bitch. He still, you bugger, he said gently, then sliced once. Ah, you poor beast, he said as he straightened up with his bayonet dripping blood. God save Ireland, sir. But look what you found. Lord Keeley's fancy lady. Traitor, Juanita said to Harper, then spat at him. Traitor, you shall be fighting the English. Oh, my lady, Harper said as he wiped the blade on the skirt of his green jacket. Some time you and me must enjoy a long talk about who should be fighting who and whose side, but right now I'm busy with a war I've already got. Perkins gingerly extracted the short sword from Juanita's slings. Then Sharp released his grip on her. My apologies for manhandling you, Mum, he said very formally. Juanita ignored the apology. She stood straight and stiff, keeping her dignity in front of the foreign rifleman. Dan Hagman was coaxing the mule out of the street corner, where it had taken refuge. Bring him with you, Dan, Sharp said then led the way up the street towards the house where Nida had vacated. Harper escorted her, making her follow Sharp into the yard. The house must have been one of the largest in the village, for the gate led into a spacious courtyard that possessed stabling on two sides and an elaborately crowned well in its centre. The kitchen door was open, and Sharp ducked inside to find the fire still smouldering and the remains of a meal on the table. He found some candle stubs, lit them from the fire, and placed them back on the table amidst the litter of plates and cups. At least six people had eaten at the table, suggesting that Lou and his men had left very recently. Look round the rest of the village, Pat, 
Sharp told Harper. Take half a dozen men and go carefully. I reckon everyone's gone, but you never know. I'll take care, sir, so I will. Harper took the rifleman out of the kitchen, leaving Sharp alone with Juanita. Sharp gestured at a chair. Let's talk, my lady. She walked with a slow dignity to the far end of the table, put a hand on the chair back, then suddenly broke away and ran for a door across the room. Go to hell, was her parting injunction. Sharp was encumbered by the furniture, so that by the time he reached the door she was already halfway up a dark flight of stairs. He scrambled after her. She turned right to the stairhead and ran through a door that she slammed behind her. Sharp kicked it a split second before it would have latched and hurled himself through the opening to see in the moonlight that Juanita was sprawled across a bed. She was struggling to free an object from a discarded valise, and then as Sharp crossed the room she turned with a pistol in her hand. He threw himself at her, slamming his left hand at the pistol just as she pulled the trigger. The bullet cracked into the ceiling as he landed full on her. She gasped from the impact, then tried to claw at his eyes with her free hand. Sharp rolled off her, stood and backed to the window. He was panting. His left wrist hurt from the impact of striking the pistol aside. The moonlight came past him to silver the haze of pistol smoke and to shine on the bed that was nothing but a raft of straw-filled mattresses on which a jumble of pelts provided the covers. Juanita half sat up, glared at him, and then seemed to realize that her defiance had run its course. She let out a disgruntled sigh and collapsed back onto the furs. Dan Hagman had heard the pistol shot from the courtyard and now came pounding up the stairs and into the bedroom with his rifle leveled. He looked from the woman prone on the bed to Sharp. You all right, sir? Just a disagreement, Dan. No one hurt. Hagman looked back at Juanita. A right little spitfire, sir, he said admiringly. He probably needs a spanking. I'll look after her, Dan. You get those panniers off the mule. Let's see what the spitfire was taking away, eh? Hagman went back downstairs. Sharp massaged his wrist and looked about the room. It was a large, high-ceiling chamber with dark wood panelling, thick ceiling beams, a fireplace, and a heavy linen press in one corner. It was obviously the bedroom of a substantial man, and the room that a commanding officer quartering his men in a small village would naturally take as his own billet. The big babe, my lady? Too big for just one person, Sharp said. Are those wolf skins? Juanita said nothing. Sharp sighed. You and Lou, eh? I'm all right. She stared at him with dark, resentful eyes, but still refused to speak. And all those days you went hunting alone, Sharp said. You were coming here to see Lou. Again she refused to speak. The moonlight put half her face in shadow. And you opened the San Isidro's gate for Lou, didn't you? Sharp went on. That's why he didn't attack the gatehouse. He wanted to make sure no harm came to you in the fighting. That's nice in a man, isn't it? Looking after his woman. Mind you, he kind of liked the thought of you and Lord Keeley. Or isn't Lou the jealous kind? Keeley was usually too drunk, she said in a low voice. Found your tongue, have you? So now you can tell me what you were doing here. Go to hell, Captain! The sound of boots in the street made Sharp turn to the window to see that the men of the Real Compagnia Irlandesa had arrived in the street below. Donahoo! he shouted. Into the kitchen here! He turned back to the bed. We've got company, my lady, so let's go and be sociable. He waited for her to stand up, then shook his head when she obstinately refused to move. I'm not leaving you on your own, my lady, so you can either go downstairs in your own two feet or have me carry you. She stood, straightened her uniform and tried to rearrange her hair. Then, followed by Sharp, she went down into the candlelit kitchen, where El Castrador, Donahu and Sergeant Major Noonan were standing by the table. They gaped at Juanita, then looked at Sharp, who didn't feel inclined to offer an immediate explanation of the lady's presence. Lou's gone, Sharp told Donahu. I've got Sergeant Harper making sure the place is empty, so why don't you have your lads man the defences, just in case Brigadier Lou decides to come back? Donahu glanced at Juanita, then turned on Noonan. Sergeant Major, you heard the order, do it. Noonan went. El Castrador was watching Hagman unpack the dismounted mule panniers. Juanita had gone to the remnants of the fire where she was warming herself. 
Donahue looked at her, then gave Sharp an inquiring look. The Doña Juanita, Sharp explained, is a woman of many parts. She's Lord Keeley's betrothed, General Lou's lover, and an agent of the French. Juanita's head jerked up at the last phrase, but she made no effort to contradict Sharp. Donahue stared at her as though he was unwilling to believe what he had just heard. Then he turned back to Sharp with a frown. She and Lou? he asked. Their love nests upstairs, for Christ's sake, Sharp said. Go and look if you don't believe me. Her ladyship here let Lou into the fort last night. Her ladyship, Donahue, is a goddamned traitor. Imsheet, sir. Hagman interrupted in a puzzled tone. A bloody odd ones. I've seen things like it at church, at home, you know, for the musicians, but not like this. The old poacher had unpacked the panniers to reveal a great part of manuscripts that were lined with staves and inscribed with words and music. They're very old. Donahue was still dazed by the revelations about Juanita, but now moved across to examine the papers unearthed by Hagman. See, Sharp? Just four staves instead of five. They could be two or three hundred years old. Latin words. Let's see now. He frowned as he made a mental translation. Clap your hands, everyone. Uh, call unto God with, with a voice of victory. The Psalms, I think. She wasn't carrying the Psalms back to our lines, Sharp said. And he seized the top manuscripts off the pile and began sorting through them. It took only seconds to find that there were newspapers hidden beneath the disguising manuscripts. These, Donahue. Sharp held up the newspapers. These are what she was carrying. Juanita's only reaction to the discovery was to start biting one of her nails. She glanced at the kitchen door, but Harper had come back to the house, and the courtyard was now filled with his riflemen. Place is empty, sir. Bog is gone, Harper reported. And he left in a rare hurry, sir, but a place is still stuffed with plunder. Something drove him out in a hurry. He nodded respectfully to Captain Donahue. Your fellows are manning the defences, sir. They're not American newspapers this time, Sharp said, but English ones. Learned their lesson last time, didn't they? Make a newspaper too old and no one believes the stories. But these dates are just last week. He threw the papers on the table one by one. The Morning Chronicle, the Weekly Dispatch, the Salisbury Journal, the Staffordshire Advertiser. Someone's been busy, my lady. Who? Someone in Paris? Is that where these papers are printed? Juanita said nothing. Sharp plucked another newspaper from the pile. Probably printed three weeks ago in Paris and brought here just in time. After all, no one would be astonished to see a two-week-old Shrewsbury Chronicle in Portugal, would they? A fast-sailing ship could easily have brought it, and there'll be no drafts of troops to contradict these stories. So what are they saying about us this time? He leafed through the newspaper, tilting it towards the candles as he turned the pages. Apprentice imprisoned for playing football on the Sabbath? Serve the little bugger right for trying to enjoy himself. But I don't suppose his story will drive the troops to mutiny. There's something in here, Will. I've found something, Donahue said quietly. He'd been searching the morning chronicle, and now he folded the paper and held it towards Sharp. A piece about the Irish division. There isn't an Irish division, Sharp said, taking the newspaper. He found the item that had attracted Donahue's attention and read it aloud. Recent disturbances among the Hibernian troops of the army ser serving in Portugal, Sharp read, embarrassed because he was a slow and not very certain reader, have, have persuade, persuaded the government to adopt a new and pa palliative, he had a lot of trouble with that word, policy. When the present campaigning season is over, the Irish regiments of the army will be brigaded as a division that shall be posted to the garrisons of the... Caribbean Islands. The Exchequer has forbidden the expense of carrying wives, doubting that many so described have benefited from the Almighty's blessing on their union. And in the tropics, doubtless, the hot Irish heads will find a, cl a climate more to their liking. The same report is here. Donahue displayed another paper, then hastily offered El Castrador an explanation of all that was happening inside the smoky kitchen. The partisan glared at Juanita when her treachery was revealed. Traitor! He spat at her. Your mother was a whore, 
he said, so far as Sharp was able to follow the quick, angry Spanish. Your father, a goat, you were given everything, yet you fight for Spain's enemies, while we, who have nothing, fight to save our country. He spat again and fingered his small, bone-handled knife. Juanita stiffened under the onslaught, but said nothing. Her dark eyes went back to Sharp, who had just found another version of the announcement that all the Irish regiments were to be posted to the West Indies. It's a clever lie, Sharp said, looking at Juanita. Very clever. Donahue frowned. Why is it clever? He'd asked the question of Patrick Harper. Wouldn't the Irish like to be brigaded together? I'm sure they would, sir, but not in the Caribbean, and not without their women, God help us. Half of the men will be dead of the yellow fever within three months of arriving in the islands, Sharp explained, and the other half dead within six months. Being posted to the Caribbean, Donahue, is a death sentence. He looked at Juanita. So whose idea was it, my lady? She said nothing, just chewed on the fingernail. El Castrador shouted at her for her obstinacy and untied the small knife from his belt. Donahue blanched at the stream of obscenities and tried to restrain the big man's anger. Well, the story isn't true, Sharp interrupted the commotion. For a start, we wouldn't be so daft as to take the Irish soldiers away from the army. Who win the battles else? Harper and Donahue smiled. Sharp felt a quiet exultation. For if this discovery did not justify his breaking orders and marching on San Cristobal, nothing would. He made a pile of the newspapers, then looked at Donahue. Why don't you send someone back to headquarters? Find Major Hogan, tell him what's here, and ask him what we should be doing. I'll go myself, Donahue said. But what will you do? I have a few things to do here first, Sharp said, looking at Juanita as he spoke. Like discovering where Loop is and why he left in such a hurry. Juanita bridled. I have nothing to say to you, Captain. Well, then maybe you'll say it to him. He jerked his head towards El Castrador. Juanita gave a fearful glance at the partisan, then looked back at Sharp. When did British officers cease to be gentlemen, Captain? When we began to win battles, ma'am, Sharp said. So who's it to be, me or him? Donahue looked as though he might make a protest at Sharp's behaviour. Then he saw the rifleman's grim face and thought better of it. I'll take a newspaper to Hogan, he said quietly, then folded the counterfeit Morning Chronicle into his pouch and backed from the room. Harper went with him and closed the kitchen door firmly behind him. Don't you worry, sir, Harper said to Donahue once they were in the yard. I'll look after the lady now. You will? I'll dig her a nice deep grave, sir, and bury the witch upside down so that the hardest she struggles the deeper she'll go. Have a safe ride back to the line, sir. Donahue blanched, then went to find his horse, while Harper shouted at Perkins to find some water, make a fire, and brew a good strong morning cup of tea. You're in trouble, Richard, Hogan said when he finally reached Sharp. It was early evening of the day which had begun with Sharp's stealthy approach to Lou's abandoned stronghold. You're in trouble. You've been shooting prisoners. God, man, I don't care if you shoot every damn prisoner between here and Paris, but why the hell did you have to tell anyone? Sharp's only response was to turn from his vantage point among the rocks and wave a hand to indicate that Hogan should keep low. Well, don't you know the first rule of life, Richard? Hogan grumbled as he tethered his horse to a boulder. Never get found out, sir. So why the hell didn't you keep your damn mouth shut? Hogan clambered up to Sharp's eyrie and lay down beside the rifleman. So what have you found? The enemy, sir. Sharp was five miles beyond San Cristobal, five miles deeper inside Spain, guided there by El Castrador, who'd ridden back to San Cristobal with the news that had brought Hogan out to this ridge, overlooking the main road that led west out of Ciudad Rodrigo. Sharp had reached the ridge on Doña Juanita's horse, which was now picketed safely out of sight of anyone looking up from the road, and there were plenty who might have looked, for Sharp was staring down at an army. The French are out, sir, he said. They're marching, and there are thousands of the buggers. Hogan drew out his own telescope. He stared at the road for a long time, then allowed a hiss of breath to escape. Dear God, he said. Dear sweet, merciful God. For a whole army was on the march. Infantry and dragoons, gunners and hussars, lancers and grenadiers, 
voltigeurs and engineers, a trail of men that looked black in the fading light, though here and there in the long column the dying sun reflected dark scarlet from the flank of a cannon being dragged by a team of oxen or horses. Thick dust clouded up from the wheels of the cannons, wagons, and coaches that were keeping to the road itself, while the infantry marched in columns in the fields either side. The cavalry rode on the outermost flanks, long lines of men with steel-tipped lances and shining helmets and tossing plumes, their horses' hooves leaving long bruised marks on the spring grass of the valley. Dear God, Hogan said again. Lude's down there, Sharp said. I saw him. That's why he left San Cristobal. He was summoned to join the army, you see. Damn it! Hogan exploded. Why couldn't you forget Loop? It's Loop's fault you're in trouble. Why in the name of God couldn't you keep your mouth shut about those two damn fools you shot to death? Now bloody Valverde is saying that the Portuguese lost a prime regiment of men because you stirred up the hornet's nest, and that no sane Spaniard can ever trust a soldier to British officers. What it means, you damn fool, is that we have to parade you in front of the court of inquiry. We have to sacrifice you with Wonsaman. Sharp stared at the Irish Major. Me? Of course! Oh, for Christ's sake, Richard, don't you have the first inkling of politics? The Spanish don't want Wellington as generalissimo. They see that appointment as an insult to their country, and they're looking for ammunition to support their cause. Ammunition like some damned fool of a rifleman fighting a private war at the expense of a fine regiment of Portuguese casadores, whose fatal serve as an example of what might happen to any Spanish regiments put under the peers' command. He paused to stare through his telescope, then penciled a note on the cuff of his shirt. God damn it, Richard. We were going to have a nice, quiet court of inquiry, put all the blame on Ronsonman, and then forget what happened at San Isidro. Now you've confused everything. Did you happen to keep notes of what you've seen here? I did, sir, Sharp said. He was still trying to come to terms with the idea that his whole career was suddenly in jeopardy. It all seemed so monstrously unfair. But he kept the resentment to himself as he handed Hogan a stiff, folded sheet of the ancient music that concealed the counterfeit newspapers. On the back of the sheet, Sharp had penciled a tally of the units he had watched march beneath him. It was an awesome list of battalions and squadrons and batteries, all going towards Almeida, and all expecting to meet and trounce the small British army that had to try to stop them from relieving the fortress. So tomorrow, Hogan said, they'll reach our positions. Tomorrow, Richard, we fight. And that's why. Hogan had spotted something new in the column and now pointed far to the west. It took Sharp a moment to train his telescope. Then he saw the vast column of Oxhall wagons that was following the French troops west. The relief supplies for Almeida, Hogan said. All the food and ammunition the garrison wants, enough to keep them there through the summer while we lay siege. And if they can keep us in front of Almeida all summer, then we'll never get across the frontier, and the Lord alone knows how many frogs will attack us next spring. He collapsed his telescope again. And talking of spring, Richard, would you like to tell me exactly what you did with the Doña Juanita? Captain Donahue said he left her with you and our knife-happy friend. Sharp coloured. I sent her home, sir. There was a moment's silence. You did what? Hogan asked. I send her back to the crapo, sir. Hogan shook his head in disbelief. You let an enemy agent go back to the French? Are you entirely mad, Richard? She was upset, sir. She said that if I took her back to the army, she'd be arrested by the Spanish authorities and tried by the junta in Cadiz, sir, and uh, like as not put in front of a firing squad. I've never been one for fighting against women, sir, and we know who she is, don't we? So she can't do any harm now. Hogan closed his eyes and rested his head on his forearm. Dear God, in your infinite mercy, please save this poor buggered soul, because Wellington sure as hell will not. It did not occur to you, Richard, that I would have liked to talk to the lady. It did, sir, but uh, she was frightened, and she didn't want me to leave her alone with the old Castrador. I was just being a gentleman, sir. I thought she didn't approve of the gentry fighting wars. So what did you do? Pat a little bum, dry her maidenly tears, and give her a soulful kiss, and send her down to Lou so she could tell him how you're stranded in San Cristobal? I let her go a couple of miles back. Sharp jerked his head north and west. I made her travel on foot, sir, without any boots. I reckon that would slow her down. And she did talk to me before she left, sir. It's all written down there, if you can make out my handwriting. 
She says she distributed the newspapers, sir. She took them down to Irish encampment, sir. The only thing that Doña Juanita could distribute, Richard, is the pox. Jesus wept. You let that bitch twist your arm for little fingers. For Christ's sake, Richard. I already knew she was the one fetching the newspapers. She was an errant girl. The real villain. The real villain is someone else, and I was hoping to follow her to him. Have you bugger that up? Jesus! Hogan paused to contain his anger, then shook his head wearily. But at least she left you your bloody jacket. Sharp frowned in puzzlement. M- my jacket, sir? Remember what I told you, Richard, how the Lady Juanita collects the uniforms of every man she sleeps with. Her wardrobes must be vast, but I'm glad to see she won't be hanging a jacket of rifle green along with all the other coats. No, sir, Sharp said, and blushed an even deeper red. Sorry, sir. Ah, can't be helped, Hogan said as he wriggled back from the crest. You're an idiot for women and always were. If we thrash Masenia, then the lady can't do us much harm, and if we don't, then the war's probably lost anyway. Let's get you the hell out of here. You're on administrative duties till your crucifixion. He backed away from the crest and put his telescope back into a belt pouch. I'll do my best for you, God knows why. But your best prayer, Richard, and I hate to tell you this, is that we lose this battle. As if we do, it'll be such a disaster that no one will have the time or energy to remember your idiocy. It was dark by the time they reached San Cristobal. Thonahu had returned to the village with Hogan, and now he led his fifty men of the Real Compagnia Irlandesa back towards the British lines. I saw Lord Keeley at headquarters, he told Sharp. What did you tell him? I told him his lover was an unfrancasada and that she was sleeping with Lou. Donahue's tone was stark, and I told him he was a fool. And what did he say? Donahue shrugged. What do you think? He's an aristocrat. He has pride. He told me to go to hell. And tomorrow, Sharp said, we all might do just that because tomorrow the French would attack, and he would once again see those vast blue columns drummed forward beneath their eagles, and listen to the skull-splitting sound of massed French batteries pounding away. He shuddered at the thought, then turned to watch his green jackets march past. Perkins! he suddenly shouted. Come here! Perkins had been trying to hide on the far side of the column, but now, sheepishly, he came to stand in front of Sharp. Harper came with him. It isn't his fault, sir, Harper said hurriedly. Shut up, Sharp said, and looked down at Perkins. Where, Perkins, is your green jacket? Stolen, sir. Perkins was in shirt, boots, and trousers, over which his equipment was belted. It got wet, sir, and I was carrying water round to the lads, so I hung it out to dry, and it was stolen, sir. That lady was not so far away, sir, from where he hung it, Harper said meaningfully. Why would she steal a rifleman's jacket? Sharp asked, but sensed a blush beginning. He was glad it was dark. Why would anyone want Perkins's jacket, sir? Harper asked. That was a threadbare thing at best, so it was, and too small to fit most men. But I reckon it was stolen, sir, and I don't reckon Perkins should pay for it. Twasn't his fault. Go away, Perkins, Sharp said. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Harper watched the boy run back to his file. And why would the Lady Juanita steal a jacket? That puzzles me, sir, truly does. For I can't think it was anyone else who took it. She didn't steal it, Sharp said. The lying bitch earned it. Now keep on going with a way to go yet, Pat. But whether the road led anywhere good, he no longer knew. For he was a scapegoat, and he faced the foregone conclusions of a court of inquiry. And in the dark, following his men west, he shivered. There were only two sentries at the door to the house which served as Wellington's headquarters. Other generals might conclude that their dignity demanded a whole company of soldiers, or even a whole battalion, but Wellington never wanted more than two men, and they were only there to keep away the town's children, and to control the more importunate petitioners who believed the general could solve their problems with a stroke of his quill pen. Merchants came seeking contracts to supply the army with foul beef, or with bolts of linen stored too long in moth-infested warehouses. Officers came seeking redress against imagined slights, and priests arrived to complain that Protestant British soldiers mocked the Holy Church. And in the midst of these distractions, the general tried to solve his own problems. The lack of entrenching tools, the paucity of heavy guns that could grind down a fortress's defences, 
and the ever-pressing duty of convincing a nervous ministry in London that his campaign was not doomed. So Lord Keeley was not a welcome visitor following the General's customary early dinner of roast saddle of mutton with vinegar sauce. Nor did it help that Keeley had plainly fortified himself with brandy for this confrontation with Wellington, who, early in his career, had decided that an overindulgence in alcohol hurt a man's abilities as a soldier. One man in this army had better stay sober, he liked to say of himself. And now, seated behind a table in the room that served as his office, parlour, and bedroom, he looked dourly at the flushed, excited Keeley, who had arrived with an urgent request. Urgent to Keeley, if not to anyone else. Candles flickered on the table that was spread with maps. A galloper had come from Hogan, reporting that the French were out and marching on the southern road that led through Fuentes de Onoro. That news was not unexpected, but it meant that the general's plans were now to be subjected to the test of cannon fire and musket volleys. I'm busy, Keeley, Wellington said icily. I ask only that my unit be allowed to take the forefront of the battle line, Keeley said with the careful dignity of a man who knows that liquor might otherwise slur his words. No, Wellington said. The general's aide, standing in the window, gestured towards the door, but Keeley ignored the invitation to leave. We have been ill used, my lord he said unwisely. We came here, at the request of my sovereign in good faith, expecting to be properly employed, and instead you have ignored us, denied us our support. No! The loudness of the word was such that the sentries at the house's front step were visibly startled. Then they looked at each other and grinned. The general had a temper that was rarely seen, but when Wellington did choose to unleash the full fury of his personality, it was an awesome thing. The general stared up at his visitor. His voice dropped to a conversational level, but it still reeked of scorn. You came here, sir, ill-prepared, unwanted, unfunded, and expected me, sir, to provide both your men's livelihoods and their accoutrements, and in return, sir, you have offered me insolence, and worse, betrayal. You did not come at His Majesty's bidding, but because the enemy desired you to come, and it is now my desire that you should go, and you shall go, sir, with honour because it is unthinkable that we should send away King Ferdinand's household troops in any other condition. But that honour, sir, has been earned at the expense of other men. Your troops, sir, shall serve in the battle, for there will be no opportunity to remove them before the French arrive, but they shall serve as guards on my ammunition park. You may choose to command them, or to sulk in your tent. Good day to you, my lord. My lord? The aide addressed Keeley tactfully, stepping towards the door but Lord Keeley was blind to tact. Insolence! He pounced on the word. My God, but I command King Ferdinand's guard, and, and King Ferdinand, sir, is a prisoner. Wellington snapped, which does not speak, sir, for the efficacy of his guard. You came here, sir, with your adulterous whore, flaunting her like a, like a pranked bitch, and the whore, sir, is a traitor. The whore, sir, has been doing her best to destroy this army, and the only providence that has saved this army from her ministrations is that her best, thank God, is no better than your own. Your request is denied. Good day. Wellington looked down to his papers. Keeley had other complaints to make, chief of them the way in which he had been manhandled and insulted by Captain Sharp. But now he stood insulted by Wellington, too. Lord Keeley was just summoning his last reserves of courage to protest this treatment when the aide took firm hold of his elbow and pulled him towards the door, and Keeley found himself powerless to resist. Perhaps your lordship requires some refreshment? The aide inquired emolliently as he steered the furious Keeley out into the hallway, where a group of curious officers looked with pity at the disgraced man. Keeley shook the aide's hand away, seized his hat and sword from the hall table, and stalked out of the front door without another word. He ignored the two sentries as they presented arms. Nosey saw him off fast enough, then, one of the sentries said, then snapped to attention again as Edward Packenham, the adjutant general, climbed the steps. Keeley seemed oblivious of Packenham's cheerful greeting. Instead, he walked down the street in a blind rage, passing long lines of guns that were slowly negotiating the town's narrow lanes. But he saw nothing and understood nothing, except that he had failed. Just as he had failed at everything, he told himself. But none of the failure was his fault. The cards had run against him. 
and that was how he'd lost what small fortune his mother had left to him after she'd squandered her wealth on the damned church and on the damned Irish rebels who always managed to end up on British gallows. And the same bad luck explained why he'd failed to win the hand of at least two Madrid heiresses who had preferred to marry Spaniards of the blood rather than appear without a country. Healy's self-pity welled up at the memories of their rejections. In Madrid he was a second-class citizen because he couldn't trace his lineage back to some medieval brute who'd fought against the Moors, while in this army, he decided, he was an outcast because he was Irish. Yet the worst insult of all was Juanita's betrayal. Juanita, the wild, unconventional, clever and seductive woman whom Keeley had imagined himself marrying. She had money, she had noble blood, and other men had looked enviously at Keeley when Juanita was at his side. Yet all along, he supposed, she'd been deceiving him. She'd given herself to Lou. She'd lain in Lou's arms, and Keeley presumed she'd told all his secrets to Lou. And he imagined their laughter as they lay entangled in their bed. And once again the anger and the pity swelled inside him. There were tears in his eyes as he realized he'd be the laughingstock of all Madrid and all this army. He entered a church not because he wanted to pray, but because he could think of nowhere else to go. He couldn't face going back to his quarters in General Valverde's lodgings, where everyone would look at him and whisper that he was a cuckold. The church was crowded with dark-shawled women, waiting to make their confessions. Phalanxes of candles glimmered in front of statues, altars, and paintings. The small lights glittered off the gilded pillars and from the massive silver cross on the high altar that still had its white Easter frontal. Keeley went to the altar steps. His sword clattered on the marble as he knelt and stared at the rood. He was being crucified too, he told himself, and by smaller men who didn't understand his noble aims. He took a flask from his pocket and tipped it to his lips, sucking at the fierce Spanish brandy as though it would save his life. Are you well, my son? A priest had come soft-footed to Keeley's side. Far away, Keeley said. The hut, my son. The priest said nervously, This is God's house. Keeley snatched the plume hat from his head. Go away, he said again. God preserve you, the priest said, and walked back into the shadows. The women waiting to make their confessions glanced nervously at the finely uniformed officer and wondered if he was praying for victory over the approaching French. Everyone knew the blue-coated enemy was coming again, and householders were burying their valuables in their gardens in case Marsenia's dreaded veterans beat the British aside and came back to sack the town. Healy finished the flask. His head spun with liquor, shame, and anger. Behind the silver rood in a niche above the high altar was a statue of Our Lady. She wore a diadem of stars, a blue robe, and carried lilies in her hands. It had been a long time since Keeley had stared at such an image. His mother had loved such things. She'd forced him to confession— and to the sacrament, and had chided him for failing her. She had used to pray to the Virgin, claiming a special kinship with Our Lady as another disappointed woman who had known her mother's sadness. Bitch, Healy said aloud, staring at the blue-robed statue. Bitch! He'd hated his mother, just as he hated the church. Juanita had shared Keely's contempt for the church, but Juanita was another man's lover. Maybe she'd always been another man's lover. She'd lain with Lou and God knows how many other men. And all the while Keeley had been planning to make her a countess and to show off her beauty in all the great capitals of Europe. Tears trickled down his cheeks as he thought of her betrayal and as he remembered his humiliation at the hands of Captain Sharp. That last memory filled him with a sudden fury. Bitch! He shouted at the Virgin Mary. He stood up and hurled the empty flask at her statue behind the altar. Oh, bitch! He cried as the flask bounced harmlessly off the virgin's blue robe. The women screamed. The priest ran towards his lordship, then stopped in terror because Keeley had drawn the pistol from his holster. The click of the gun's lock echoed loud in the cavernous church as Keeley thumbed back the heavy hammer. Bitch! Keeley spat the word at the statue. Lion, horrid, demon, two-faced, leprous bitch! Tears poured down his cheeks as he aimed the pistol. No! The priest implored as the women's shrieks filled the church. Please, no! Think of the Blessed Virgin, please! 
Keely turned on the man. Call her a virgin, do you? You think she'd be a virgin after, after the legions and Hamatsu Galilee? He laughed wildly, then turned back to the statue. You whore bitch! He shouted as he trained the pistol again. You filthy whore bitch! No! The priest cried despairingly. Keely pulled the trigger. The heavy bullet smashed through his pallet and punched out a palm-sized patch of his skull as it exited. Blood and brains splashed as high as the virgin's diadem of stars, but none landed on Our Lady. Instead, the gore spattered across the sanctuary steps, doused a handful of candles, then trickled down to the nave. Keeley's dead body fell back, his head a mangled horror of blood, brain, and bone. The screams in the church slowly died, to be replaced by the rumble of wheels in the street as more guns were dragged towards the east. And towards the French, who were coming to reclaim Portugal and break the instant British at a narrow bridge across the Coeur. Part 2 Chapter 7 the Real Compañía Irlandesa bivouacked on the plateau north and west of Fuentes de Oñoro. The village lay astride the southernmost road leading from Ciudad Rodrigo to Almeida, and in the night Wellington's army had closed about the village that now threatened to become a battlefield. The dawn mist hid the eastern countryside, where the French army readied itself, while up on the plateau Wellington's forces were a smoke-obscured chaos of troops, horses and wagons. Guns were parked on the plateau's eastern crest, their barrels pointing across the Dos Casas stream that marked the army's forward line. Donahu discovered Sharp squinting sideways into a scrap of mirror in an attempt to cut his own hair. The sides and the front were easy enough to trim, the difficulty always lay in the rear. Just like soldiering, Sharp said. You've heard about Keeley. Donahu, suddenly in command of the Real Compañía Irlandesa, ignored Sharp's gnomic comment. Sharp snipped, frowned, then tried to repair the damage by snipping again, but it only made things worse. Blew his head off, I heard. Donahue flinched at Sharp's callousness, but made no protest. I can't believe he would do such a thing, he said instead. Too much pride, not enough sense. Sounds like most bloody aristocrats to me. These damn scissors are blunt. Donahue frowned. Why don't you have a servant? Can't afford one. Besides, I've always looked after myself. And cut your own hair. There's a pretty girl among the battalion wives who usually cuts it, Sharp said. But Sally Clayton, like the rest of the South Essex, was far away. The South Essex was too shrunken by war to serve in the battle line, and now was doing guard duty on the army's Portuguese depots and thus would be spared Marshal Massena's battle to relieve Almeida and cut the British retreat across the Coeur. Father Sarsfield is burying Keeley tomorrow, Donahue said. Father Sarsfield might be burying a lot of us tomorrow, Sharp said, if they bury us at all. Have you ever seen a battlefield a year after the fighting? Like a boneyard. Skulls lying about like boulders, and fox-chewed bones everywhere. Oh, bugger this! he said savagely as he gave his hair a last forlorn chop. Healy can't even be buried in a churchyard. Donahue did not want to think about battlefields on this ominous morning. Because it was suicide. There aren't many soldiers who get a proper grave, Sharp said. I wouldn't grieve for Keeley. We'll be lucky if any of us get a proper hole, let alone a stone on top. Dan! he shouted to Hagman. Sir! Your bloody scissors are blunt! Sharpen them last night, sir! Hagman said stoically. Like my father always said, sir, only a bad workman blames his toll, sir. Sharp tossed the scissors across to Hagman, then brushed the cut strands of hair from his shirt. You're better off without Keeley, he told Donahue. The guard the ammunition park, Donahue said bitterly. It would have done better to stay in Madrid. To be thought of as traitors, Sharp asked as he pulled on his jacket. Listen, Donahue, you're alive and Keeley isn't. You've got yourself a good company to command. So what if you're guarding the ammunition? You think that isn't important? What happens if the crapos break through? Donahue did not seem cheered by Sharp's opinions. We're orphans, he said self-pityingly. No one cares what happens to us. Why do you want someone to care? Sharp asked bluntly. You're a soldier, Donahue, not a child. 
They issued you with a sword and a gun so you could take care of yourself, not have others take care of you. But as it happens, they do care. They care enough to send the whole lot of you to Cadiz. And I care enough to tell you that you've got two choices. You can go to Cadiz whipped, and with your men knowing they've been whipped, or you can go back with your pride intact. It's up to you. I know which one I'd choose. This was the first Donahu had heard of the Real Compañía Ilandesa's proposed move to Cadiz, and he frowned as he tried to work out whether Sharp was being serious. You sure about Cadiz? Of course I'm sure, Sharp said. General Valverde's been pulling strings. He doesn't think you should be here at all. So now you're off to join the rest of the Spanish army. Donahu digested the news for a few seconds, then nodded approval. Good, he said enthusiastically. They should have sent us there in the first place. He sipped his mug of tea and made a wry face at the taste. What happens to you now? Well, I'm ordered to stay with you till someone tells me to go somewhere else, Sharp said. He didn't want to admit that he was facing a court of inquiry, not because he was ashamed of his conduct, but because he didn't want other men's sympathies. The court was a battle that he would have to face when the time came. You're guarding the ammunition? Donahue seemed surprised. Someone has to, Sharp said. But don't worry, Donahue. They'll take me away from you before you go to Cadiz. Alvedi doesn't want me there. So, what do we do today? Donahue asked nervously. Today, Sharp said, we do our duty. And there are fifty thousand frogs doing theirs, and somewhere over that hill, Donahue, their duty and our duty will get bloody contradictory. It will be bad, Donahue said, not quite as a statement and not quite as a question either. Sharp heard the nervousness. Donahue had never been in a major battle, and any man, however brave, was right to be nervous at the prospect. It'll be bad, Sharp said. The noise is the worst, that and the powder fog. But always remember one thing. It's just as bad for the French. And I'll tell you another thing. I don't know why, and maybe it's just my imagination, but the frogs always seem to break before we do. Just when you think you can't hold on for a minute longer, count to ten. And by the time you reach six, the bloody frogs will have turned tail and buggered off. Now watch out, here's trouble. The trouble was manifested by the approach of a thin, tall, and bespectacled major in the blue coat of the Royal Artillery. He was carrying a sheaf of papers that kept coming loose as he tried to find one particular sheet among the rest. The errand sheets were being fielded by two nervous red-coated privates, one of whom had his arm in a dirty sling while the other was struggling along on a crutch. The Major waved at Sharp and Donahue, thus releasing another flutter of paper. The thing is, the Major said without any attempt to introduce himself, that the divisions have their own ammunition packs. One or the other, I said, make up your mind. But no, divisions will be independent, which leaves us, you understand, with a central reserve. They call it that, though God knows it's really in the centre. And of course, in the very nature of things, we are never told what stocks the divisions themselves hold. They demand more, we yield, and suddenly there is none. It is a problem. Let us hope and pray the French do things worse. Is that tea? The Major, who had a broad Scottish accent, peered hopefully at the mug in Donoghue's hand. It is, sir, Donahue said, but foul. Let me taste it, I beg you. Oh, thank you. Pick up that paper, Magog. The day's battle may depend upon it. Gog and Magog. He introduced the two hapless privates. Gog is bereft one arm, Magog one leg, and both the rogues are Welsh. Together, they are a Welshman and a half. And the three of us, or two and a half if I am to be exact, comprise the entire staff complement to the Central Reserve. The Major smiled suddenly. Alexander Tarrant, he introduced himself. Major in the artillery, but seconded to the Quartermaster General's staff. I think of myself as the Assistant, Assistant, Assistant Quartermaster General, and you, I suspect, are the new Assistant, 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 Assistant Quartermaster Generals, which means that Gorg and Magog are now Assistant, 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 Assistant Quartermaster Generals. Demoted by God, will their careers ever recover? Oh, this tea is delicious, though, so tepid. You must be Captain Sharp. Yes, sir. An honour, Sharp. Pon my soul, an honour. Tarrant thrust out a hand, thus releasing a cascade of paper. Hard about the dicky bird, Sharp, and confess I was moved mightily. It took Sharp half a second to realise that Tarrant was talking about the eagle that Sharp had captured at Talavera, but before he could respond, the Major was already talking again. And you must be Donahue, the Royal Guard. Poor my soul, dog, but we're an elevated company. You'll have to mind your manners today. Private you, sir, 
Gog introduced himself to Sharp. And that's my brother. He gestured with his one arm at Magog. The Hughes brothers, Tarrant explained, were wounded in their country's service and reduced to May savitude. Tell now, Sharp, they've been the sole guard for the ammunition. Gog would kick intruders and Magog shake his crutch at them. Once recovered, of course, they will return to duty, and I shall be provided with yet more cripples to protect the powder and shot. Except today, Donahue, I have your fine fellows. Let us examine your duties. The duties were hardly onerous. The Central Reserve was just that, a place where hard-pressed divisions, brigades, or even battalions could send for more ammunition. A motley collection of royal wagon train drivers augmented by muleteers and carters recruited from the local population were available to deliver the infantry cartridges, while the artillery usually provided their own transport. The difficulty of his own job, Tarrant said, was in working out which requests were frivolous and which desperate. I like to keep the supplies intact, the Scotsman said, until we near the end of an engagement. Anyone requesting ammunition in the first few hours is either already defeated or merely nervous. These papers purport to describe the divisional reserves, though the Lord alone knows how accurate they are. He thrust the papers at Sharp, then pulled them back in case Sharp muddled them. Lastly, of course, Tarrant went on, there is always the problem of making certain the ammunition gets through. Drivers can be... He paused, looking for a word. Cowards, he finally said, then frowned at the severity of the judgment. Not all, of course, and some are wonderfully stout-hearted, but the quality isn't consistent. Perhaps, gentlemen, when the fighting gets bloody, I might rely on your men to, to fortify the driver's bravery. He made this inquiry nervously, as though half expecting that Sharp or Donahue might refuse. When neither offered a demurral, he smiled. Oh, good. Well, Sharp, maybe you'd like to survey the landscape. Can't dispatch ammunition without knowing whether it's bound. The offer gave Sharp a temporary freedom. He knew that both he and Donahue had been shuffled aside as inconveniences, and that Tarrant needed neither of them, yet still the battle was to be fought, and the more Sharp understood of the battlefield, the better. Because if things go bad, Pat, he told Harper, as the two of them walked towards the gun line on the misted plateau's crest, we'll be in the thick of it. The two carried their weapons, but had left their packs and greatcoats with the ammunition wagons. Still seems odd. Harper said, having nothing proper to do. Bloody frogs might find us work, Sharp said dourly. The two men were standing at the British gun line that faced east into the rising sun that was making the mist glow above the Dos Casas stream. That stream flowed south along the foot of the high, flat-topped ridge where Sharp and Harper were standing, and which barred the French routes to Almeida. The French could have committed suicide by attacking directly over the stream and fighting up the ridge's steep escarpment into the face of the British guns. But barring that unlikely self-destruction, there were only two other routes to the besieged garrison at Almeida. One led north around the ridge, but that road was barred by the still formidable ruins of Fort Concepcion, and Wellington had decided that Marseille would try the southern road that led through Fuentes de Onoro. The village lay where the ridge fell to a wide marshy plain, above which the morning mist now shredded and faded. The road from Ciudad Rodrigo ran white and straight across that flat land to where it forded the Dos Casas stream. Once over the stream, the road climbed the hill between the village houses to reach the plateau, where it forked into two roads. One road led to Almeida, a dozen miles to the northwest, and the other to Castello Bom, and its murderously narrow bridge across the deep gorge of the Coa. If the French were to reach either road, and so relieve the besieged town and force the redcoats back to the bottleneck of the narrow bridge, then they must first fight up the steep village streets of Fuentes de Onuro, which was garrisoned with a mix of redcoats and green jackets. The ridge and the village both demanded that the enemy fight uphill, but there was a second and much more inviting option open to the French. A second road ran west across the plain south of the village. That second road ran through flat country and led to the passable fords that crossed the Coeur further south. Those fords were the only place Wellington could hope to withdraw his guns, wagons and wounded if he was forced to retreat into Portugal. And if the French threatened to outflank Fuentes de Onoro by looping deep around the southern plain, then Wellington would have to come down from the plateau to defend his escape route. If he chose not to come down from the heights, then he would abandon the only routes that offered a safe crossing of the river Coeur. 
Such a decision to let the French cut the southern roads would commit Wellington's army to victory or to utter annihilation. It was a choice Sharp would not have wanted to make himself. God save Ireland, Harper suddenly said. Oh, would you look at that? Sharp had been looking south towards the inviting flat meadows that offered such an easy route around Fuentes de Onoro's flank, but now he looked to east, to where Harper was staring, and to where the mist had thinned to reveal a long, dark grove of cork oaks and home oaks, and out of that grove, just where the white road left the dark trees, an army was appearing. Arsenia's men must have bivouacked on the tree's far side, and the smoke of their morning fires had melded with the mist to look like cloud. But now, in a grimly threatening silence, the French army debouched onto the plain that lapped wide about the village. Some of the British gunners leapt to their guns' trails and began hand-spiking the cannons around so that the barrels were aimed at the place where the road came from the trees. But a gunner colonel trotted along the line and shouted at the crews to hold their fire. Let them come closer! Hold your fire! Let's see where they place their batteries. Don't waste your powder. Morning, John. Nice one again. The colonel called to an acquaintance, then touched his hat in a polite greeting to the two strange riflemen. You boys will have some trade today, I don't doubt. You too, colonel, Sharp said. The colonel spurred on and Sharp turned back to the east. He drew out his telescope and leant on a gunnel to steady the spyglass's long barrel. French infantry was forming at the tree line just behind the deploying batteries of French artillery. The guns' teams of oxen and horses were being led back into the shelter of the oaks, while squads of gunners hoisted the hugely heavy cannon barrels out of their rear travelling trunnion holes and moved them into the forward fighting holes, where other men used hammers to fasten the cap squares over the newly placed trunnions. Other gunners were piling ammunition close to the guns, squat cylinders of round shot ready strapped to their canvas bags of gunpowder. Looks like solid shot, Sharp told Harper. They'll be aiming for the village. The British gunners near Sharp were making their own preparations. The gun's ready magazines held a mixture of round shot and case shot. The round shot were solid iron balls that would plunge wickedly through advancing infantry, while the case shot was Britain's secret weapon, the one artillery projectile that no other nation had learned to make. It was a hollow iron ball filled with musket bullets that were packed about a small powder charge that was ignited by a fuse. When the powder exploded, it shattered the outer casing and spread the musket balls in a killing fan. If the case shop was properly employed, it would explode just above and ahead of the advancing infantry, and the secret to that horror lay in the missile's fusing. The fuses were wooden, or reed tubes, filled with powder and marked into lengths each small division of the marked length representing half a second of burning time. The fuses were cut for the desired time, then pushed into the case shot and ignited by the firing of the gun itself. But a fuse that had been left too long would let the shot scream safely over the enemy's heads, while one cut too short would explode prematurely. Gunner sergeants were cutting the fuses in different lengths, then laying the ammunition in piles that represented the different ranges. The first shells had fuses over half an inch long that would delay the explosion until the shot had carried eleven hundred yards, while the shortest fuses were tiny stubs measuring hardly more than a fifth of an inch that would ignite the charge at six hundred and fifty yards. Once the enemy infantry was inside that distance, the gunners would switch to round shot alone, and after that, when the French had closed to within three hundred and fifty yards, the guns would employ canister. Tin cylinders crammed with musket balls that spread apart at the very muzzle of the cannon as the thin tin was shredded by the gun's powder charge. These guns would be firing down the slope and over the stream, so that the French infantry would be exposed to shell or shot for their whole approach. That infantry was now forming its columns. Sharp tried to count the eagles, but there were so many standards and so much movement among the enemy that it was hard to make an accurate assessment. At least a dozen battalions, he said. So where are the others? Harper asked. God knows, Sharp said. During his reconnaissance with Hogan the night before, he'd estimated that the French were marching to Almeida with at least eighty infantry battalions, but he could only see a fraction of that host forming their attack columns at the edge of the far woods. Twelve thousand men, he guessed. The last mist evaporated from the village just as the French opened fire. The opening salvo was ragged as the gun captains fired in turn so that they could observe the fall of their shot and so make adjustments to their gun's aim. 
The first shot fell short, then bounced up over the few houses and wall gardens on the far bank to plow into a tiled roof halfway up the village slope. The sound of the gun arrived after the crash of falling tiles and splintering beams. The second shot cracked into an apple tree on the stream's eastern bank and scattered a small shower of white blossom before it ricocheted into the water. The next few rounds were all aimed straight and hammered into the village houses. The British gunners muttered grudging approval of the enemy gunners' expertise. I wonder what poor sods are holding the village, Harper said. Let's go and find out. I'm honestly not that curious, sir, Harper protested, but followed sharp along the plateau's crest. The high ground ended just above the village, where the plateau bent at a right angle to run due west back into the hills. In the angle of the bend, directly above the village, were two rocky knolls, on one of which was built the village church, with its stalk's ragged nest perched precariously on the bell tower. The church's graveyard occupied the east-facing slope between the church and the village, and riflemen were crouched behind the mounded graves and canted stones, just as they were crouched among the outcrops of the second rocky knoll. Between the two stone peaks, on a saddle of short springy turf where yellow ragweed grew, and where the Almeida road reached the high ground after zigzagging up beside the graveyard, a knot of staff officers sat their horses and watched the French cannonade, which had begun to cloud the distant view with a dirty bank of smoke that twitched each time a round shot blasted through. The cannonballs were crashing remorselessly into the village, smashing tile and thatch, splintering beams and toppling walls. The sound of the gunfire was a pounding that was palpable in the warm spring air. Yet here, on the high ground above Fuentes de Oñoro, it was almost as though the battle for the village was something happening far away. Sharp led Harper on a wide detour behind the group of staff officers. Nosey's there, he explained to Harper. I don't need him glaring at me. And as bad big, sorry. Oh, more than that, Pat. I'm facing a bloody court of inquiry. Sharp had not been willing to confess the truth to Donahue, but Harper was a friend, and so he told him the story, and the bitterness of his plight could not help but spill over. What was I supposed to do, Pat? Let those raping bastards live? Model a court do to you? Christ knows. At worst, order a court martial and have me thrown out of the army. At best, or break me down to lieutenant. But that'll be the end of me. I'll make me a storekeeper again and put me in charge of bloody lists at some bloody depot where I can drink myself to death. But they have to prove you shot those buggers. God save Ireland, but none of us will say a word. Jesus, I'd kill anyone who said different. But there are others, Pat. Ransomen and Sarsfield. They won't say a word, sir. Well, I may be too late anyway. General Bloody Valverde knows, and that's all that matters. He's got his knife stuck into me. There's bugger all I can do about it. Could shoot the bastard, Harper said. You won't catch him alone, Sharp said. He dreamt of shooting Valverde, but doubted he would have the opportunity. And Hogan says that bloody loop might even send an official complaint. Oh, it isn't fair, sir, Harper complained. No, Pat, it isn't. But it hasn't happened yet, and Luke might walk into a cannonball today. But not a word to anyone, Pat. I don't want half the bloody army discussing it. I'll keep quiet, sir. Harper promised. Though he could not imagine the news not getting round the army, nor could he imagine how anyone would think justice might be served by sacrificing an officer for shooting two French bastards. He followed Sharp between two parked wagons and a brigade of seated infantry. Sharp recognised the pale green facings of the 24th, a Warwickshire regiment, while beyond them were the kilted and bonneted Highlanders of the 79th. The Highlanders' pipers were playing a wild tune to the tattoo of drums, trying to rival the deeper, percussive blasts of the French cannonade. Sharp guessed the two battalions formed the reserve, poised to go down into Fuentes de Oñoro's streets if the French looked like capturing the village. A third battalion was just joining the reserve brigade as Sharp turned towards the sound of breaking tiles and cracking stone. Right, down here, Sharp said. He'd spotted a track that led beside the graveyard's southern wall. It was a precipitous track, probably made by goats, and the two men had to use their hands to steady themselves on the steep top portion of the slope. Then they ran down the last few yards to the scanty cover of an alleyway, where they were greeted by the sudden appearance of a nervous redcoat who came round the corner with level musket. Hold your fire, lad! Sharp called. 
Anyone who comes down here is probably on your side, and if they're not, you're in trouble. Sorry, sir, the boy said, then ducked as a scrap of tile whistled overhead. They're a bit lively, sir, he added. Time to worry, lad, is when they stop firing, Sharp said, because that means the infantry are on their way. Who's in charge here? Uh, I don't know, sir, unless it's Sergeant Patterson. I doubt it, lad, but thanks anyway. Sharp ran from the alley's end, turned down a side street, dodged right into another street, jumped down a steep flight of stone stairs littered with broken tiles, and so found himself in the main street, which ran down the hill in a series of sharp twists. A round shot hit the street centre just as he ducked down beside a dung heap. The ball ploughed up a patch of stone and earth, then bounced to smash into a reed-thatched cattle byre as another round shot splayed apart some roof beams across the street. Still more shots crashed home as the French gunners put in a sudden energetic spell. Sharp and Harper took temporary cover in a doorway that bore the fading chalk marks from both armies' billeting officers. One mark read, Fifth of the Fourth Sixty, meaning that five men of Number Four Company of the Sixtieth Rifles had been billeted in the tiny cottage, while just above it was a legend saying that seven Frenchmen, the mark carried the enemy's strange crossbar on the shank of the seven, of the eighty-second of the line had once been posted to the house that now lacked its roof. Dust drifted like mist in what had been the front room, where a torn sacking curtain fluttered forlornly at a window. The village's inhabitants and their belongings had been carried in army wagons to the nearby town of Frenada, but inevitably some of the village's possessions had been left behind. One doorway was barricaded with a child's cot, while another had a pair of benches as a fire step. A mixture of riflemen and redcoats garrisoned the town, and they were sheltering from the cannonade by crouching behind the thickest walls of the deserted houses. The stone walls could not stop every French round shot, and Sharp had already passed three dead men put out in the street, and seen a half-dozen wounded men making their slow way back up towards the ridge. "'What unit are you?' he called to a sergeant sheltering behind the cot across the street. "'Third Division Light Company, sir!' the sergeant called back. "'And the First Division!' another voice chimed in. "'Don't forget the First Division!' It seemed the army had collected the cream of two divisions, their skirmishers, and put them into Fuentes de Oñoro. Skirmishers were the brightest men, the ones trained to fight independently, and this village was no place for men who could only stand in the battle line and fire volleys. This was going to be a place of sharp shooting and street brawls, a place where men would be separated from their officers and forced to fight without orders. Who's in charge of you all? Sharp asked the sergeant. Colonel Williams of the 60th, sir. Uh, down there in the inn. Thanks. Sharp and Harper edged down the side of the street. A round shot rumbled overhead to drive into a roof. A scream sounded, then was cut off. The inn was the very same tavern where Sharp had first met El Castrador, and where now, in the same garden with the half-severed vine, he found Colonel Williams and his small staff. It's Sharp, isn't it? Come to help us. Williams was a genial Welshman from the 60th Rifles. I don't know you, he said to Harper. Sergeant Harper, sir. Oh, you look handy to have a scrap, Sergeant, William said. Damn noisy today, eh? he added in mild complaint of the cannonade. He was standing on a bench that gave him a view over the garden wall and the roofs of the lower houses. So what brings you here, Sharp? I'm just making sure we know where to deliver ammunition, sir. Williams offered Sharp an owlish gaze of surprise. What you fetching and carrying of, they? Well, seems a waste of time for a man of your talent, Sharp. I don't think you'll find much custom here. My boys are all well supplied. Eighty rounds a man, two thousand men, and as many cartridges again stacked up in the church. Sweet Jesus! This last imprecation was caused by a round shot that must have gone within two feet of the colonel's head, forcing him to duck hard down. It crashed into a house. There was a tumble of falling stone and then quite suddenly silence. Sharp tensed. The silence, after the crash of the guns and the splintering thunder of the round shot's destructive impacts, was unnerving. Maybe he thought it was just a strange pause, like the sudden coincidental silence that could descend on a room of lively talkers during that moment when an angel was said to be passing over the room. And maybe an angel had flickered across the gun smoke, and all the French cannon had found themselves momentarily unloaded. Sharp almost found himself praying for the guns to start again, but the silence stretched, 
and stretched, threatening to be replaced by something much worse than a cannonade. Somewhere in the village a man coughed and a musket lock clicked. A horse whinnied up on the ridge where the pipes played. Rubble fell in a house where a wounded man whimpered. Out in the street a spent French cannonball rolled gently downhill, then lodged against a fallen beam. I suspect we'll have company soon, gentlemen, William said. He climbed down from the bench and brushed white dust from his faded green jacket. Very soon. Can't see a thing from here. Gun smoke, you see. Worse than fog. He was talking to fill the ominous silence. Down to the stream, I think. Not that we can hold them there, not enough loopholes. But once they're in the village, they'll find life a bit difficult. At least I hope so. He nodded agreeably to Sharp, then ducked out of the door. His staff ran after him. We're not staying here, are we, sir? Harper asked. I might as well see what's happening, Sharp said. Got nothing better to do. Are you loaded? Just the rifle. Might have the volley gun ready, Sharp said, just in case. He began loading his own rifle, just as the British guns on the ridge opened fire. Their smoke jetted sixty feet out from the crest, and their noise punched at the wounded village as the shots screamed overhead towards the advancing French battalions. Sharp stood on the bench to see the dark columns of infantry emerging from the French gun smoke. The first British case shot exploded above and ahead of the columns, each explosion staining the air with a smear of grey-white smoke riven with fire. Solid shots seared into the massed ranks, but none of the missiles seemed to make an ounce of difference. The columns kept coming. Twelve thousand men under their eagles being drummed across the flat land towards the hammering artillery and the waiting muskets and the primed rifles beyond the stream. Sharp looked left and right, but saw no other enemies apart from a handful of green-coated dragoons patrolling the southern fields. They're coming straight in, he said. Oh, messing. One attack, Pat, hard at the village. No buggering round the edge yet. Looks like they think they can come straight through here. There'll be more brigades behind, and they'll throw them in one after the other till they get the church. After that, it's downhill all the way to the Atlantic. So if we don't stop them here, we'll not stop them anywhere. Well, as you say, sir, we've got nothing better to do. Harper finished loading his seven-barrel gun, then picked up a small rag doll that had been discarded under the garden bench. The doll had a red torso, on which a mother had stitched a white crossbelt to imitate a British infantryman's uniform. Harper propped the doll in a niche in the wall. You keep guard now, he said to the rag bundle. Sharp half drew his sword and tested the edge. Didn't get it sharpened, he said. Before a battle, he liked to have the big blade professionally honed by a cavalry armourer, but there'd been no time. He hoped it was not an omen. Well, you'll have to bludgeon the bastards to death, then, Harper said, then crossed himself before reaching into his pocket to make sure his rabbit's foot was in its proper place. He looked back to the rag doll and was suddenly overwhelmed by a certainty that his own fate hung on the doll surviving in the wall's niche. You take care now, he told the doll, then gave fate a nudge by jamming a scrap of stone across the niche's face to try and imprison the small rag toy. A crackling sound like the tearing of calico announced that the British skirmishers had opened fire. The French voltigeurs had been advancing a hundred paces in front of their columns, but now were stopped by the fire of the riflemen concealed among the gardens and hovels on the stream's far bank. For a few minutes the skirmish fire stuttered loud. Then the outnumbering voltigeurs threatened to surround the British skirmishers, and the whistles of the officers and sergeants sounded shrilly to call the green jackets back through the gardens. Two riflemen were limping. A third was being carried by two of his comrades. But most splashed unscathed through the stream and up into the labyrinthine maze of cottages and alleys. The French voltigeur crouched behind the garden walls on the stream's far bank and began trading fire with the villagers' defenders. The stream became fogged with a lacy veil of powder smoke that drifted south in the day's small wind. Sharp and Harper, still waiting in the inn, could hear the French drummers sounding the pas de charge the rhythm that had driven Napoleon's veterans over half Europe to fell their enemies like ninepins. The drum suddenly paused, and both Sharp and Harper instinctively mouthed the words along with twelve thousand Frenchmen. Vive l'Empereur! Both men laughed as the drums started again. The guns on the ridge had abandoned the case shot and were smashing round shot down into the columns. 
and now that the enemy's main formations were almost at the village's eastern gardens, Sharp could see the damage being done by the iron balls as they slashed through file and rank to fling men aside like bloody rags before bouncing in sprays of misted blood to smash into yet more ranks of men. Again and again the missiles lanced through the massed files, yet again and again, doggedly, unstoppably, the French closed up their ranks and kept on coming. The drummers beat on, the eagles flashed in the sun as brightly as the bayonets on the muskets of the leading ranks. The drums paused again. Vive l'Empereur! the mass of Frenchmen called. But this time they drew out the last syllable into a long cheer that sustained them as they were released to the attack. The columns could not march in close order through the maze of walled gardens on the village's eastern bank, and so the attacking infantry was let off the leash and ordered to charge pell-mell through the vegetable plots and small orchards, across the stream and up into the fire of Colonel Williams's defenders. God save us, Harper said in awe, as the French attack engulfed the far bank like a dark wave. The enemy were cheering as they ran, and as they overwhelmed the small walls and trampled down the spring crops and splashed into the shallow stream. Fire! a voice shouted, and the muskets and rifles cracked from the loopholed houses. A Frenchman went down, his blood thick in the water. Another fell on the clapper bridge and was unceremoniously pushed into the ford by the men crowding behind. Sharp and Harper both fired from the inn garden, their bullets spinning over the lower roofs to plough into the mass of attackers, who were now shielded from the artillery on the ridge by the village itself. The first French attackers burst against the village's eastern walls. Bayonets clashed against bayonets. Sharp saw a Frenchman appear on top of a wall, then jumped down into a hidden yard. More Frenchmen followed him across the wall. Sword on, Pat! Sharp said, and drew his own sword as Harper clicked the saw bayonet onto his rifle. They ducked through the garden door and ran down the main street to find their progress blocked by a double rank of redcoats who were waiting with charged muskets and fixed bayonets. Twenty yards further down the street, there were more redcoats who were firing over a makeshift barricade of window shutters, doors, tree branches, and a pair of commandeered handcarts. The barricade was shaking from the assault of the French on the far side, and every few seconds a musket would be thrust through the entanglement and blast fire, smoke, and bullet at the defenders. Ready to open files? the redcoat lieutenant called. He looked to be about eighteen years old, but his West Country voice was firm. He nodded a greeting to Sharp, then looked back to the barricade. Steady now, boys, steady! Sharp knew he would not need the sword yet, so sheathed it and reloaded his rifle instead. He bit the bullet off the cartridge, then held the round in his mouth as he pulled the rifle's hammer back one click to the half-cock. He could taste the acrid, salty powder in his mouth as he poured a pinch of powder from the cartridge into the lock's open pan. He held tight to the rest of the cartridge as he pulled the frizzen full up to close the pan cover. Then, with the rifle so primed, he let its brass stock fall to the ground. He poured the rest of the cartridge's powder into the muzzle, crammed the empty wax cartridge paper on top of the powder to serve as wadding, then bent his head to spit the bullet into the gun. He yanked out the steel ramming rod with his left hand, spun the ramrod so that the splayed head faced downwards, and thrust the rod hard down the barrel. He pulled it out, spun it again, and let it fall into its holding rings, then tossed the rifle up with his left hand, caught it under the lock with his right, and pulled the hammer back through a second click so that the weapon was at full cock and ready to fire. It had taken him twelve seconds, and he had not thought once about what he was doing, nor even looked at the gun while he loaded it. The manoeuvre was the basic skill of his trade, the necessary skill that had to be taught to new recruits, and then practised and practised until it was second nature. As a new recruit, just sixteen years old, Sharp had dreamt about loading muskets, He'd been forced to do it again and again until he'd been bored rigid by the drill and was ready to spit at the sergeants for making him do it one more time. And then, on a damp day in Flanders, he'd found himself doing it for real, and suddenly he'd fumbled the cartridge and lost his ramrod and forgotten to prime the musket. He'd somehow survived that fight, and afterwards he'd practised it again until at last he could do it without thinking. It was the same skill that he'd laboured to drive into the Real Compagnie Irlandesa during their unhappy stay in the San Isidro fort. Now, as he watched the defenders back away from the collapsing barricade, he found himself wondering how many times he'd loaded a gun. 
except there was no time to make a guess, for the barricade's defenders were running back up the street, and the victory roar of the French was swelling as they dismantled the last pieces of the obstacle. Open files! the lieutenant shouted, and the two ranks of men obediently opened their files out from the centre to let the barricade's defenders stream through. At least three red-jacketed bodies were left on the street. A wounded man collapsed and pulled himself into a doorway. Then a red-faced captain with grey side-whiskers ran through the gap and shouted at the men to close ranks. The files closed again. Rank, rank, kneel! The lieutenant shouted when his two ranks were again arrayed across the street. Wait for it! he called, and this time his voice cracked with nervousness. Wait for it! he called again more firmly, then drew his sword and gave the slim blade a couple of tentative strokes. He swallowed as he watched the French finally burst through the wreckage and charge up the hill with their bayonets fixed. Fire! the lieutenant shouted, and the twenty-four muskets crashed in unison to choke the road with smoke. Somewhere a man was screaming. Sharp fired his rifle and heard the distinctive sound of a bullet hitting a musket stock. Front rank stand, the lieutenant called. At the double, advance! The smoke cleared to show a half-dozen blue-coated bodies down on the stones and earth of the road. Burning scraps of wadding flickered like candle flames. The enemy retreated fast from the threat of the bayonets, but then another mass of blue uniforms appeared at the bottom edge of the village. I'm ready, Pollard! A voice called behind Sharp, and the lieutenant, hearing it, halted his men. Back, boys! he shouted, and the two ranks, unable to advance against the new mass of the enemy, broke files and retreated uphill. The new attackers had loaded muskets, and some stopped to aim. Harper gave them the seven barrels of his volley gun, then followed Sharp up the hill as the smoke of the big gun spread between the houses. The grey-whiskered captain had formed a new defence line that opened to let the lieutenant's men through. The lieutenant formed his men into their two ranks a few paces behind the captain's men and shouted at the redcoats to reload. Sharp reloaded with them. Harper, knowing he wouldn't have time to reload the volley gun, strapped it across his back and spat a bullet into his rifle. The drums were still beating the pas de charge, while on the ridge behind Sharp the pipes were rivaling the sound with their feral music. The cannon on the ridge was still firing, presumably aiming case shot at the distant French artillery. The small village reeked of powder smoke, reverberated with musket shots, and echoed with the screams and shouts of frightened men. Fire! the captain ordered, and his men poured a volley down the street. It was answered by a French volley. The enemy had decided to use their firepower rather than try to rush the defenders, and it was a battle the captain knew he must lose. Close on me, Bollard! he shouted, and the young lieutenant took his men down to join the captain's troops. Fire! Pollard shouted, then made a mewing sound that was momentarily drowned by the crash of his men's muskets. The lieutenant staggered back, blood showing on the white facings of his elegant coat. He staggered again and let go of his sword, which clattered on a doorstep. Take him back, Pat, Sharp said. Maybe at the top of the cemetery. Harper lifted the lieutenant as though he was a child and ran back up the street. The redcoats were reloading, their ramrods rising and falling over their dark shackos. Sharp waited for the smoke to clear and looked for an enemy officer. He saw a moustached man carrying a sword, aimed, fired, and thought he saw the man twist backwards, but the smoke obscured his view, and then a great rush of Frenchmen pounded up the street. Bennets! the captain called. One red coat backed away. Sharp put his hand in the small of the man's back and shoved him hard back into his rank. He slung his rifle and drew his sword again. The French charge stalled in the face of the unbroken ranks with their grim steel blades, but the captain knew he was outgunned and outnumbered. Pace backwards, he ordered. Slow and steady, slow and steady. If you're loaded, boys, give them a shot. A dozen muskets fired, but at least twice as many Frenchmen returned the volley, and the captain's rank seemed to shudder as the balls struck home. Sharp was serving as a sergeant now, keeping the files in place from behind but he was also looking back up the street to where a mixture of redcoats and greenjackets were retreating haphazardly from an alley. Their ragged retreat suggested the French were not far behind them, and in a moment or two, Sharp reckoned, the captain's small company might be cut off. Captain! he shouted, then pointed with his sword when he had the man's attention. 
Back, lads, back! The captain grasped the danger immediately. His men turned and ran up the street. Some were helping their comrades, a few ran hard to find safety, but most stayed together to join the larger number of British troops who were forming in the small cobbled space at the village's centre. Williams had held three reserve companies in the safer houses at the upper end of the village, and those men had now come down to stem the rising French tide. The French burst out of the alley just as the company went past its mouth. A redcoat went down to a bayonet. Then the captain slashed his sword in a wild cut that sliced open the face of the Frenchman. A big French sergeant swung his musket stock at the captain, but Sharp lunged into the man's face with his sword, and though the blow was off balance and feeble, it served to check the man while the captain got away. The Frenchman rammed his bayonet at Sharp, had it parried away, then Sharp skewered the sword low and hard, twisting the blade to stop it being gripped by the man's flesh. He ripped it clear of the Frenchman's belly and went back up the hill, one pace, two, watching for more attacks. Then a hand pulled him into the reformed British ranks in the open space. Fire! someone shouted, and Sharp's ears rang with a deafening bellow of serried muskets exploding all around his head. I want that alley cleared! Colonel William's voice called. One Wentworth! Take your men down! Don't let them stand! A group of redcoats charged. There were French muskets firing from the windows of the houses, and some of the men burst through the doors to drive the French out. More enemy came up the main street. They came in small groups, stopping to fire, then running up into the square where the battle was ragged and desperate. One small group of redcoats was overrun by a rush of Frenchmen who came out of a side alley, and there were screams as the enemy's bayonets rose and fell. A boy somehow escaped the massacre and scrambled over the cobbles. Where's your musket, Saunders? a sergeant shouted. The boys swore, turned to look for his fallen weapon, and were shot in the open mouth. The French, exhilarated by their victory over the small group, charged over the boy's body to attack the larger mass of men who were trying to hold the mouth of the recaptured alley. They were met by bayonets. The clash of steel on steel and of steel on wood was louder than the muskets. A few men now had time to load a musket, and so they used their blades or the stocks of their guns instead of bullets. The two sides stood poised just feet from each other, and every now and then a brave group of men would summon the courage to make a charge into the enemy ranks. Then the voices would rise to hoarse shouts, and the clash of steel would begin again. One such assault was led by a tall, bareheaded French officer, who drove two redcoats aside with whip-quick slashes of his sword, then lunged at a British officer who was fumbling with his pistol. The red-coated officer stepped back and so exposed Sharp, the tall Frenchman fainted left and managed to draw Sharp's sword away in the parry, then reversed his stroke and was already gritting his teeth for the killing lunge. But Sharp was not fighting by the rules of some Parisian fencing master, and so he kicked the man in the crutch, then hammered the heavy iron hilt of the sword down onto his head. He kicked the man out of the ranks and back-cut his heavy sword at a French soldier who was trying to drag a musket and bayonet out of a redcoat's hand. The blade's edge, unsharpened, served as a cudgel rather than a sword, but the Frenchman reeled away with his head in his hands. Forward! a voice shouted, and the makeshift British line advanced down the street. The enemy retreated from Williams's reserve, who now threatened to take back the whole lower part of the village. But then a vagary of wind swelled away a patch of dust and gun smoke, and Sharp saw a whole new wave of French attackers swarming over the gardens and walls on the stream's eastern bank. Sharp, Colonel Williams called. Are you spoken for? Sharp elbowed back through the tight ranks of redcoats. Sir, I'll be damn grateful if you were to find Spencer on the ridge and tell him we could use a few reinforcements. At once, sir. Lost a couple of my aides, you see. Williams began to explain, but Sharp had already left on the errand. Good man, Williams called after him, then turned back to the fight that had degenerated into a series of bloody and desperate brawls in the murderous confines of the alleys and back gardens. It was a fight Williams feared losing, for the French had committed their own reserves, and a new mass of blue-coated infantry was now pouring into the village. Sharp ran past wounded men, dragging themselves uphill. The village was clouded with dust and smoke, and he took one wrong turning and found himself in a blind alley of stone walls. He backtracked, found the right street again, and emerged on the slope above the village where a crowd of wounded men waited for help. They were too weak to climb the slope, and some called out as Sharp ran past. He ignored them. 
Instead, he climbed up the goat path beside the graveyard. A group of worried officers were standing beside the church, and Sharp shouted at them to see if anyone knew where General Spencer was. I've got a message, he called. What is it? A man called. I'm his aide. Williams wants reinforcements. Too many frogs. The staff officer turned and ran towards the brigade that was waiting beyond the crest, while Sharp paused to catch his breath. His sword was in his hand, and its blade was sticky with blood. He cleaned the steel on the edge of his jacket, then jumped an alarm as a bullet smacked hard into the stone wall beside him. He turned and saw a puff of musket smoke showing between some broken beams at the upper edge of the village, and he realised the French had taken those houses and were now trying to cut off the defenders still inside Fuentes de Oñoro. The green jackets in the graveyard opened fire, their rifles cutting down any enemy foolish enough to show himself at a window or door for too long. Sharp sheathed his clean sword, then went over the wall and crouched behind a slab of granite on which a rough cross had been chiselled. He loaded the rifle, then aimed it at the broken roof where he'd seen the musket smoke. The flint had skewed in the doghead, and he released the screw, adjusted the leather patch that gripped the flint, then tightened it down. He thumbed the cock back. He was bitterly thirsty. The usual fate of any man who'd been biting into salty gunpowder cartridges. The air was foul with the stench of smoke. A musket appeared between the beams, and a second later a man's head showed. Sharp fired first, but the rifled smoke hid the bullet's mark. Harper slid down the graveyard slope to land beside Sharp. Jesus, the Irishman said. Jesus! Bad in there, Sharp nodded down to the village. He primed the rifle, then upended the weapon to charge the muzzle. He'd left his ramrod conveniently propped against the grave. More of the boggers coming over the stream, Harper said. He bit a bullet and was forced to silence until he could spit it into the rifle. That poor lieutenant, Dade. It was a chest wound, Sharp said, ramming the ball in charge hard down the barrel. Not many survived chest wounds. I stay with the poor bugger, Harper said. His mother's a widow, he told me. He sold the family plate to bay his uniform and sword, then said he'd be as great a soldier as any there was. He was good. Sharp said, kept his nerve. He cocked the rifle. I told him that. Gave him a prayer, poor wee bugger. First battle, too. Harper pulled the trigger. Gotcha, you bastard, he said, and immediately fished a new cartridge from his pouch while he pulled the hammer to half cock. More British defenders were emerging from between the houses, forced out of the village by the sheer weight of French numbers. They should send some more men down there, Harper said. Well, they're coming, Sharp said. He laid the rifle's barrel on the gravestone and looked for a target. Taken their time, though, Harper said. On this occasion, he did not spit the bullet into the rifle, but first wrapped it in the small patch of greased leather that would grip the barrel's rifling and so make the ball spin as it was fired. It took longer to load such a round, but it made the Baker rifle far more accurate. The Irishman grunted as he forced the patch bullet down the barrel that was caked with the deposits of gunpowder. There's some boiling water behind the church he said, telling Sharp where to go if he needed to clean the fouled powder from his rifle's barrel. I'll piss down it if I have to. If you've got any piss, aim as dry as a dead rat. Jesus, you bastard! This was addressed at a bearded Frenchman who had appeared between two of the houses where he was beating down a green jacket with a pioneer's axe. Sharp, already loaded, took aim through the sudden spray of the dying rifleman's blood and pulled the trigger. But at least a dozen other green jackets in the churchyard had seen the incident, and the bearded Frenchman seemed to quiver as the bullets whipped home. That'll teach him, Harper said, and laid his rifle on the stone. Where the hell are those reinforcements? Takes time to get them ready, Sharp said. Lose a bloody battle just because they want straight ranks, Harper asked scornfully. He looked for a target. Come on, someone, show yourself. More of Williams's men retreated out of the village. They tried to form ranks on the rough ground at the foot of the graveyard, but by abandoning the houses, they had yielded the stone walls to the French, who could hide as they loaded, fire, then duck back into hiding again. Some British were still fighting inside the village, but the musket smoke betrayed that their fight had shrunk to a small group of houses at the very top of the main street. One more push by the French, Sharp thought, and the village would be lost, and then there'd be a bitter fight up through the graveyard for mastery of the church and the rock outcrop. Lose those two summits, he thought, and the battle was done. The French drumming rose to a new fervour. 
There were Frenchmen coming out of the houses to form small squads that tried to outflank the retreating British. The riflemen in the graveyard fired at the daring sallies, but there were too many French and not enough rifles. One of the wounded men tried to crawl away from the advancing enemy and was bayoneted in the back for his trouble. Two Frenchmen ransacked his uniform, searching for the small hordes of coins most soldiers hid away. Sharp fired at the plunderers, then turned his rifle on the French, who were threatening to find cover behind the graveyard's lower wall. He loaded and fired, loaded and fired, until his right shoulder felt like one massive bruise, hammered into the bone by the rifle's brutal recoil. And then, suddenly, blessedly, there was a skirl of pipes and a rush of kilted men spilt over the crest of the ridge between the church and the rocks to charge down the main road into the village. Look at the bastards! Harper said with pride. They'll give the frogs a great beating. The Warwicks appeared to Sharp's right, and, like the Scots, just poured over the edge and scrambled down the steeper slope towards Fuentes de Onuro. The leading French attackers paused for a second to judge the weight of the counterattack, then hurried back into the cover of the houses. The Highlanders were already in the village, where their war cries echoed between the walls. Then the Warwicks went into the western alleyways and drove hard and deep into the tangle of houses. Sharp felt the tension drain out of him. He was thirsty. He ached. He was tired, and his shoulder was agony. Jesus, he said. It wasn't even our fight. The thirst was galling, and he'd left his canteen with the ammunition wagons, but he felt too tired and dispirited to go and find water. He watched the broken village, noting how the gun smoke marked the British advance right back down to the stream's edge, but he felt little elation. It seemed to Sharp that all his hopes had stalled. He faced disgrace. Worse, he felt a sense of failure. He had dared to hope that he could turn the Real Compagnie Irlandesa into soldiers. But he knew, staring down at the gun smoke and the shattered houses, that the Irishman needed another month of training, and far more goodwill than Wellington had ever been prepared to give them. Sharp had failed with them just as he had failed Hogan, and the twin failures raked at his spirits. Then he realised he was feeling sorry for himself, just as Donoghue had felt self-pity in the morning mist. Jesus, he said, disgusted at himself. Sir? Harper asked, not having heard Sharp. Never mind, Sharp said. He felt the loom of disgrace and the bite of regret. He was a captain on sufferance, and he supposed he would never now make major. Bugger them all, Pat, he said, and wearily stood. Let's find something to drink. Down in the village, a dying redcoat had found Harper's rag doll jammed into the niche of the wall and had shoved it into his mouth to stop himself crying out in his pain. Now he died, and his blood welled and spilt from his gullet so that the small damaged doll fell into a welter of red. The French had pulled back beyond the stream, where they took cover behind the garden walls to open fire on the Highlanders and the Warwicks who hunted down the last groups of trapped French survivors in the village. A disconsolate line of French prisoners straggled up the slope under a mixed guard of riflemen and Highlanders. Colonel Williams had been wounded in the counterattack and was now carried by his riflemen to the church, which had been turned into a hospital. The stork's nest on the bell tower was still an untidy tangle of twigs, but the adult birds had been driven out by the noise and smoke of the battle to leave their nestlings to starve. The sound of musketry crackled across the stream for a while, then died away as both sides took stock of the first attack. But not, both sides knew, the last. Chapter 8 The French did not attack again. They stayed on the stream's eastern bank, while behind them, at the distant line of oaks that straddled the straight white road, the rest of their army slowly deployed, so that by nightfall the whole of Massenia's force was encamped, and the smoke of their fires mingled to make a grey wash that darkened to a hellish black as the sun sank behind the British ridge. The fighting in the village had stopped, but the artillery kept up a desultory battle till nightfall. The British had the best of it. Their guns were in place just back from the plateau's crest, so that all the French could aim for was the skyline itself and most of their shots were fired too high and rumbled impotently over the British infantry concealed by the crest. Shots fired too low merely thumped into the ridge's slope, which was too steep for the round shot to bounce up to their targets. 
The British gunners, on the other hand, had a clear view of the enemy batteries, and one by one their long-fused case shot either silenced the French artillery or persuaded the gunners to drag their cannon back into the cover of the trees. The last gun fired as the sun set. The flat echo of the sound crashed and faded across the shadowed plain, while the smoke from the gun's barrel curled and drifted in the wind. Small fires flickered in the village ruins, the flames glimmering luridly on broken walls and snapped beams. The streets were crammed with dead men and pitiful with the wounded who cried through the night for help. Behind the church, where the luckier casualties had been safely evacuated, wives searched for husbands, brothers for brothers, and friends for friends. Burial parties looked for patches of soil on the rocky slopes, while officers auctioned the possessions of their dead mess fellows and wondered how long it would be before their own belongings were similarly knocked down for puny prices. Up on the plateau, the soldiers stewed newly slaughtered beef in their Flanders cauldrons and sang sentimental songs of greenwoods and girls. The armies slept with their weapons loaded and ready. Pickets watched the dark as the big guns cooled. Rats scampered through the fallen stones of Fuentes de Onoro and gnawed at dead men. Few of the living slept well. The British foot guards had been infected with Methodism, and some of the guardsmen gathered for a midnight prayer meeting, until a cold streamer officer growled at them to give God and himself a bloody rest. Other men prowled in the dark to seek the dead and wounded for plunder. Now and then an injured man would call out in protest, and a bayonet would glint quickly in the starlight, and a wash of blood ebb into the soil as the newly dead man's uniform was searched for coins. Major Tarrant had at last heard about Sharp's impending ordeal by court of inquiry. He could hardly have avoided learning of it, for a succession of officers came to the ammunition park to give Sharp their condolences, and to complain that an army which persecuted a man for killing the enemy must be an army led by idiots and administered by fools. Tarrant did not understand Wellington's decision either. Surely the two men deserve to die. I agree they hardly endured the proper processes of the law, but even so could anyone doubt their guilt. Captain Donahue, who was sharing Tarrant's late supper with Sharp, nodded agreement. It's not about two men dying, sir, Sharp said, but about bloody politics. I've given the Spanish reason to distrust us, sir. But no Spaniards died, Tarrant protested. Aye, sir, but too many good Portuguese did. So General Valverde is claiming that we can't be trusted with other nation soldiers. Oh, this is too bad, Tarrant said angrily. So what happens to you now? Sharp shrugged. Well, there's a court of inquiry. I'm blamed, which means a court-martial. The worst they can do to me, sir, is take away my commission. Captain Donahue frowned. Suppose I speak to General Valverde. Sharp shook his head. And ruin your career, too? Thank you, but no. What this is really about, he explained, is who should become Generalissimo of Spain. We reckon it should be nosy, but Valverde doesn't agree. Doubtless because he wants the job himself, Tarrant said scornfully. That is too bad, Sharp, too bad. The Scotsman frowned down at the dish of liver and kidney that Gog and Magog had cooked for his supper. Traditionally, the officers received the offal of newly slaughtered cattle, a privilege Tarrant would happily have foregone. He tossed a peculiarly nauseating piece of kidney to one of the many dogs that had attached themselves to the army, then shook his head. Is there any chance at all that you might avoid this ridiculous cut of inquiry? He asked Sharp. Sharp thought of Hogan's sarcastic remark that Sharp's only hope lay in a French victory that would obliterate all memories of what had happened at San Isidro. That seemed a dubious solution. Yet there was another hope, a very slender hope, but one Sharp had been thinking about all day. One, Tarrant said, sensing that the rifleman was hesitant about offering an answer. Sharp grimaced. Nosey's been known to pardon men for good behaviour. There was a fellow in the 83rd who was caught red-handed stealing money from a poor box in Guada, and he was condemned to be hanged for it, but his company fought so well at Talavera that Nosey let him go. Donahue gestured with his knife towards the village that was beyond the eastern skyline. Is that why you fought down there all day? he asked. Sharp shook his head. We just happened to find ourselves down there, he said dismissively. But you took an eagle, Sharp, Tarrant protested. 
What more gallantry do you need to display? A lot, sir. Sharp winced as his sore shoulder gave a stab of pain. I'm not rich, sir, so I can't buy a captaincy, let alone a majority, so I have to survive by merit. And a soldier's only as good as his last battle, sir. And my last battle was San Isidro. I have to wipe that out. Donahue frowned. It was my only battle, he said softly, and to no one but himself. Taron scorned Sharp's pessimism. Are you saying, Sharp, that you have to perform some ridiculous act of heroism to survive? Oh, yes, sir, exactly that, sir. So if you've got some horrid errand tomorrow, then I want it. Good God, man. Tarrant was appalled. Good God. Send you to your death? I can't do that. Sharp smiled. What were you doing seventeen years ago, sir? Tarrant thought for a second or two. Ninety-four. Uh, let's see now. He counted off on his fingers for another few seconds. They were still at school. And string Horace in a gloomy schoolroom beneath the walls of Stirling Castle and being beaten every time I made an error. I was fighting the French, sir, Sharp said. And I've been fighting one bug or another ever since. So don't you worry about me. Oh, even so, Sharp, even so. Tarrant frowned and shook his head. You like kidney? Love it, sir. Oh, it's all yours. Tarrant handed his plate to Sharp. Get your strength up, Sharp. It seems you might need it. He twisted around to look at the red flame glow that lit the night above the fires of the French encampments. Unless they don't attack, he said wistfully. The buggers aren't going away, sir, until we drive them away, Sharp said. Today was just a skirmish. The real battle hasn't started yet. But the crapos will be back, sir. They'll be back. They slept close to the ammunition wagons. Sharp woke once as a small shower hissed in the embers of the fire, then slept again until an hour before dawn. He awoke to see a small mist clinging to the plateau and blurring the grey shapes of soldiers tending their fires. Sharp shared a pot of hot shaving water with Major Tarrant, then pulled on his jacket and weapons and walked westwards in search of a cavalry regiment. He found an encampment of hussars from the King's German Legion and exchanged a half-pint of issue rum for an edge on his sword. The German armourer bent over his wheel as the sparks flew, and when he was done the edge of Sharp's heavy cavalry sword was glinting in the dawn's small light. Sharp slid the blade carefully into its scabbard and walked slowly back towards the gaunt, silhouetted shapes of the wagon park. The sun rose through a cloud of French cooking smoke. The enemy on the stream's eastern bank greeted the new day with a fusillade of musketry that rattled among Fuentes de Onoro's houses, but died away as no shots were returned. On the British ridge, the gunners cut new fuses and piled their ready magazines with case shot. But no French infantry advanced from the distant trees to be the beneficiaries of their work. A large force of French cavalry rode southwards across the marshy plain where they were shadowed by horsemen from the King's German Legion. But as the sun rose higher and the last pockets of mist evaporated from the lowland fields, it dawned on the waiting British that Massenia was not planning any immediate attack. Two hours after dawn, a French voltigeur picket on the stream's eastern bank called out a tentative greeting to the British sentry he knew was hidden behind a broken wall on the west bank. He couldn't see the British soldier, but he could see the blue haze of his pipe smoke. Godem, he called, using the French nickname for all British troops. Godem, Grappo! A pair of empty hands appeared above the French-held wall. No one fired and a moment later an anxious, moustached face appeared. The Frenchman produced an unlit cigar and mimed that he would like a light. The green jacket picket emerged from hiding just as warily, but when no enemy fired at him, he walked out onto the clapper bridge that had lost one of its stone slabs in the previous day's fighting. He held his clay pipe out over the gap. Come on, Frenchy! The voltigeur walked onto the bridge and leant over for the pipe that he used to light his cigar. Then he returned the pipe with a short length of garlic sausage. The two men smoked companionably, enjoying the spring sunshine. Other voltigeurs stretched and stood, just as the green jackets relaxed in their positions. Some men took off their boots and dangled their feet in the stream. In Fuentes de Onoro itself, the British were struggling to remove the dead and the wounded from the crammed alleys. 
Men wrapped cloth strips about their mouths to drag the blood-black and heat-swollen bodies from the piles that mark where the fighting had been fiercest. Other men fetched water from the stream to relieve the thirst of the wounded. By mid-morning the truce across the stream was official, and a company of unarmed French infantry arrived to carry their own casualties back across the bridge that had been patched with a plank taken from the watermill on the British bank. French ambulances waited at the ford to carry their men to the surgeons. The vehicles had been specially constructed for carrying wounded men, and had springs as lavish as any city grandee's coach. The British army preferred to use farm carts that jolted the wounded foully. A French major sat drinking wine and playing chess with a green jacket captain in the inn's garden. Outside the inn, a work party loaded an ox-drawn wagon with the dead, who would be carried up to the ridge and buried in a common grave. The chess players frowned when a burst of raucous laughter sounded loud, and the British captain, annoyed that the laughter was not fading away, went to the gate and snapped at a sergeant for an explanation. It was Mallory, sir, the sergeant said, pointing to a shamefaced British rifleman who was the butt of French and British amusement. Bugger fell asleep, sir, and the frogs was loading him up with the dead uns. The French major took one of the Englishman's castles and remarked that he'd once almost buried a living man. We were already throwing earth in his grave when he sneezed. That was in Italy. He's a sergeant now. The rifle captain might have been losing the game of chess, but he was determined not to be outdone in stories. I've met two men who survived hangings in England, he remarked. They were pulled off a scaffold too soon, and their bodies sold to the surgeons. The doctors pay five guineas a corpse, I'm told, so they can demonstrate their damn techniques to their apprentices. I'm told the corpses revive far more often than you'd think. There's always an unseemly scramble round the gallows as a man's family tries to cut the body down before the doctors get their wretched hands on it. And there doesn't seem anyone in authority to make sure the villain's properly dead before he's unstrung. He moved to Bishop. I suppose the authorities have been bribed. The guillotine makes no such mistakes, the Major said as he advanced to pawn. Death by science, very quick and certain. I do believe that is checkmate. Damn me! The Englishman said, So it is. The French major stowed away his chess set. His pawns were musket balls, half lime washed and half left plain. The court pieces were carved from wood, and the board was a square of painted canvas that he wrapped carefully about the chessman. It seems our lives have been spared this day, he said, glancing up at the sun that was already past the meridian. Maybe we shall fight tomorrow instead. Up on the ridge, the British watched as French troops marched south. It was clear that Massena would now be trying to turn the British right flank, and so Wellington ordered the 7th Division to deploy southwards and thus reinforce a strong force of Spanish partisans who were blocking the roads the French needed to advance artillery as part of their flanking manoeuvre. Wellington's army was now in two parts. The largest on the plateau behind Fuentes de Oñoro was blocking the approach to Almeida while the smaller part was two and a half miles south, astride the road along which the British would need to retreat if they were defeated. Massena put a telescope to his one eye to watch as the small British division moved south. He kept expecting the division to stop before it left the protective artillery range of the plateau, but the troops kept marching and marching. He's made the bollocks of it, he told an aide as the 7th Division finally marched way beyond the range of the strong British artillery. Massena collapsed the telescope. Monsieur Wellington has made a bollocks of it, he said. Andre Massena had begun his military career as a private in the ranks of Louis the Sixteenth's army, and now he was a marshal of France, the Duke of Rivoli, and the Prince of Essling. Men called him Your Majesty. Yet once he'd been a half starved wharf rat in the small town of Nice. He'd also once possessed two eyes, but the Emperor had shot one of the eyeballs away in a hunting accident. Napoleon would never acknowledge the responsibility, but nor would Marshal Massena ever dream of blaming his beloved Emperor for the eyes lost. For he owed both his royal status and his high military rank to Napoleon, who had recognised the wharf rat's skills as a soldier. Those skills had made André Massena famous inside the Empire and feared outside. He'd trampled through Italy, winning victory after victory. He'd smashed the Russians on the borders of Switzerland and rammed bloody defeat down Austrian throats before Marengo. Marshal André Massena, Duke of Rivoli and Prince of Essling, was not a pretty soldier, 
but by God he knew how to fight. Which was why, at fifty-two years old, he had been sent to retrieve the disasters besetting the Emperor's armies in Spain and Portugal. Now the wharf rat turned prince watched in disbelief as the gap between the two parts of the British army opened still wider. For a few seconds he even toyed with the idea that perhaps the four or five thousand red-coated infantrymen marching southwards were the Irish regiments that Major Duco had promised would mutiny before the battle. But Massenia had never put much hope in Duco's stratagem, and the fact that these nine battalions were flying their flags as they marched suggested that they were hardly in revolt. Instead, miraculously, it seemed that the British were offering them up as a sacrifice by isolating them out in the southern plain, where they'd be far from any help. Massenia watched as the enemy regiments finally stopped just short of a village far to the south. According to his map, the village was called Navi di Aver, and it lay nearly five miles from Fuentes de Onoro. Is Wellington tricking us? Massenia asked an aide. The aide was just as incredulous as his master. Perhaps he believes he can beat us without keeping to the rules, he suggested. Then in the morning we will teach him about the rules of war. I expected better of this Englishman. Tomorrow night, Jean, we shall have his horse as our own. Does Wellington have horse? I don't know, Your Majesty. Then find out, and make sure I get the pick of the bunch before some filthy grenadier gives her the clap. You hear me? Yes, Your Majesty, the aide said. His master's passion for women was as tiresome as his appetite for victory was inspiring, and tomorrow, it seemed, both hungers would be satisfied. By mid-afternoon, it was plain that the French were not coming that day. The pickets were doubled, and every battalion kept at least three companies under arms, but the other companies were released to more usual duties. Cattle were herded onto the plateau and slaughtered for the evening meal. Bread was fetched from Fila Formoso, and the rum ration distributed. Captain Donoghue sought and received Tarrant's permission to take a score of men to attend Lord Keeley's burial, which was taking place four miles behind Fuentes de Onoro. Hogan also insisted that Sharp attend, and Harper wanted to come as well. Sharp felt awkward in Hogan's company, especially as the Irishman seemed blithely unaware of Sharp's bitterness over the court of inquiry. I invited Ronciman, Hogan told Sharp as they walked along the dusty road west from Fida Famoso. But he didn't really want to come, poor fellow. In a bad way, is he? Sharp asked. Heartbroken, Hogan said callously. Keeps claiming that nothing was his fault. He doesn't seem to grasp that isn't the point. It isn't, is it? The point is that you prefer to keep bloody Valverde happy. Hogan shook his head. I'd prefer to bury Valverde, and preferably alive, but what I really want is for Wellington to be generalissimo. And you'll sacrifice me for that. Of course. Every soldier knows you must lose some valuable men if you want to win a great prize. Besides, what does it matter if you do lose your commission? You'll just go off and join Teresa and become a famous partisan. El Fusilero. Hogan smiled cheerfully, then turned to Harper. Sergeant, would you do me a great service and give me a moment's privacy with Captain Sharp? Harper obligingly walked on ahead, where he tried to overhear the conversation between the two officers. But Hogan kept his voice low, and Sharp's exclamations of surprise offered Harper no clue. Nor did he have any chance to question Sharp before the three British officers turned a corner to see Lord Keeley's servants and Captain Donoghue's twenty men standing awkwardly beside a grave that had been recently dug in an orchard next to a graveyard. Father Sarsfield had paid the village gravediggers to dig the hole just feet away from consecrated ground, for though the laws of the church insisted that Lord Keeley's sins must keep him from burial in holy ground, Sarsfield would nevertheless place the body as near as he could to consecrated soil so that on Judgment Day the exiled Irishman's soul would not be utterly bereft of Christian company. The body had been stitched into a dirty white canvas shroud. Four men of the Real Compagnia Landesa lowered the corpse into the deep grave. Then Hogan, Sharp and Harper took off their hats as Father Sarsfield said the prayers in Latin and afterwards spoke in English to the twenty guardsmen. Lord Keeley, the priest said, had suffered from the sin of pride and that pride had not let him endure disappointment. Yet all Irishmen, Sarsfield said, must learn to live with disappointment, for it was given to their heritage as surely as the sparks flew upwards. Yet, he went on, the proper response to disappointment was not to abandon hope and reject God's gift of life, but to keep the hope glowing bright. 
We have no homes, you and I, he said to the somber guardsman. But one day we shall all inherit our earthly home. And if it is not given to us, then it'll come to our children or to our children's children. The priest fell silent and stared down into the grave. Nor must you worry that his lordship committed suicide, he finally continued. Suicide is a sin, but sometimes life is so unbearable that we must risk the sin rather than face the horror. Wolf Tone made that choice thirteen years ago. The mention of the Irish patriot rebel made one or two of the guardsmen glance at Sharp. Then they looked back to the priest, who went on in his gentle, persuasive voice to tell how Wolf Tone had been held captive in a British dungeon, and how, rather than face the enemy's gallows, he'd slit his own throat with a penknife. Lord Keeley's motives might not have been so pure as Tone's, Sarsfield said. But we don't know what sadness drove him to his sin, and in our ignorance we must therefore pray for his soul and forgive him. There were tears in the priest's eyes as he took a small phial of holy water from the haversack at his side and sprinkled its drops on the lonely grave. He offered the benediction in Latin, then stepped back as the guardsmen raised their muskets to fire a ragged volley over the open grave. Birds panicked up from the orchard's trees, then circled and flew back as the smoke dissipated among the branches. Hogan took charge as soon as the volley had been fired. He insisted that there was still some danger of a French attack at dusk, and that the soldiers should all return to the ridge. I'll follow soon, he told Sharp. Then he ordered Keeley's servants back to his lordship's quarters. The soldiers and servants left, the sound of their boots fading in the late afternoon air. It was sultry in the orchard where the two gravediggers waited patiently for the signal to fill up the grave, beside which Hogan now stood, hat in hand, staring down at the shrouded corpse. For a long time, he said to Father Sarsfield, I've carried a pillbox with some Irish earth inside so that if I should die I would rest with a little bit of Ireland all through eternity. I seem to mislaid it, Father, which is a pity for I'd have liked to sprinkle a wee bit of Ireland soil onto Lord Keeley's grave. A generous thought, Major, Sarsfield said. Hogan stared down at Keeley's shroud. The poor man. I hear he was hoping to marry the Lady Juanita. They spoke of it, Sarsfield said dryly, his tone implying his disapproval of the match. The Lady is doubtless in mourning, Hogan said, then put his hat back on. Or maybe she's not mourning at all. You've heard that she's gone back to the French. Captain Sharp let her go. He's a fool for women, that man. But the Lady Juanita can easily make a fool of men. She did a poor Keely here, did she not? Hogan paused as a sneeze gathered and exploded. Bless me, he said, wiping his nose and eyes with a vast red handkerchief. Ah, what a terrible woman she was, he went on, saying she was going to marry Keely, and all the while she was committing adultery and fornication with Brigadier Guy Lou. Is fornication a mere venial sin these days? Fornication, Major, is a mortal sin, Sarsfield smiled, as I suspect you know only too well. Try not to heaven for revenge, is it? Hogan returned the smile, then looked back to the grave. Bees hummed in the orchard blossoms above Hogan's head. But what about fornicating with the enemy, Father? he asked. Isn't that a worse sin? Sarsfield took the scapula from around his neck, kissed it, then carefully folded the strip of cloth. Why are you so worried for the Doña Juanita's soul, Major? he asked. Hogan still looked down at the dead man's coarse shroud. I'd rather worry about his poor soul. Do you think it was discovering that his lady was humping a frog that killed him? Sarsfield flinched at Hogan's crudity. If he did discover that, Major, then it could hardly have added to his happiness— but he was not a man who knew much happiness, and he rejected the hand of the church. And what could the church have done? Change the whore's nature? Hogan asked. And don't tell me that Doña Juanita de Elia is not a spy, father, for I know she is, and you know the self-same thing. I do? Sarsfield frowned in puzzlement. You do, father, you do, and God forgive you for it. Juanita is a whore and a spy, and a better whore, I think, than she is a spy. But she was the only person available for you, isn't that so? Doubtless you'd have preferred someone less less flamboyant. 
But what choice did you have? Or was it Major Duco who made the choice? But it was a bad choice, a very bad choice. Juanita failed you, father. We found her when she was trying to bring you a whole lot of D's. Hogan reached into his tail pocket and produced one of the counterfeit newspapers that Sharp had discovered in San Cristobal. They were wrapped in sheets of sacred music, father, and I thought to myself, why should they do that? Why church music? Why not other newspapers? But of course, if she was stopped and given a cursory search, then who would think it odd that she was carrying a pile of psalms to a man of God? Sarsfield glanced at the newspaper, but did not take it. I think maybe, he said carefully, that grief has deranged your mind. Hogan laughed. Grief? For Keeley? Hardly, father. What might have deranged me is all the work I've been having to do in these last few days. I've been reading my correspondence, father, and it comes from all sorts of strange places. Some from Madrid, some from Paris, some even from London. Would you like to hear what I've learned? Father Sarsfield was fidgeting with the scapula, folding and refolding the embroidered strip of cloth. If you insist, he said guardedly. Hogan smiled. Oh, I do, father. For I've been thinking about this fellow, Duco, and how clever everyone says he is. But what really worries me is that he's put another clever fellow behind our lines. And I've been hurting my mind wondering just who that new clever fellow might be. And I was also wondering, you see, just why it was that the first newspapers to arrive in the Irish regiments were supposed to be from Philadelphia. Very odd choice, that. Am I losing you? Go on, Sarsfield said. The scapula had come loose and he was meticulously folding it again. I've never been to Philadelphia, Hogan said. No, I hear it's a fine city. Would you like a pinch of snuff, father? Sarsfield did not answer. He just watched Hogan and went on, folding the cloth. Why Philadelphia? Hogan asked. Then I remembered. Actually, I didn't remember at all. A man in London sent me a reminder. They remembered these things in London. They have more written down than a great big book. And one of the things written in that great big book is that it was in Philadelphia that Wolf Tone got his letter of introduction to the French government. And it was there, too, that he met a passionate priest called Father Mallon. Amalam was more of a soldier than a priest, and he was doing his best to raise a regiment of volunteers to fight the British, but he wasn't having a whole lot of success. So he'd thrown his lot with Tone instead. Tone was a Protestant, wasn't he? And he never did have much fondness for priests, but he liked Malam well enough because Malam was an Irish patriot before he was a priest. And I think Malam became Tone's friend as well, for he stayed with Tone every step of the way after that first meeting in Philadelphia. He went to Paris with Tone, raised the volunteers with Tone, then sailed to Ireland with Tone, sailed all the way into Loch Swilly. And that was in 1798, Father, in case you'd forgotten. And no one has seen Mullen from that day to this. Poor Tone was captured and the redcoats were all over Ireland looking for Father Mullen, but there's not been a sight nor smell of the man. Are you sure you won't have a pinch of snuff? It's Irish blackguard, and hard to come by. I would rather have a cigar, if you have one, Sarsfield said calmly. I don't, Father, but you should try to snuff one day. It's a grand specific against the fever, or so my mother always said. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, with poor Father Mallon on the run from the British. It's my belief he got back to France, and I think from there he was sent to Spain. The French couldn't use him against the English, at least not until the English had forgotten the events of 98. But Mallon must have been useful in Spain. I suspect he met the old Lady Keeley in Madrid. I hear she was a fierce old witch, lived for the church and for Ireland, even though she saw too much of the one and had never seen the other. Do you think Mallon used her patronage as he spied on the Spanish for Bonaparte? I suspect so. But then the French took over the Spanish throne and someone must have been wondering where Father Malin could be more usefully employed. And I suspect Father Malin pleaded with his French masters to be employed against the real enemy. After all, who among the British would remember Father Malin from 98? His hair'll be white by now. He'll be a changed man. Maybe he's put on weight like me. Hogan patted his belly and smiled. Father Sarsfield frowned at the scapula. 
He seemed surprised that he was still holding the vestment, and so he carefully stowed it in a haversack slung from his shoulder, then just as carefully brought out a small pistol. Father Mallon might be a changed man, he said as he opened the frizzen to check that the gun was primed. But I'd like to think that if he was still alive, he'd be a patriot. I imagine he is, Hogan said, apparently unworried by the pistol. A man like Mallon? Oh, his loyalty won't change as much as his hair and belly. Sarsfield frowned at Hogan. And you're not a patriot, Major? I like to think so. Yet you fight for Britain? Hogan shrugged. The priest's pistol was loaded and primed, but for the moment it hung loose in Sarsfield's hand. Hogan had played a game with the priest, a game he'd expected to win, but this proof of his victory was not giving the Major any pleasure. Indeed, as the realisation of his triumph sank in, Hogan's mood became ever bleaker. I worry about allegiance, Hogan said. I surely do. I lie awake sometimes and wonder whether I'm right in thinking that what's best for Ireland is to be a part of Britain. But I do know one thing, Father, which is that I don't want to be ruled by Bonaparte. I think maybe I'm not so brave a man as Wolf Tone, but nor did I ever agree with his ideas. You do, Father! and I salute you for it. But that isn't why you're going to have to die. The reason you're going to have to die, Father, is not because you fight for Ireland, but because you fight for Napoleon. The distinction is fatal. Sarsfield smiled. I shall have to die, he asked in wry amusement. He cocked the pistol, then raised it towards Hogan's head. The sound of the shot pounded across the orchard, the two gravediggers jumped in terror as smoke drifted out from the hedge where the killer had been concealed just twenty paces from where Hogan and Sarsfield had been standing. The priest was now lying on the mound of excavated soil where his body jerked twice and then with a sigh lay still. Sharp stood up from behind the hedge and crossed to the grave to see that his bullet had gone plumb where he'd aimed it, straight through the dead man's heart. He stared down at the priest, noting how dark the blood looked on the soutane's cloth. A fly had already settled there. I liked him, he told Hogan. It's allowed, Richard, Hogan said. The Major was upset and pale, so pale that for a moment he looked as if he might be sick. One of mankind's higher authorities enjoins us to love our enemies, and he said nothing about them ceasing to be our enemies just because we love them. Nor could I recall any specific injunction in Holy Scripture against shooting our enemies through the heart. Hogan paused, and suddenly all his usual flippancy seemed to drain out of him. I liked him too, he said simply. But he was going to shoot you, Sharp said. Hogan, talking privately with Sharp on their way to the burial, had warned the rifleman what might happen, and Sharp, disbelieving the prediction, had nevertheless watched it happen and then done his part. He deserved a better death, Hogan said. Then he pushed the corpse with his foot and thus toppled it into the grave. The priest's body landed awkwardly, so that it seemed as if he was sitting on the shrouded head of Keeley's corpse. Hogan tossed the counterfeit newspaper after the body, then took a small round box from his pocket. Hilton Sarsfield doesn't fetch any favours, Richard, Hogan said sternly as he prized the lid off the box. Let's just say I now forgive you for letting Juanita go. That damage has been contained but you still might need to be sacrificed for the happiness of Spain. Yes, sir, Sharp said resentfully. Hogan caught the resentment in the rifleman's voice. Of course life isn't fair, Richard, ask him. He nodded down at the dead, white-haired priest, then sprinkled the contents of his small box onto the corpse's faded and bloodied soutane. What's that? Sharp asked. Just soil, Richard, just soil, nothing important. Hogan tossed the empty pillbox onto the two bodies, then summoned the gravediggers. He was a Frenchman, he told them in Portuguese, certain that such an explanation would make them sympathise with the murder they'd just witnessed. He gave each man a coin, then watched as the double grave was filled with earth. Hogan walked back with Sharp towards Fuentes de Onoro. Where's Patrick? the Major asked. I told him to wait in Villa Famoso. At an end? Aye, the one where I first met Runciman. Good. I need to get drunk, Richard. 
Hogan looked bleak, almost as if he might weep. One less witness of your confession in San Isidro, Richard, he said. That's not why I did it, Major, Sharp protested. You did nothing, Richard. Absolutely nothing. Hogan spoke fiercely. What happened in that orchard never happened. You saw nothing, heard nothing, did nothing. Father Sarsfield is alive, God knows where, and his disappearance will become a mystery that'll never be explained. Or perhaps the truth is, Father Sarsfield never even existed, Richard, in which case you can't possibly have killed him, can you? To say no more about it, not a word. He sniffed, then looked ahead at the blue evening sky, which was unbruised by any gun smoke. The French have given us a day of peace, Richard, that we shall celebrate by getting bloody drunk. And tomorrow, God help us sinners both, we'll bloody fight. The sun sank behind layers of western cloud, so that the sky seemed shot with glory. For a time the shadows of the British guns reached monstrously across the plain as they stretched towards the oaks and the French army, and it was then, in the dying minutes of the full light, that Sharp rested his telescope on the chill barrel of a nine-pounder gun and trained the glass across the low-lying land until he could see the enemy soldiers around their cooking fires. It wasn't the first time that day he'd searched the enemy lines through the glass. All morning he'd wandered restlessly between the ammunition park and the gun line, where he'd stared fixedly at the enemy. And now, back from Villa Formoso with a sour belly and a head thick with too much wine, he looked once again into Marsena's lines. "'You won't come now,' a gunner lieutenant said, thinking that the rifle captain feared a dusk assault. "'Froggies don't like fighting at night.' "'No,' Sharp agreed. "'They won't come now.' but he kept his eye to the telescope as he inched it along the shadowed lines of trees and fires and men. And then, suddenly, he checked the glass. He had seen the grey uniforms. Lou was here after all, and his brigade was a part of Massenia's army, which had spent the whole day preparing for the attack that would surely come with the returning sun. Sharp watched his enemy, then straightened from the gun barrel and closed the glass. His head spun with the effects of the wine. But he was not so drunk that he didn't feel a shudder of fear as he thought of what would come across those cannon-scarred fields when the sun neck shone on Spain. Tomorrow. Chapter 9 The horsemen came out of the mist like creatures from nightmare. The Frenchmen rode big horses that galloped through the marshland to explode water with every stride. Then the leading squadrons reached the higher ground about the village of Navi de Aver, where the Spanish partisans had bivouacked, and the sound of the French cavalry's hooves turned into a thunder that shook the earth itself. A trumpet urged the horsemen on. It was dawn, and the sun was a silver disc low in the fog bank that veiled the eastern fields from which death was erupting. The Spanish sentinels fired one hasty volley, then retreated before the overwhelming enemy numbers. Some of the partisans were asleep, after standing guard through the night, and they woke only to stumble out from their requisitioned houses and be cut down with slashing blades and dipping lance heads. The partisan brigade had been placed in Navi de Aver to watch the Allies' southern flank, and no one had expected them to face a full French attack. But now the heavy cavalry was streaming in through the alleys and crashing their big horses through the gardens and orchards beside the huddle of houses that lay so far to the south of Fuentes de Onoro. The partisan commander shouted at his men to withdraw, but the French were slashing at defenders as they frantically tried to reach their frightened horses. Some men refused to retreat, but ran at the enemy with all the passionate hatred of the guerrillero. Blood spilt on the streets and splashed on the house walls. One street was blocked when a Spaniard shot a dragoon's horse and the beast fell thrashing to the cobbles. The Spaniard bayoneted the rider, then was hurled backwards as a second horse, unable to stop its charge, tripped and stumbled over the bleeding corpses. A knot of Spaniards fell on the second horse and its rider, knives and swords hacked down. Then more partisans scrambled over the dying bloody beasts to fire a volley at the milling riders trapped by the carnage. More Frenchmen fell from their saddles. Then a troop of lancers entered the street behind the Spanish defenders, and the lance heads dropped to the level of a man's waist as the horses were spurred forward. The Spaniards, trapped between dragoons and lancers, tried to fight back, but now it was the turn of the French to be the killers. A few partisans escaped through the houses, 
but only to find the streets beyond the back doors were also filled with blood-crazed horsemen in glittering uniforms being urged to the slaughter by the frantic, joyous notes of the trumpeters. Most of Navi de Aver's Spanish defenders fled into the mists west of the village, where they were pursued by cuirassiers in high black-plumed helmets and shining steel breastplates. The big swords hacked down like meat axes. One such blow could cripple a horse or crush a man's skull. To the north and south of the cuirassier, troops of lightly mounted chasseurs à cheval raced like steeplechases to cut off the Spaniards. They whooped hunting calls. The chasseurs carried light, curved sabres that slashed wicked wounds across their enemies' heads and shoulders. Unhorsed Spaniards reeled in agony across the meadows and were ridden down by horsemen practising their sword cuts or lance thrusts. Dismounted dragoons hunted through the houses and cattle sheds of Navi de Aver, finding the survivors one by one and shooting them with carbines or pistols. One group of Spaniards took refuge in the church, but the copper-helmeted dragoons forced their way in through the priest's door at the back of the sacristy and fell on the defenders with swords. It was Sunday morning, and the priest had hoped to say a mass for the Spanish troops, but now he died with his congregation as the French ransacked the small blood-soaked church for its plate and candlesticks. A French work party dragged the corpses out of the village's main street so that the advancing artillery could pass through. It took half an hour's work before the guns could crash and rattle between the blood-splashed houses. The first guns were the light and mobile cannon of the horse artillery. Six-pounder guns dragged by horses ridden by gunners resplendent in gold and blue uniforms. Larger cannons were coming behind, but the horse artillery would lead the attack on the next village upstream, where the British 7th Division had taken its position. Infantry columns followed the horse artillery, battalion after battalion marching beneath their gilded eagles. The mist was burning off to show a village smoking with abandoned cooking fires and reeking of blood where the victorious dragoons were remounting their horses to join the pursuit. Some of the infantry tried to march through the village, but staff officers forced them to go around Navi de Aver's southern flank so that none of the battalions would be slowed by plundering. The first aides galloped back to Massenia's headquarters to say that Navi de Aver had fallen and that the village of Velia, less than two miles upstream, was already under artillery fire. A second division of infantry marched to support the men who were already turning the Allies' southern flank and were now marching due north towards the road that led from Fuentes de Onoro to the fords across the river Coa. Opposite Fuentes de Onoro itself, the French main gun batteries opened fire. The cannon had been dragged to the tree line and roughly embrasured with felled trunks to give their crews some protection from the British guns on the ridge. The French fired common shell. Iron balls filled with a fused powder charge that cracked apart in a burst of smoke to shatter the casing on the plateau's skyline. While short-barreled howitzers lobbed shells into the broken streets of Fuentes de Onoro to fill the village with the stench of burned powder and the rattle of exploded iron. During the night, a battery of mixed four- and six-pounder guns had been moved into the gardens and houses on the stream's eastern bank, and those guns opened up with round shot that cracked fiercely on the defenders' walls. The voltigeurs in the gardens fired at British loopholes and cheered whenever a round shot brought down a length of wall or collapsed a broken roof onto a room of crouching redcoats. A shell set light to some collapsed thatch, and the flames crackled up to spread thick smoke across the upper village where riflemen sheltered behind the cemetery's gravestones. French shells drove into the burial ground, overturning headstones and grubbing up the earth around the graves so that it looked as though a herd of monstrous pigs had been truffling the soil to reach the buried dead. The British guns returned a sporadic fire. They were holding the bulk of their ammunition for the moment when the French columns were launched across the plain towards the village, though every now and then a case shot exploded at the tree line to make the French gunners dark and curse. One by one the aim of the French guns was shifted from the ridge onto the burning village, where the spreading smoke gave evidence of the damage being done. Behind the ridge, the Redco battalions listened to the cannonade and prayed they would not be asked to go down into the maelstrom of fire and smoke. Some chaplains raised their voice over the sound of the cannon as they read morning prayer to the waiting battalions. There was a comfort in the old words, though some sergeants barked at the men to mind their damn manners when they tittered at the line in the day's epistle which enjoined the congregation to abstain from fleshly lusts. Then they prayed for the king's majesty, for the royal family, for the clergy, 
and only then did some chaplains add a prayer that God would preserve the lives of his soldiers on this Sabbath day on the border of Spain. Where, three miles south of Fuentes de Onoro, the cuirassiers and chasseurs and lancers and dragoons were met by a force of British dragoons and German hussars. The horsemen clashed in a sudden and bloody melee. The Allied horse were outnumbered, but they were properly formed and fighting against an enemy force strung out by the excitement of the pursuit. The French faltered, then retreated. But on either flank of the Allied squadrons, other French horsemen raced ahead to where two battalions of infantry, one British and one Portuguese, waited behind the walls and hedges of Poco Velha. The British and German cavalry, fearing that they'd be surrounded, hurried out of danger's way, as the excited French horse ignored them and charged at the village's defenders instead. Fire! a Casador colonel shouted, and ragged smoke whiplashed from the garden walls. Horses screamed and fell, while men were plucked backwards from saddles as the musket and rifle balls cracked straight through the cuirassier's steel breastplates. There was a frantic trumpet call, and the charging French horse checked, turned, and rode back to reform, leaving behind a tide line of struggling horses and bleeding men. More French horsemen were arriving to join the attack. Imperial guardsmen mounted on big horses and carrying carbines and swords— while beyond the cavalry, the leading foot artillery unlimbered in the meadows and opened fire to add their heavier missiles to the six-pounder guns of the horse artillery. The first twelve-pounder cannonballs fell short, but the next rounds crashed into Poco Velia's defenders and tore great gaps in their protective walls. The French cavalry had drawn to one side to reform its ranks and to open a path for the infantry, who now appeared behind the guns. The infantry battalions formed themselves into two attack columns that would move like human avalanches at the thin line of Poco Velia's defenders. The French drummer boys tightened their drumskins, while beyond Poco Velia, the remaining seven battalions of the British 7th Division waited for the attack that the drums would inspire. Horse artillery guarded the infantry's flanks, but the French were bringing still more horses and still more guns against the isolated defenders. The British and German cavalry, which had been driven away westwards, now trotted in a wide circle to rejoin the beleaguered 7th Division. French skirmishers ran ahead of the attacking column. They splashed through a streamlet, past the artillery gun line, and ran out to where the dead horses and dying men marked the limit of the cavalry's first attack. There the skirmishers split into their pairs to open fire. British and Portuguese skirmishers met them and the crackle of muskets and rifles carried across the marshy fields to where Wellington stared anxiously southwards. Beneath him, the village of Fuentes de Onoro was a smoking shambles, being pounded by a continuous cannonade. But his gaze was always to the south, where he had sent his 7th Division beyond the protective range of the British cannon on the plateau. Wellington had made a mistake, and he knew it. His army was split in two, and the enemy was threatening to overwhelm the smaller of the two parts. Gallopers brought him news of a broken Spanish force, then of ever-mounting numbers of French infantry crossing the stream at Nave de Aver to join the attack on the 7th Division's nine battalions. At least two French divisions had gone south for that attack, and each of those divisions was stronger than the newly formed and still under-strength 7th Division, which was not only under attack by infantry, but also seemed assailed by every French horseman in Spain. French infantry officers urged the columns forward, and the drummers responded by beating the pas de charge with a frantic energy. The French attack had rolled over Navi de Aver and brushed aside the Allied cavalry, and now it had to keep up the momentum if it was to annihilate Wellington's right wing. Then the victorious attack could lance at the rear of Wellington's main force, while the rest of the French army hammered through his battered defences at Fuentes de Onoro. The Voltigeur pushed back the outnumbered Allied skirmishers who ran back to join a main defence line being shredded and torn by French canister. Wounded men crawled back into Poco Velia's small streets where they tried to find a patch of shelter from the terrible storm of canister. French cavalrymen were waiting on the village's flanks, waiting with blade and lance to pounce on the broken fugitives who must soon stream back from the column's attack. Vive l'Empereur! The attackers shouted. The mist had gone now replaced by a clear sunlight that flickered off thousands of French bayonets. The sun was shining into the defenders' eyes, a great blinding blaze out of which loomed the huge dark shapes of the French columns, trampling the fields to the sounds of drums and cheering and the thunder of marching feet. The voltigeur began firing at the main British and Portuguese line. 
The sergeant shouted at the files to close up, then looked nervously at the enemy cavalry waiting to charge from the flanks. The British and Portuguese battalions shrank towards their centres as the dead and wounded left the files. Fire! the British colonel ordered, and his men began the rolling volleys that rippled smoke up and down the line as the companies fired in turn. The Portuguese battalion took up the volleys so that the whole eastern face of the village flashed flame. Men in the leading ranks of the French columns went down, and the columns divided so that the files could walk round the wounded and dead. Then the ranks closed up again as the cheering Frenchmen came stolidly on. The Portuguese and British volleys became ragged as the officers let men fire as soon as they were loaded. Smoke rolled thick to hide the village. A French galloper gun unlimbered on the village's northern flank and slashed a round shot into the Casadores' ranks. The drummers paused in the pas de charge, and the columns let out their great war cry. Vive l'Empereur! And then the drums began again beating even faster as the columns crashed through the fragile vegetable gardens on the outskirts of the village. Another round shot seared in from the north, slathering a gable end with blood. Withdraw! Withdraw! The two battalions had no hope of holding the village, and so, almost overrun by the enemy, the redcoats and Portuguese ran back through the village. It was a poor place, with a tiny church no bigger than a dissenting chapel. The grenadier companies of both battalions formed ranks beside the church. Ramrods scraped in barrels. The French were in the village now, their columns breaking apart as the infantry found their own paths through the alleyways and gardens. The cavalry was closing on the village's flanks, looking for broken ranks to charge and decimate. The leading French attackers came into sight of the church, and a Portuguese officer gave the order to fire, and the two companies hurled a volley that choked the narrow street with dead and wounded Frenchmen. Back! Back! the Portuguese officer shouted. Watch your flanks! A round shot splintered part of the church roof, showering the retreating grenadiers with shards of broken tile. French infantry appeared in an alleyway and spilt out to make a crude firing line that brought down two casadores and a redcoat. Most of the two battalions were clear of the village now, and retreating towards the other seven battalions that were formed in square to deter the circling French cavalry. That cavalry feared it would be cheated of its prey, and some of the horsemen charged Pocovelia's withdrawing garrison. Rally, rally! A redcoat officer called as he saw a squadron of cuirassiers wheel around to charge at his men. His company shrank into the rally square, a huddle of men forming an obstacle large enough to deter a horse from charging home. Hold your fire! Let the buggers get close! Leave him be! A sergeant shouted when a man ran out of the rally square to help a wounded comrade. Hive! Hive! Another captain shouted, and his men rallied into a hasty square. Fire! Maybe a third of his men were loaded, and they loosed a ragged volley that made one horse scream and rear. The rider fell, crashing heavily to earth, with all the weight of his breastplate and back armor dragging him down. Another horseman rode clear through the musket balls and galloped wildly along the face of the crude square. A redcoat darted out to lunge at the Frenchman with his bayonet, but the rider leant far from his saddle and screamed in triumph as he whipped his sword across the infantryman's face. "'You bloody fool, Smithers, you bloody fool!' his captain shouted at the blinded redcoat, who was screaming and clutching a face that was a mask of blood. "'Back, back!' the Portuguese colonel urged his men. The French infantry had advanced through the village and was forming an attack column at its northern edge. A British galloper gun fired at them, and the round shot skipped on the ground and bounced up to crack into the village houses. Vive l'Empereur! A French colonel bellowed, and the drummer boys began to sound the dreaded pas de charge that would drive the Emperor's infantry onwards. The two Allied battalions were streaming in clumps across the fields, pursued by the advancing infantry and harried by horsemen. One small group was ridden down by lances. Another panicked and ran towards the waiting squares, only to be hunted down by dragoons who held their swords like lances to spear into the redcoats' backs. The two largest masses of horsemen were those that stalked the colour parties, waiting for the first sign of panic that would open the clustered infantrymen to a thunderous charge. The flags of the two battalions were lures to glory, trophies that would make their captors famous throughout France. Both sets of flags were surrounded by bayonets and defended by sergeants carrying spontoons, the long, heavy, lance-headed pikes designed to kill any horse or man daring to thrust in to capture the fringed silk trophies. Rally! Rally! the English colonel shouted at his men. Steady, boys, steady! 
and his men doggedly worked their way westwards while the cavalry feinted charges that might provoke a volley. Once the volley was fired, the real charge would be led by lancers who could reach across the infantry's bayonets and unloaded muskets to kill the outer ranks of defenders. All your fire, boys! All your fire! the colonel called. His men passed close to one of the outcrops of rock that studded the plain, and for a few seconds the redcoats seemed to cling to the tiny scrap of high ground, as though the lichen-covered stone would offer them a safe refuge. Then the officers and sergeants moved them on to the next stretch of open grassland. Such open land was heaven-sent for horsemen, a cavalryman's perfect killing ground. Dragoons had unholstered their carbines to snipe at the colour parties. Other horsemen fired pistols. Bloody trails followed the redcoats and casadores as they marched. The hurrying French infantry were shouting at their own horsemen to clear a line of fire so that a musket volley could tear the defiant colour parties apart. But the horsemen would not yield the glory of capturing an enemy standard to any foot soldier, and so they circled the flags and blocked the infantry fire that might have overwhelmed the retreating Allied infantrymen. Marksmen among the British and Portuguese picked their targets, fired, then reloaded as they walked. The two battalions had lost all order. There were no more ranks or files, just clusters of desperate men who knew that salvation lay in staying close together as they edged their way back towards the dubious safety of the 7th Division's remaining battalions, who still waited in square and watched aghast as the boiling maelstrom of cavalry and cannon smoke inched ever nearer. Fire! A voice shouted from one of these battalions, and the face of a square erupted with smoke to shatter an excited troop of sabre-wielding chasseurs. The retreating infantry had come close to the other battalions now, and the horsemen saw their first chance of fame slipping away. Some cuirassiers wound their swords' wrist straps tight, called encouragement to one another, and then spurred their big horses into the gallop as a trumpeter sounded the charge. They rode booted knee to booted knee, a phalanx of steel and horseflesh designed to batter the nearest colours' defenders into broken shreds that could be slaughtered like cattle. This was a lottery. Fifty horsemen against two hundred frightened men, and if the horsemen broke the rally square, then one of the surviving cuirassiers would ride back to Marshal Massena with a king's flag, and another would carry the bullet-scarred remnants of the 85th's yellow colour, and both would be famous. Front rank, Neil! the 85th's colonel shouted. Day came! Wait for it! the captain called. Damn your eagerness! Wait! The redcoats were from Buckinghamshire. Some had been recruited from the farms of the Chilterns and from the villages of Aylesbury's Vale, while most had come from the noisome slums and pestilent prisons of London which sprawled on the county's southern edge. Now their mouths were dry from the salt gunpowder of the cartridges they'd bitten all morning and their battle had shrunk to a terrifying patch of foreign land that was surrounded by a victorious, rampaging, screaming enemy. For all the men of the 85th knew, they might have been the last British troops alive, and now they faced the Emperor's horse as it charged at them with plumed men holding heavy swords, and behind the cuirassier, a tangled mass of lancers, dragoons and chasseurs followed to snap up the broken remnants of the colour party's rally square. A Frenchman screamed a war cry as he rammed his spurs hard back along his horse's flanks, and, just as it seemed that the redcoats had left their one volley too late, their colonel called the word. Fire! Horses tumbled in bloody agony. A horse and cavalryman struck by a volley kept moving forward, turned in an instant from war's gaudiest killers into so much overdressed meat. But the meat could still smash a square's face apart by its sheer dead weight. The leading rank of the cavalry charge fell to smear its dying blood along the grass. Horsemen screamed as they were crushed by their own rolling horses. The riders coming behind could not avoid the carnage in front, and the second rank rode hard into the flailing remnants of the first, and the horses shrieked as their legs broke and as they tumbled down to slide to a halt just yards from the redcoats' lingering gun smoke. The rest of the charge was blocked by the horror before them and so it split into two streams of horsemen that galloped ineffectually down the sides of the rally square. Redcoats fired as the cavalry passed, and then the charge was gone, and the colonel was telling his men to move on westwards. Steady, boys, steady, he called. A man ran out and cut a horsehair-plumed helmet from the corpse of a Frenchman, then ran back into the rally square. Another volley came from the battalions waiting in square, and suddenly the battered, harried fugitives of Poco Velia's defenders were back amidst the rest of the 7th Division. They formed in the division's centre, just where a wide road led south and west between deep ditches. 
It was the road that went to the safe fords across the Coa. The road which went home. The road to security. But all that was left to guard it were the nine squares of infantry, a battery of light guns, and the cavalry who had survived the fight south of Pocovelia. The two battalions from Pocovelia formed small squares. They had suffered in the village's streets and on the spring grass of the meadows outside the village, yet their colours still flew. Four bright flags amidst a division flying eighteen such flags, while around them circled the Empire's cavalry, and to their north there marched two whole divisions of the Empire's foot soldiers. The two beleaguered battalions had reached safety, but it looked as though it would be short-lived, for they had survived only to join a division that was surely doomed. Sixteen thousand Frenchmen now threatened four and a half thousand Portuguese and Britons. The French horsemen wheeled away from the musket fire to reform ranks made ragged by the morning's charge. The French infantry stopped to form for their new attack, while from the east, from across the stream, there came new French artillery fire that aimed to batter the nine waiting squares into carnage. It was two hours after dawn, and in the meadows south of Fuentes de Onoro, and far from any help, an army seemed to be dying, while the French marched on. He has a choice, Marshal Massena remarked to Major Duco. The Marshal didn't really want to be talking to a mere Major on this morning of his triumph, but Duco was a prickly fellow who had an inexplicable sway with the Emperor. And so Andre Massena, Marshal of France, Duke of Rivoli, and Prince of Essling, found time after breakfast to make certain Duco understood the day's opportunities and, more important, to whom this day's laurels would belong. Juco had ridden out of Ciudad Rodrigo to witness the battle. Officially, Massenu's attack was merely an effort to move supplies into Almeida, but every Frenchman knew the stakes were much higher than the relief of one small garrison stranded behind the British lines. The real prize was the opportunity to cut Wellington off from his base, and then destroy his army in one glorious day of bloodletting. Such a victory would end British defiance in Spain and Portugal forever, and would bring in its wake a roll call of new titles for the wharf rat who joined the French royal army as a private. Maybe Massena would earn a throne. The emperor had redistributed half the chairs in Europe by making his brothers into kings, so why should not Marshal Massena, Prince of Estling, become the king of somewhere or other? The throne in Lisbon needed a pair of buttocks to keep it warm, and Massena reckoned his bum was as good for the task as any of Napoleon's brothers and all that was needed for that glorious vision to come true was victory here at Fuentes de Onoro, and that victory was now very close. The battle had opened as Massena had intended, and now it would close as he intended. You are saying, Your Majesty, that Wellington has a choice? Duco prompted the marshal, who drifted into a momentary daydream. He has a choice, Massena confirmed. He can abandon his right wing, which means he also abandons any chance of retreat. In which case we shall break his sentence for Antis Yonoro and hunt his army down in the hills for the next week. Or he can abandon Fuentes Yonoro and try to rescue his right wing, in which case we shall fight him to the death on the plain. I'd rather he offered me a fight on the plain, but he won't. This Englishman only feels safe when he has a hill to defend, so he'll stay in Fuentes Yonoro and let his right wing go to a hell of our making. Duco was impressed. It had been a long time since he'd heard a French officer sound so optimistic in Spain, and a long time, too, since the eagles had marched into battle with such confidence and alacrity. Massena deserved applause, and Duco happily offered the marshal the compliments he desired. But he also added a caution. This Englishman, Your Majesty, he pointed out, is also skilled at defending hills. He defended Fuentes Yonoro on Friday, did he not? Massena sneered at the caution. Duco had elaborated such devious schemes to undermine British morale, but they only sprang from his lack of faith in soldiers, just as Duco's presence in Spain sprang from the Emperor's lack of faith in his marshals. Duco had to learn that when a marshal of France put his mind to victory, then victory was certain. On Friday, Duco, Massena explained, I tickle Fuentes de Onoro with a pair of brigades, but today we shall send three whole divisions into that little village. Three big divisions to call full of angry men. What chance do you think that little village has? Duco considered the question in his usual pedantic way. He could see Fuentes de Onoro clearly enough. The village was a meagre sprawl of peasants' hovels being pounded to dust by the French artillery. Beyond the dust and smoke, 
Duco could see the graveyard and battered church where the road angled uphill to the plateau. The hill was steep, to be sure, but not very high, and on Friday the attackers had cleared the village of its defenders and gained a lodgment among the lower stones of the graveyard, and one more attack would surely have driven the eagles clear across the ridge's crest and into the soft belly of the enemy beyond. And now, out of sight of that enemy, three whole divisions of French infantry were waiting to attack. And in the van of that attack, Massenia planned to put the elite of his attacking regiments, the mass companies of grenadiers with their plumed bearskins and fearful reputation. The cream of France would march against a raddled army of half-broken men. Well, Ducot, Massenia challenged the major for his verdict. I must congratulate your majesty, Ducot said. Which means, I suppose, that you approve of my humble plan? Massenia asked sarcastically. All France will approve, your majesty, when it brings victory. Bugger the victory, Massenia said, so long as it brings me Wellington's whores. I'm tired of my present bunch. Half of them are pox, the other half are pregnant, and the fat one bolts her eyes out every time you strip the bitch for duty. Wellington has no whores, Duco said icily. He controls his passions. The one-eyed Massenia burst into laughter. Controls his passions? God on his cross, you go, but you'd make smiling a crime. Controls his passions, does he? Then he's a fool, and a defeated fool at that. The marshal wheeled his horse away from the major and snapped his fingers at a nearby aide. Let the eagles go, Jean, let them go. The drums called for the muster, and three divisions stirred themselves for action. Men drained coffee dregs, stowed knives and tin plates in haversacks, checked their cartridge pouches and plucked their muskets from the pyramid stacks. It was two hours after a Sunday dawn, and time to close the battle's jaws, as all along the marshal's line, from south in the plain to north where the village smoked under its numbing cannonade, the French smelt victory. Upon my soul, Sarper, is unfair. Unfair. You and me both to stand trial. Colonel Runciman had been unable to resist the lure of witnessing the day's high drama, and so he'd come to the plateau, though he'd taken care not to step too close to the ridge's crest, which was occasionally churned by a high French round shot. A pile of smoke marked where the village endured its bombardment, while further south, way down on the plain, a second smudge of musket smoke betrayed by the French flank attack was driving across the low ground. "'Waste of time complaining about unfairness, General,' Sharp said. "'Only the wealthy can afford to preach about fairness.' The rest of us take what we can and try hard not to miss what we can't take. Even so, Sharp, it's unfair, Runciman said reprovingly. The colonel looked pale and unhappy. It's the disgrace, you see. A man goes home to England and expects to be decently treated, but instead I'll be vilified. He ducked as a French round shot rumbled far overhead. I had hopes, Sharp, I had hopes. Well, the Golden Fleece, General, order the bath. Well, not just those, Sharp, but... A marriage. Well, there are, you understand, ladies of fortune in Hampshire. I've no ambition to be a bachelor all my life, Sharp. Well, my dear mother, God rest, always claimed I'd be a good husband, so long as the lady was possessed of a, a middling fortune. Not a great fortune. One must not be unrealistic, but a sufficiency to keep our good selves in, in modest comfort. Yeah, a pair of coaches, decent stables, cooks that know their business, a smallish game park, a dairy, you know, you know the sort of place. Makes me homesick, General. Sharp said. The sarcasm sailed airily over Runciman's head. But now, Sharp, can you imagine any woman of decent family allying herself with a, a vilified name? He thought about it for a moment, then gave a slow, despairing shake of the head. Oh, God, I might have to marry a Methodist. It hasn't happened yet, General, Sharp said, and a lot could change today. Runciman looked alarmed. Oh, you mean I could be killed? Or you could make a name for bravery, sir, Sharp said. Knows he always forgives a man for good conduct. Oh, good Lord, no, dear me, no. By my soul, Sharp, no, I, I ain't the type, never was. I went to soldiering because my dear father couldn't find a place for me anywhere else. He purchased me into the army, you understand, because he said it was as good a billet as I could ever expect from society. But I'm not the fighting sort. Never was, Sharp. Runciman listened to the terrible noise of the cannonade pounding Fuentes de Onoro, a noise made worse by the splintering sound of voltigeur muskets firing over the stream. I'm not proud of it, Sharp. I don't think I could endure that kind of thing. Don't think I could at all. 
I can't blame you, sir, Sharp said, then turned as Sergeant Harper shouted for his attention. Uh, you'll forgive me, General. Oh, yeah. off you go, Sharp, off you go. Trade, sir, Harper said, jerking his head towards Major Tarrant, who was gesticulating at a wagon driver. Tarrant turned as Sharp came near. The late division is ordered south, Sharp, but its ammunition reserve is stuck to the north. We're to replace it. Would you mind if your rifles accompanied it? Sharp did mind. He instinctively wanted to stay where the battle would be fiercest, and that was in Fuentes de Onuro, but he couldn't say as much to Tarrant. No, sir. In case they get bogged down, you see, and have to spend the rest of the day fighting off Frenchmen, so the general wants them to have a plenitude of ammunition. Rifle and musket cartridges mixed. I tell you, you're looking after themselves. One wagon should do it, but uh, it needs an escort, Sharp. French cavalry are lively down there. Can we help? Captain Donahue had overheard Tarrant's hurried explanation of Sharp's errand. Might teach you later, Captain, Tarrant said. Have a feeling today's likely to be lively all round. Never see the frog so uppity. Are you, Sharp? They got their tails up today, Major, Sharp agreed. He looked up at the wagon driver. You ready? The driver nodded. His wagon was an English four-wheeled farm vehicle with high splayed sides to which were harnessed three Cleveland bays in single file. Have four beasts once, the driver remarked as Sharp climbed up beside him. But a Frenchy shell got best, so now I'm down to three. The driver had woven red and blue woolen braiding into the horse's manes and had decorated his wagon's flanks with discarded cap plates and thrown horseshoes that he'd nailed to the planking. You know where we're going? he asked Sharp, as Harper ordered the rifleman to climb onto the boxes of ammunition stacked on the wagon's bed. After them! Sharp pointed to his right, where the plateau offered a gentler slope down to the southern lowlands, and where the light division was marching south beneath its banners. It was Sharp's old division, made up of riflemen and light infantry, and it regarded itself as the army's elite division. Now it was marching to save the 7th Division from annihilation. A mile away, across the Dos Casas stream, and close to the ruined barn that served as his headquarters, Marshal André Massena saw the fresh British troops leave the plateau's protection to march south towards the beleaguered redcoats and Portuguese. The fool! he said to himself, then louder in a gleeful voice. The fool! Your Majesty? an aide inquired. The first rule of war, Jean, the Marshal said, is never to reinforce failure. And what is our whole free Englishman doing? He's sending more troops to be massacred by our cavalry. The marshal put the telescope back to his eye. He could see guns and cavalry going south with the new troops. Or maybe he's withdrawing, he mused aloud. Maybe he's making sure he can get back to Portugal. Where's Lou's brigade? Just north of here, your majesty, the aide answered. With his horn, no doubt, Masenia asked sourly. Juanita de Elia's flamboyant presence with the Lou Brigade had drawn the attention and jealousy of every Frenchman in the army. Indeed, Your Majesty. Massenia snapped the telescope shut. He disliked Lou. He recognized his ambitions and knew that Lou would trample over any man to gain those ambitions. Lou wanted to be a marshal like Massenia. He'd even lost an eye like Massenia. And now he wanted those grand titles with which the Emperor rewarded the brave and the lucky but Massenia would not help Lou secure those ambitions. A man remained a marshal by suppressing his rivals, not encouraging them. So this day Brigadier Lou will be given a menial task. One Brigadier Lou, Massenia told the aide, that he is to untangle himself from his Spanish oar and be ready to escort the wagons through Fuentes de Onoro when our soldiers have opened the road. Telling him Wellington's shifting his position to the south and the road to Almeida should be opened by midday and that his brigade's job will be to escort the supplies into Almeida while the rest of us finish off the enemy. Marsenia smiled. Today was a day for Frenchmen to win glory, a day to capture a hall of enemy colours and to soak a riverbank with the blood of Englishmen. But Lou, Marsenia had decided, would share no part of it. Lou would be a common baggage guard, while Marsenia and the Eagles made all Europe shudder with fear. The Seventh Division retreated towards a slight ridge of ground above the Dos Casas stream. They were retreating north, but facing south, as they tried to block the advance of the massive French force that had been sent around the army's flank. In the distance, they could see the two enemy infantry divisions reforming their ranks in front of Focovelia. But the immediate danger came from the enormous number of French cavalry that waited just outside the effective range of the Seventh Division's muskets. 
the equation facing the nine Allied battalions was simple enough. They could form squares and know that even the bravest cavalry would be slaughtered if they tried to charge the mass of compacted muskets and bayonets. But infantry in square was cruelly vulnerable to artillery and musket fire. The moment the 7th Division contracted into squares, the French would batter the Allied ranks with gunfire until the Portuguese and redcoats were shredded bloody and the cavalry could ride unchallenged over the crazed survivors. British and German cavalry came to the rescue first. The Allied horse was outnumbered and could never hope to defeat the swirling mass of plumed and breastplated Frenchmen. But the hussars and dragoons made charge after charge that kept the enemy cavalry from harrying the infantry. Keep them in hand! A British cavalry major kept shouting at his squadrons. Keep them in hand! He feared that his men would lose their sense and make a mad charge to glory instead of retiring after each short attack to reform and charge again. And so he kept encouraging them to show caution and keep their discipline. The squadrons took turns to hold off the French cavalry, one fighting as the others retreated after the infantry. The horses were bleeding, sweating and trembling. But time after time they trotted into their ranks and waited for the spurs to throw them back into the fight. The men tightened their grips on sword and sabre and watched the enemy, who shouted insults in an attempt to entice the British and Germans to a mad galloping assault that would open their tightly ordered ranks and turn the controlled charges into a frantic melee of swords, lances and sabres. In such a melee, the French numbers were bound to win, but the Allied officers kept their men in hand. Damn your eagerness! Hold her in! Hold her in! A captain called to a trooper whose horse broke into a trot too early. The dragoons were the Allied heavy cavalry. They were big men mounted on big horses and carried long, heavy, straight-bladed swords. They didn't charge at the gallop, but rather waited until an enemy regiment threatened to charge, and then they made their countercharge at walking pace. Sergeants shouted at the men to hold the line, to keep close and curb their horses, and only at the very last moment, when the enemy was within pistol shot, did a trumpeter sound the charge, and the horses would be spurred to a gallop, and the men would scream their war cries as they hacked at the enemy horsemen. The big swords could do horrid work. They battered the lighter sabres of the French chasseur aside, and forced the riders to duck low over their horses' necks as they tried to avoid the butcher's blades. Steel clashed on steel, wounded horses screamed and reared, and then the trumpet would call for the withdrawal, and the Allied horse would disengage and wheel away. A few French were bound to pursue, but the British and Germans were working close to their own infantry, and any Frenchman tempted to pursue too close to the Portuguese and British battalions became easy meat for a company of muskets. It was hard, disciplined, inglorious work, and each countercharge paid a price in men and horses but the threat of the enemy cavalry was checked by it, and the nine infantry battalions marched steadily north because of it. The retreating 7th Division's flanks were covered by the fire of the horse artillery. The gunners fired canister that could turn a horse and man into a mangled horror of flesh, cloth, leather, steel and blood. The guns would fire four or five rounds while the infantry retreated. Then the horse teams were hurried forward, the guns' trail lifted into the limber's pintle, and the gunners would scramble onto the horses' backs and whip the animals into a frantic dash before the vengeful French cavalrymen could catch them. As soon as the team reached the protection of the infantry's muskets, it would slew around to make the guns' skidding wheels throw up a fountain of mud or dust, and the gunners would slide off the horses' backs even before they'd stopped running. The gun was unhitched, the horses and limber led away, and in seconds the next round of canister would shriek down the field to drive another French squadron bloodily away. The French artillery concentrated their fire on the infantry. Their round shot and shells whipped through the ranks, spraying blood ten feet high as the missiles plunged home. Close up! Close up! The sergeant shouted and prayed that the excitable enemy cavalry would mask their own guns and thus stop the bombardment. But the cavalry was learning to let the gunners and the French infantry do some of the work before the horsemen garnered all the glory. The French cavalry pulled aside to let the muskets and cannons fight the battle, and to rest their horses while the Portuguese and British infantry died. And die they did. The round shot whipped through the columns, and musket fire raked the files to slow the already agonizingly slow retreat. The nine shrinking battalions left trails of crushed and bloodied grass as they crawled northwards, and the crawl was threatening to come to a full halt when all that would be left of the division would be nine bands of survivors clustered round their precious colours. The French cavalry saw their enemy dying, 
and were content to wait for the perfect moment to pounce and deliver the coup de grace. One group of chasseurs and cuirassiers rode towards a slight rise in the ground where a long wood was planted. The cavalry's commander reckoned the wood would hide his men as they worked their way to the rear of the dying battalions and so give him a chance to launch a surprise attack that might capture a half-dozen flags in one glorious charge. He led the two troops up the slope, his men trailing behind, when suddenly the tree line exploded with gun smoke. There weren't supposed to be enemy troops among the trees, but the volley ripped the advancing cavalry into chaos. The cuirassier commander went backwards off his horse's rump with his breastplate holed three times. One of his boots was trapped in a stirrup, and he screamed as his terrified and wounded horse dragged him bouncing across the grass to leave great splashes of blood. Then his foot came free, and he twitched on the grass as he died. Eight other horsemen fell, some had merely been unhorsed, and those men ran to find an unwounded mount while their comrades turned and spurred to safety. Green-jacketed riflemen ran out of the woods to pillage the dead and wounded cavalrymen. The deep-bellied breastplates worn by the cuirassier were valued as shaving bowls or skillets, and even a bullet-hole breastplate could be patched up by a friendly blacksmith. More green jackets showed at the wood's southern end. Then a battalion of redcoats appeared behind them, and with the redcoats came a squadron of fresh cavalry and another battery of horse artillery. A regimental band was playing over the hills and far away, as yet more redcoats and green jackets marched into view. The light division had arrived. The ammunition wagon lumbered across the fields in the wake of the fast-marching light division. One of the wagon's axles squealed like a soul in torment, an annoyance for which the driver apologised. But of Greister, he told Sharp, and Greister again, of Greister with the best pig's fat rendered down, but that squeak still don't want to go away. He started the day our best got killed, and I reckons that squeak is our best letting us know she's still kicking somewhere. For a time the driver followed a cart track. Then Sharp and his riflemen had to dismount and put their shoulders to the wagon's rear to help the vehicle over a bank and into a meadow. Once back on top of the ammunition boxes, the green jackets decided the wagon was a stagecoach and began imitating the calls of the post horns and singing out the stops. Red Lion, fine owls, good food, we change your horses and leave in a quarter of an hour. The ladies will find their convenience catered for in the passage behind the lounge. The wagon driver had heard it all before and showed no reaction. But Sharp, after Harris had hollered for ten minutes about pissing in the passage, turned and told them all to shut the hell up, whereupon they pretended to be cowed by him, and Sharp had a sudden pang of regret at the things he would miss if he were to lose his commission. Ahead of the wagon, the rifles and the muskets cracked. An occasional French round shot that had been fired too high came bounding across the nearby fields, but the three horses plodded on as patiently as though they were harnessed to a plough instead of lumbering into battle. Only once did an enemy threaten, and so force sharp score of riflemen off the wagon to form a rank beside the road. A troop of fifty green-coated dragoons appeared way off to the west, where their commander spotted the wagon and turned his men in for the attack. The wagon driver stopped the vehicle and was waiting with a knife poised in case he needed to cut the traces. We take the horses, he advised sharp, and leave the Frenchies to ransack the wagon. That'll keep the buggers busy while we makes off. His horses munched the grass contentedly while Sharp measured the range to the French dragoons whose copper helmets glinted gold in the sunlight. Then, just when he'd decided that he might be forced to take the wagon driver's advice and retreat, a squadron of blue-coated cavalrymen intervened. The newcomers were British light dragoons who tempted the French into a running fight of sword against sabre. The driver put away his knife and clicked his tongue, provoking the horses forward. The riflemen scrambled back aboard as the wagon swayed on towards a tree line that obscured the source of the growing powder smoke whitening the southern sky. Then a crash of heavy guns sounded to the north, and Sharp twisted on the wagon's box to see that the rim of the British Hell Plateau was thick with smoke as the main batteries fired thunderous volleys towards the east. Frogs are attacking the village again, Sharp said. Nasty place to fight, Harper said. Be glad we're right here instead, boys. And pray the buggers don't cut us off out here, Sergeant Latimer added gloomily. You've got to die somewhere, ain't that right, Mr. Sharp? Perkins called out. Make it your own bed, Perkins, with Miranda beside you, Sharp answered. You looking after that girl? She's not complaining, Mr. Sharp, Perkins said, thereby provoking a chorus of teasing jeers. Perkins still lacked his green jacket and was touchy about the loss of the coat with his distinguishing black armband denoting that he was a chosen man, a compliment that was paid only to the best and most reliable riflemen. 
The wagon lurched onto a deep rutted farm track that led south through the trees towards the distant villages overrun by the French. The seventh division was marching north from the woods, going back to the plateau, while the newly arrived light division deployed across the broader road that led back into Portugal. The retiring battalions marched slowly, forced to the snail's pace by the number of wounded in their ranks, but at least they marched undefeated beneath flying colours. The wagon driver hauled on the reins to stop the horses among the trees where the light division had established a temporary depot. Two surgeons had spread their knives and saws on tarpaulins laid under home oaks while a regimental band played a few yards away. Sharp told his rifleman to stay with the wagon while he sought orders. The light division was arrayed in squares on the plain between the trees and the smoking villages. The French cavalry trotted across the faces of the squares, trying to provoke wasteful volleys at too long a range. The British cavalry was being held in reserve, waiting until the French horse came too close. Six guns of the horse artillery were firing at the French cannon, while groups of riflemen were occupying the rocky outcrops that studded the fields. General Crawford, the Light Division's irascible commander, had brought three and a half thousand men to the rescue of the 7th Division, and now those three and a half thousand were faced by four thousand French cavalry and twelve thousand French infantrymen. That infantry was advancing in its attack columns from Pocovelia. Sharp! What the hell are you doing here? Thought you deserted us, gone to join the Bumboys in Picton's division. Brigadier General Robert Crawford, fierce-faced and scowling, had spotted Sharp. Sharp explained he'd brought a wagon load of ammunition that was now waiting among the trees. A waste of time bringing us ammunition, Crawford snapped. You got plenty. What the hell are you doing delivering ammunition? Being demoted, have you? I heard you're in disgrace. I'm on administrative duties, sir, Sharp said. He'd known Crawford ever since India, and, like every other skirmisher in Britain's army, Sharp had a mixed regard for Black Bob, sometimes resenting the man's hard, unforgiving discipline, but also recognising that in Crawford the army had a soldier almost as talented as Wellington himself. They're going to sacrifice you, Sharp, Crawford said with unholy relish. He wasn't looking at Sharp, but instead watched the great horde of French cavalry that was preparing for a concerted charge against his newly arrived battalions. You shot a pair of frogs, ain't that right? Yes, sir. Ah, oh, no wonder you're in disgrace, Crawford said, then gave a bark of laughter. His aides sat their horses in a tight group behind the general. Come alone, Sharp, did you? Crawford asked. I've got my green jackets here, sir. And the buggers can remember how to fight. I think they can, sir. And skirmish for me. Those are your new administrative duties, Mr. Sharp. I have to keep the division a safe distance in front of the frog infantry, which means we'll all have to endure the attentions of their gunners and horse. But I'm expecting my rifles to plague the horses and kill the damn guns, and you can help them. Crawford twisted in his saddle. Barrett! Distribute the ammunition and send the wagon back with the wounded. Go to it, Sharp, and keep a good lookout. We don't want to abandon you out here on your own. Sharp hesitated. It was a risky business, asking questions of Black Bob, a man who expected instant obedience. But the general's words had intrigued him. So we're not staying here, sir? he asked. We're going back to the ridge. Of course we're bloody going back. How the hell do you think we marched out here, just to commit suicide? You think I came back from leave just to give the bloody frogs some target practice? Get the hell on with it, Sharp. Yes, sir. Sharp ran back to fetch his men and felt a sudden mingled surge of fear and hope. For Wellington had abandoned the roads back to Portugal. There could be no safe withdrawal now, no steady retreat across the Coas fords, for Wellington had yielded those roads to the enemy. The British and Portuguese must stand and fight now, and if they lost, they would die, and with them would die all hopes of victory in Spain. Defeat now did not just mean that Almeida would be relieved, but that the British and Portuguese army would be annihilated. Fuentes de Onoro had become a battle to the death. Chapter 10 Sunday's first attack on Fuentes de Oñoro was made by the same French infantrymen who had attacked two days before, and who had since been occupying the gardens and houses on the stream's eastern bank. They assembled silently, using the stone walls of the orchards and gardens to disguise their intentions, and then, without an opening volley or even bothering to throw out a skirmish line, the blue-coated infantry swarmed across the tumbled walls and plunged down to the stream. The Scottish defenders had time for one volley, 
Then the French were in the village, clawing at the barricades or clambering over the walls thrown down by the howitzer shells that had fallen among the houses in the two hours since dawn. The French drove the Scots deep into the village, where one surge trapped two companies of Highlanders in a cul-de-sac. The attackers turned on the cornered men in a frenzy, filling the alley's narrow confines with a storm of musketry. Some of the Scots tried to escape by pushing down a house wall, but the French were waiting on the far side and met the wall's collapse with more volleys of musket fire. The surviving Highlanders barricaded themselves in houses bordering the stream, but the French poured fire at windows, loopholes and doors, then brought up galloper guns to fire across the stream, until at last, with all their officers killed or wounded, the dazed Highlanders surrendered. The attack on the cornered Highlanders had drained men from the main uphill assault which stalled in the village's centre. The Warwicks, again in reserve, came down from the plateau to help the remaining Scots, and together they first stopped the French, then drove them back towards the stream. The fight was fought at murderously close range. Muskets flamed just feet from their targets, and when these were empty, men used their guns as clubs, or else stabbed forward with bayonets. They were hoarse from shouting and from breathing the smoky dust that filled the air in the narrow, twisting streets, where gutters ran with blood and bodies piled to block each door and entryway. The Scots and Warwicks fought their way downhill, but each time they tried to push the French out of the last few houses, the newly emplaced guns in the orchards would open fire with canister to fill the village's lower streets and alleys with a rattling sleet of death. Blood trickled to the stream. The village's defenders were deafened by the echo of muskets and the crash of artillery in the streets, but they were not so deaf that they didn't hear the ominous tattoo of approaching drummers. New French columns were crossing the plain. The British guns on the ridge were slashing round shot into the advancing ranks and blasting K-shot that exploded above their heads, but the columns were vast, and the defenders' cannons few, and so the great mass of men marched on into the eastern gardens, from where, with a vast shout, a horde of men in shaggy black bearskin hats swept over the stream and up into the village. These new attackers were the mass grenadiers, the biggest men and bravest fighters that the attacking divisions could muster. They wore moustaches, epaulets, and plumed bearskins as marks of their special status, and they stormed into the village with a roar of triumph that lasted as they swept up the streets with bayonets and musket fire. The tired Warwicks went back, and the Scots went with them. More Frenchmen crossed the stream, a seemingly never-ending flood of bluecoats that followed the elite grenadiers into the alleys and up through the houses. The fight in the lower half of the village was the hardest for the attackers, for although sheer impetus carried the assault far into the village heart, they were constantly obstructed by dead or wounded. Grenadiers slipped on stones made treacherous by blood, yet sheer numbers forced the attackers on, and the defenders were now too few to stop them. Some redcoats tried to clear streets with volley fire, but the grenadiers swarmed through back alleys or over garden walls to outflank the redcoat companies, which could only go back uphill through the dust and tiles and burning thatch of the upper village. Wounded men called out pathetically, beseeching their comrades to carry them to safety. But the attack was coming too fast now, and the Scots and Englishmen were retreating too quickly. They abandoned the village altogether, fleeing from the upper houses to find a refuge in the graveyard. The leading French grenadiers charged from the village towards the church above and were met by a volley of muskets fired by men waiting behind the graveyard wall. The front men fell, but those behind leapt over their dying comrades to assault the graveyard wall. Bayonets and musket stocks slashed over the stone. Then the big French soldiers surged over the wall, even pushing it down in some places to begin hunting the survivors up through the heaped graves and fallen stones and shattered wooden crosses. More Frenchmen came from the village to bolster the attack. Then a splintering deluge of rifle and musket fire flashed from the stony outcrops just above the blood-greased slope. Grenadiers fell and rolled downhill. A second British volley whipped over the gun-churn graves as still more redcoats arrived to line the ridge's crest and fire their rolling volleys from beside the church and from the saddle of Grassland where Wellington had watched aghast as this spring French tide had risen almost to his horse's hooves. And there, for a while, the attack stalled. The French had first filled the village with dead and wounded, then they'd captured it, and now they held the graveyard too. Their soldiers crouched behind graves or behind their enemies piled dead. They were just feet from the ridge's summit, just feet from victory. 
while behind them, on a plain gouged by runshot and scorched by shell and littered with the bodies of dead and dying men, still more French infantry came to help the attackers on. The day needed just one more push, then the eagles of France would fly free. The light division had formed its battalions into close columns of companies. Each company formed a rectangle four ranks deep and anything from twelve to twenty files wide. Then the ten companies of each battalion paraded in column, so that from the sky each battalion now resembled a stack of thin red bricks. Then, one by one, the battalion columns turned their backs on the enemy and began marching north towards the plateau. The French cavalry gave immediate pursuit, and the air rang with a brassy cacophony as trumpet after trumpet sounded the advance. Form square on the front division! The colonel of the Redcoat Battalion near as sharp shouted. The major commanding the battalion's leading division of companies called for the first brick to halt, and for the second to form alongside it, so that two of the bricks now made one long wall of men, four ranks deep and forty men wide. Fresh ranks! The sergeant shouted as the men shuffled close together and looked right to make sure their rank was ruler straight. While the leading two companies straightened their ranks, the major was calling orders to the succeeding companies. Sections up a wheel! Rear sections close to the front! The French trumpets were pealing, and the earth was vibrating for the mass of hooves, but the sergeant's and officers' voices sounded coolly over the threat. Up a wheel! Steady now! Rear sections close to the front! The six centre companies of the battalion now split into four sections each. Two sections swung like hinged doors to the right and two to the left, the innermost men of each section reducing their marching pace from thirty to twenty inches, while the men swinging widest lengthened their stride to thirty-three inches, and so the sections pivoted outward to begin forming the twin faces of the square whose anchoring wall was the first two companies. Mounted officers hurried to get their horses inside the rapidly forming square that was in reality an oblong. The northward face had been made by the two leading companies. Now the two longer sides were formed by the next six companies, wheeling outward and closing hard up, while the last companies merely filled in the vacant fourth side. Halt! Right about face! The major in command of the rear division shouted to the last two companies. Prepare to receive cavalry! The colonel shouted dutifully, as if the sight of the mass French horse was not warning enough. The colonel drew his sword, then swatted with his free hand at a horsefly. The colour party stood beside him, two teenage ensigns holding the precious flags that were guarded by a squad of chosen men commanded by hard-bitten sergeants armed with spontoons. Rear rank, port arms, the major called. The innermost rank of the square would hold its fire and so act as the battalion's reserve. The cavalry was a hundred paces away and closing fast, a churning mass of excited horses, raised blades, trumpets, flags and thunder. Front rank, kneel, a captain called. The front rank dropped and jammed their bayonet-tipped muskets into the earth to make a continuous hedge of steel about the formation. Make ready! The two inside ranks cocked their loaded guns and took aim. The whole manoeuvre had been done at a steady pace, without fuss, and the sudden sight of the level muskets and braced bayonets persuaded the leading cavalrymen to sheer away from the steady, stolid and silent square. Infantry and square were just about as safe from cavalry as if they were tucked up at home in bed, and the Redcoat Battalion, by forming square so quickly and so quietly, had made the French charge impotent. Very nice, Sergeant Latimer said in tribute to the battalion's professionalism. Very nicely done, just like the parade grounds at Shawcliffe. Gone to the right, sir, Harper called. Sharp's men were occupying one of the rocky outcrops that studded the plain and which gave the riflemen protection from the marauding cavalry. Their job was to snipe at the cavalry, and especially at the French horse artillery, which was trying to take advantage of the British squares. Men in square were safe from cavalry, yet horribly vulnerable to shell and round shot. But gunners were equally vulnerable to the accuracy of the British Baker rifles. A galloper gun had taken position two hundred paces away from Sharp, and the gun's crew was lining the barrel on the newly formed square. Two men lifted the ammunition chest off the gun's trail, while a third double-shotted the gun's blackened barrel by ramming a round of canister on top of a round shot. Dan Hagman fired first, and the man ramming the shot slewed round, then held on to the protruding rammer's handle as though it was his grip on life itself. A second bullet cracked off the cannon's barrel to leave a bright scratch in the jaded brass. Another gunner fell, 
Then one of the gun's horses was hit, and it reared up and kicked at the horse harnessed next to it. Steady does it, Sharp said. Stay game, boys, stay game, don't waste the shots. Three more green jackets fired and their bullets persuaded the beleaguered gunners to crouch behind the cannon and its limber. The gunners shouted at some green-coated dragoons to go and dig the damned riflemen out from their rocky eyrie. Someone take care of that dragoon, Captain, Sharp said. Square's going, sir, Cooper warned Sharp as Horrell and Cressica fired at the distant horsemen. Sharp turned and saw the red-coat square was shaking itself into a column again to resume its retreat. He dared not get too far away from the protection of the redcoats' muskets. His danger, like that facing every small group of riflemen who cover the retreat, was that his men might be cut off by the cavalry, and Sharp doubted that the long-suffering French horsemen would be willing to take prisoners this day. Any green jacket caught in the open would most likely be used for sword or lance practice. Go! he shouted, and his men scrambled away from the rocks and ran for the cover of the redcoat battalion. The dragoons turned to pursue. Then the leading ranks of horsemen were thrown sideways and turned bloody as a blast of canister fired from a British galloper gun smashed into them. Sharp saw a clump of trees just to the left of the Redcoat Battalion's line of march and shouted at Harper to lead the men to the small woods cover. Once safe among the oaks, the Green Jackets reloaded and looked for new targets. To Sharp, who had served on a dozen battlefields, the plain offered an extraordinary sight. A mass of cavalry was churning and spilling between the steadily withdrawing battalions, yet for all their noise and excitement the horsemen were achieving nothing. The infantry were steady and silent, performing the intricate drill that they had practised for hours and hours, and which now was saving their lives, and doing it in the knowledge that just one mistake by a battalion commander would be fatal. If a column was just a few seconds too slow to form square, then the rampaging cuirassier would be through the gap on their heavy horses, and gutting the imperfect square from the inside. A disciplined battalion would be turned in an instant into a rabble of panicking fugitives to be ridden down by dragoons or slaughtered by lances, yet no battalion made any mistake, and so the French were being frustrated by a superb display of steady soldiering. The French kept searching for an opportunity. Whenever a battalion was marching in a column of companies, and so looked ripe for attack, a sudden surge of horses would flow across the field and the trumpets would rally yet more horse to join the thunderous charge. But then the redcoats' column would break, wheel, and march into square, with the same precision as if they were drilling on the parade ground at their home barracks. The troops would mark time for an instant as the square was achieved. Then the outer rank would kneel, the whole formation would bristle with bayonets, and the horsemen would shear away in impotent rage. A few impetuous Frenchmen would always try to draw blood and gallop too close to the square, only to be blasted from their saddles. Or maybe a British galloper gun would bloody a whole troop of dragoons or cuirassiers with a blast of canister. But then the cavalry would gallop out of range and the horses would be rested, while the square trudged back into column and marched stoically on. The horsemen would watch them go until another flurry of trumpets summoned the whole flux of mounted men to chase yet another opportunity far across the field. And once again a battalion would contract into square, and once again the horsemen would wheel away with unblooded blades. And always, Everywhere, ahead and behind, and in between the slowly withdrawing battalions, groups of green jackets sniped and harried and killed. French gunners became reluctant to advance, while the more sober horsemen took care to avoid the small nests of riflemen that stung so viciously. The French had no rifles because the Emperor despised the weapon as being too slow for battle use, but today the rifles were making the Emperor's soldiers curse. The Emperor's soldiers were also dying. The calm redcoat battalions were leaving scarcely anybody's behind, but the cavalry was being flayed by rifle and cannon fire. Unhorsed cavalrymen limped southwards carrying saddles, bridles, and weapons. Some riderless horses stayed with their regiments, forming in the ranks whenever a squadron regrouped, and charging along with the other horses when the trumpets threw the squadron into the attack. Far behind the milling cavalry, the French infantry divisions hurried to join the battle but the light division was outmarching the advancing French infantry. When a battalion did form column to continue the retreat, it would go at the rifle speed of 108 paces to the minute, faster than any other infantry in the world. The French marching pace was shorter than the British, and the speed of their march much slower than that of the specially trained troops of Crawford's light division. And so, despite the need to stop and form square and see off the cavalry, Crawford's men were still outpacing the pursuing infantry. 
while far to the north of the Light Division, the main British line was being remade, so that Wellington's defence now followed the edge of the plateau to make a right angle with Fuentes de Oñoro at its corner. All that was needed now was for the Light Division to come safely home, and the army would be complete again, ensconced behind slopes and daring the French to attack. Sharp took his men back another quarter mile, to a patch of rocks where his riflemen could find cover. A pair of British guns was working close to the rocks, blasting round shot and shell at a newly placed French battery beside the wood Sharp had just abandoned. A flow of horse began to thicken in this part of the field as the cavalry sought out a vulnerable battalion. Two regiments, one of redcoats and the other Portuguese, were retreating past the battery, and the sweating horsemen stalked the two columns. Eventually, the press of horse became so thick that the columns marched into squares. Boggers are everywhere, Harper said, firing his rifle at a chasseur officer. The two British guns had switched their aim to fire canister at the cavalry in an attempt to drive them away from the two infantry squares. The guns crashed back on their trails to jar the wheels up in the air. The gunners swabbed out the barrel, rammed down a new charge and canister, pricked the powder bag through the touch hole, then ducked aside after putting the smoking linstock to the powder fuse. The guns cracked deafeningly, smoke punched sixty feet out from the muzzles, and the grass lay momentarily flat as the blast whipped overhead. A horse screamed as the musket ball spread out and thumped home. A surge and eddy in the mass of horse presaged another move. But instead of riding back across the fields to harry a marching column, the cavalry suddenly turned on the two guns. Blood dripped from horses' flanks as riders spurred frantically towards the desperate gunners who now picked up their guns' trails, turned the weapons and dropped the trail hooks over the limber's pintles. The team horses were run into place, the harnesses attached, and the gunners scrambled up onto the guns or horses. But the French cavalry had timed their charge well, and the gunners were still whipping their tired animals into motion as the leading cuirassiers swept down on the battery. A charge of British light dragoons saved the guns. The blue-coated horsemen slashed in from the north, sabres cutting down of plumed helmets and parrying swords. More British cavalry arrived to flank the guns that were now galloping frantically northwards. The heavy cannons bounced over the rough ground, the gunners clung to the limbers' handles, the whips cracked, and all about the galloping horses and blurring wheels, the cavalry hacked at each other in a running fight. A British dragoon reeled out of the fight with a face turned into a mask of blood, while a cuirassier fell from his saddle to be mangled by the hooves of the gun teams, then crushed by the iron-rimmed wheel of limber and cannon. Then a rippling crash of musketry announced that the rolling chaos of guns, horses, swordsmen and lancers had come into range of the Portuguese square's face and the cheated French cavalry swerved away as the two guns galloped on to safety. A cheer for the gunners' escape went up from the two allied squares. Then the guns slewed about in an eruption of grass and dust to open fire again on their erstwhile pursuers. Sharp's men had slipped away from the rocks to join another battalion of redcoats. They marched among the companies for a few minutes, then broke off to take position in a tangle of thorns and boulders. A small group of chasseurs in green coats, black silver-looped shakos, and with carbines slung on hooks on their white crossbelts trotted close by. The French hadn't noticed the small group of riflemen crouched among the thorns. They were continually taking off their shakos and wiping sweat from their faces with their frayed red cuffs. Their horses were white with sweat. One had a leg matted with blood, but it was somehow keeping up with its companions. The officer stopped his troop and one of the men unclipped his carbine, cocked the weapon, and aimed at a British gun that was unlimbering to the east. Agman put a rifle bullet into the man's head before he could pull the trigger, and suddenly the chasseurs were cursing and trying to spur their horses out of rifle range. Sharp fired, his rifle's report lost in the crackle of sound as his men sent a volley after the enemy troop. A half-dozen of the chasseurs galloped out of range, but they left as many bodies behind. Permission to write the bosses over, sir? Cooper asked. Go on, but equal shares, Sharp said, meaning that whatever plunder was found had to be shared among the whole squad. Cooper and Harris ran out to filch the bodies, while Harper and Finn carried bundles of empty water bottles to a nearby stream. They filled the bottles while Cooper and Harris slit the seams of the dead men's green coats, cut open the pockets of their white waistcoats, searched inside the shako linings, and tugged off the short white tasseled boots. The two riflemen came back with a French shako, half filled with a motley collection of French, Portuguese, and Spanish coins. Poor as church mice, 
Harris complained while he split the coins into piles. You having a share, sir? Of course he is, Harper said, distributing the precious water. Every man was parched. Their mouths had been dried and soured by the acrid, salty gunpowder in the cartridges, and now they swilled the water around their mouths and spat it out black before drinking the rest. A distant crackling sound made Sharp turn. The village of Fuentes de Onoro was a mile away now, and the sound seemed to be coming from its narrow, death-choked streets, where a plume of smoke climbed into the sky. More gun smoke showed at the plateau's edge, evidence that the French were still attacking the village. Sharp turned back to look at the tired, hot cavalrymen who spread across the plain. He was looking for grey uniforms and seeing none. Time to go, sir, Hagman called, hinting that the rifleman would be cut off if Sharp didn't withdraw soon. Back we go, Sharp said. Run to that column. He pointed to some Portuguese infantry. They ran, easily reaching the Portuguese before a half-hearted pursuit of vengeful chasseurs could get close to the rifleman. But the chasseurs' small charge attracted a flow of other cavalrymen, enough to make the Portuguese column shake itself into square. Sharp and his men stayed in the square and watched as the cavalry streamed around the battalion. Brigadier General Crawford had also taken shelter in the square and now observed the surrounding French from under the battalion's colours. He looked a proud man, and no wonder. His division, which had disciplined into becoming the best in all the army, was performing magnificently. They were outnumbered, they were surrounded, yet no one had panicked. Not one battalion had been caught deployed in column, and not one square had been rattled by the horsemen's proximity. The light had saved the 7th Division, and now it was saving itself with a dazzling display of professional soldiering. Pure drill was defeating French verve. Amasenia's attack, which had swept around the British right flank with overwhelming force, had been rendered utterly impotent. You like it, Sharp? Crawford called from his horse. Wonderful, sir. Just wonderful. Sharp's compliment was heartfelt. They're scoundrels, Crawford said of his men. But the devils can fight, can't they? His pride was understandable, and it had even persuaded the irascible Crawford to unbend and indulge in conversation. It was even a friendly conversation. I'll put a word in for you, Sharp, Crawford said, because a man shouldn't be disciplined for killing the enemy. I don't suppose my help will do you any good. It won't, sir. Well, Valverde's an awkward bugger, Crawford said. He don't like the British, and he won't want Wellington given a Spanish Generalissimo's hat. Valverde reckons he'd make a better Generalissimo himself, but the only time the bugger fought the French, he pissed his yellow pants yellower, and lost three good battalions doing it. But it ain't about soldiering, Sharp. It's about politics, all about damn politics. And the one thing every soldier should know is not to get tangled up in politics. Slimy bastards politicians should all be killed, every last damn one of them. I'd tie the whole bloody pack of lying bastards to cannon muzzles and blow them away. Blow them away! Fertilize the field with the bastards. Dung the world with the breed. Them and lawyers. The thought of the trim professions had put Crawford into a bad mood. He scowled at Sharp, then twitched his reins to take his horse back towards the battalion's colours. I'll speak for you, Sharp. Thank you, sir, Sharp said. Won't help you, Crawford said curtly. But I'll try. He watched the nearest French cavalry move away. I think the buggers are looking for other meat, he called to the Portuguese battalion's colonel. Let's march on. She'll be back in the lines for luncheon. Dead you, Sharp. The 7th Division had long reached the safety of the plateau, and now the leading battalions of the Light Division climbed the slope under the protection of British artillery. The British and German cavalry, that had charged again and again to hold off the hordes of French horsemen, now walked their weary and wounded horses up the hill where riflemen with dried mouths and bruised shoulders and foul rifle barrels trudged towards safety. The French horsemen could only watch their enemy march away and wonder why in over three miles of pursuit across country made by God for cavalrymen they hadn't managed to break one single battalion. They'd succeeded in catching and killing a handful of redcoat skirmishers in the open land at the bottom of the ridge, but the overall price of the morning's fight had been dozens of dead troopers and scores of butchered horses. The last of the light division columns climbed the hill beneath its colours, where bands played to greet the battalion's return. The British army that had been so dangerously divided was now whole again, but it was still cut off from home, and it still faced the larger of the two French attacks. For in Fuentes de Onoro, whose streets were already choked with blood, a whole new French attack was following the drums.
Marshal Massenia felt annoyance as he watched the two parts of the enemy's army recombine. Good God, he'd sent two divisions of infantry and all his cavalry, and still they had let the enemy slip away. But at least all the British and Portuguese forces were now cut off from their retreat across the Coa, so that now, when they were defeated, the whole of Wellington's army must try to find safety in the wild hills and deep gorges of the high borderland. It would be a massacre. The cavalry which had frittered away the morning so uselessly would hunt the survivors through the hills, and all that was needed to begin that wild and slaughterous chase was for Massena's infantry to break through the last defences above Fuentes de Onoro. The French now held the village and the graveyard. Their leading soldiers were just feet beneath the ridge's summit that was crowned with redcoats and Portuguese blasting volleys that fountained soil among the graves and rattled sharply against the village walls. The surviving Highlanders had retreated to the ridge with the Warwickshire men, who had lived through the mauling fight in the streets, and now they had been joined by Portuguese caçadores, redcoats from the English shires, skirmishers from the valleys of Wales, and by Hanoverians loyal to King George III. All mingled as they stood shoulder to shoulder to hold the heights and drown Fuentes de Onoro in smoke and lead. And in the village, the streets were crowded with French infantry, who were waiting for the order to make the last victorious assault up and out of the smoking houses, across the broken graveyard wall, over the humped graves and broken stones of the cemetery, and then across the ridge's crest and into the enemy's vulnerable rear. To the left of their charge would be the white-walled, bullet-scarred church on its ledge of rock, while to the right would be the tumbled grey boulders of the stony summit where the British riflemen lurked, and in between those two landmarks the road climbed the grassy, blood-slick chute of which the blue-coated infantry needed to attack to bring France a victory. Massenia now tried to make the victory certain by sending forward ten fresh battalions of infantry. Wellington, he knew, could defend the slope above the village only by bringing in men who were guarding other parts of the ridge. If Massenia could weaken another section of the ridge, it would open an alternative path to the plateau. But to do that, he must first turn the saddle of grassland above the village into a place of death. The French reinforcements crossed the plain in two great columns, and their appearance provoked the fire of every British cannon on the ridge. Case shots slashed across the stream to burst in livid smoke, round shot crashed through the ranks, while shells lobbed from the short-barreled howitzers fizzed to leave smoky trails arcing in the sky before cracking open in the column's hearts. Yet still the columns came. Drama boys beat them on, and the eagles showed bright above as they marched past the dead of the previous attacks. It seemed to some of the French that they walked towards the very gate of hell, towards a smoke-wreathed moor spitting flame and stinking from three days of death. To north and south the meadows lay in spring freshness, but on the banks of Fuentes de Onoro's stream there was nothing but blasted trees, burned houses, fallen walls, dead, dying, and screaming men. And on the plateau's crest above the village there was just smoke and more smoke as the cannons and rifles and muskets hammered at the men waiting to make their huge assault. The battle had been shrunken to this one place, to these last few feet of the slope above Fuentes de Onoro. It was midday, and the sun was fierce and the shadows short as the ten new battalions broke their ranks to run through the gardens and down the eastern bank of the stream. They splashed through the water and ran up into streets choked with bloody bodies and groaning, slow-moving, wounded men. The fresh attackers cheered as they ran, encouraging themselves and the waiting French infantry to one last supreme effort. They filled the streets, then they burst in huge streams from the alley and laneway entrances at the top of the village, and there were so many attackers that the last of the newly arrived columns were still crossing the stream as the leading companies swarmed over the graveyard wall and up into the volley fire. Men fell to the allied volleys, but more men came behind to clamber over the dead and the dying and to struggle across the graves. Other men ran up the road alongside the cemetery. One whole battalion swerved to the right to fire up at the riflemen on the rocky knoll, and their musket fire overwhelmed and drove the green jackets back from the boulders. A Frenchman climbed to the knoll's summit where he waved his hat before pitching down with a rifle bullet in his lungs. More Frenchmen clambered up the slabs from where they could look down on the great victorious surge of their comrades who were fighting up the last few bloody inches of the slope. The attackers passed the Frenchmen left dead from the previous attacks. They climbed at last onto grass untouched by blood, and then they reached the ragged place where the wadding of the Allied muskets had scorched and burned the turf. And still they climbed and still their officers and sergeants shouted them on, 
and still the drummer boys beat their attack rhythm to drive this vast wave up and across the plateau's lip. Massania's infantrymen were doing all that the marshal had wanted them to do. They were climbing into the horror of the rolling volleys, and climbing over their own dead, so many dead that the survivors seemed dipped in blood, and the British and Portuguese and Germans were being forced back step by step, as still more men came from the village to press up behind and replace the men who fell to the awful volley fire. A cheer arose as the leading Frenchman gained the ridge's summit. A whole company of voltigeurs had run to the church to use its wall and rock foundations as a shelter from the musketry, and now those men clambered up the last few feet and bayoneted some redcoats defending the church door, then burst inside to find the flagged floor filled with wounded men. Doctors soared at shattered arms and bleeding legs as the French voltigeur ran to the windows and opened fire. One of the voltigeurs was hit by a rifle bullet and left a sliding trail of blood on the whitewashed wall as he sagged to the floor. The other voltigeurs ducked as they reloaded, but when they took aim across the window's ledges they could see deep across the plateau into the heart of Wellington's position. Close by they could see the wagons of the ammunition park, and one of the voltigeurs laughed as he made an English officer scamper for safety with a shot that drove a long splinter out of a wagon's side. The doctors shouted a protest as the noise and smoke of the musketry filled the church, but the voltigeur commander told them to shut the hell up and keep on working. On the road outside the church, a surge of French attackers reinforced the heroes who had captured the ridge's crest, and who now threatened to break the enemy army in two before they scattered it to the merciless blades of the frustrated cavalry. Massenia saw his blue coats gain the far skyline, and he felt a great burden drop from his soul. Sometimes he thought the hardest part of being a general lay in the necessity of disguising worry. All day he pretended a confidence he had not altogether felt. For the wretched Major Duco had been right when he had said that Wellington loved nothing better than defending a hill, and Massenia had watched Fuentes de Oñoro's hill and worried that his brave men would never spill over its lip to the rich harvest of victory beyond. Now they were over. The battle was won, and Massenia had no further need to hide his anxiety. He laughed aloud, smiled on his entourage, and accepted a flask of brandy with which to toast his victory. And victory was sweet, so sweet. Send Lou forward, Massenia now commanded. Tell him to clear the road through the village. We can't deliver supplies through streets choked with dead. Tell him the battle's won, so he can take his whore with him if he can't bear to untie her apron strings from round his neck. He laughed again. Her life was suddenly so very, very good. There were two battalions standing ready near the church, one famous and the other infamous. The famous battalion was the 74th, Highlanders all, and known for their hard steadiness in battle. The Scotsmen were eager to take revenge for the losses suffered by their sister regiment in Fuentes de Oñoro's bloody streets. And to help them was the 88th, the infamous battalion, reckoned to be as near ungovernable as any regiment in the army, though no one had ever complained about their ability in battle. The 88th was a hard, brawling regiment, its men as proud of their fighting record as of their homeland, and that homeland was the wild, bleak, and beautiful west of Ireland. The 88th were the Connaught Rangers, and now, with the 74th from the Scottish mountains, they would be sent to save Wellington's army. The French hold on the ridge's crest was tightening as more men reached the road summit. There was no time to deploy the Scots or Irish into line, only to throw them forward in column of sections at the very centre of the enemy's line. In it, boys! an officer shouted. Then the two battalions were running forward. Pipes played the Scotsman on, and wild cheers marked the Connaught advance. Both regiments went fast, eager to get the moment over. The thin mingled line of Allied infantry split to let the columns through, then fell in behind as the front ranks of the Irish and Scots slammed into the advancing French. There was no time for musketry, and no chance for men to hold back from hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The French knew that victory was theirs if they could just defeat this last enemy effort while the Scots and Irish knew that their only chance of victory depended on them throwing the French off the ridge's crest. And so they struck home. Most infantry would have checked their charge a few paces short of an enemy line to pour in a volley of musketry, in the hope that the enemy would retreat rather than accept the challenge and horror of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. But the Highlanders and the men of Connaught offered the French no such chance. The front ranks charged bodily into the French attackers and used their bayonets. They screamed war cries in Gaelic and Erse, 
They clawed and spat and clubbed and kicked and stabbed, and all the time more men piled in behind as the rear ranks of the columns collapsed onto the fight. Highland officers slashed with their heavy claymores, while the Irish officers stabbed with the lighter infantry sword. Sergeants drove spontoons hard into the mass of Frenchmen, skewering them with a pikehead, twisting it free and driving it forward again. Inch by inch the counterattack advanced. This was fighting as the Highlanders had always known it, hand to hand and smelling your enemy's blood as you killed him. And it was the kind of fighting for which the Irish were as feared in their own army as among the enemy. They thrust forward, at times so close packed with the enemy that it was the sheer weight of men rather than the edge of their weapons that forced progress. Men slipped and sprawled on the bodies that lay on the saddle's lip, but the press of men behind thrust the men in front onwards, and suddenly the French were going back down the steep hill, and their grudging retreat became a spilling flight for the safety of the houses. Riflemen retook the knoll of rocks as Portuguese soldiers hunted down and killed the voltigeur inside the church. Irishmen and Scotsmen led the wild, screaming, bloody countercharge down through the graveyard, and for a moment it seemed as though the ridge, the battle, and the army were saved. Then the French struck again. Brigadier Lou understood that Massena would not offer him a chance to make a name in the battle, but that didn't mean he would accept the marshal's animosity. Lou understood Massena's distrust and did not particularly object, for he believed that a soldier made his own chances. The art of advancement was to wait patiently until an opportunity offered itself, and then to move as fast as a striking snake, and now that his brigade had been ordered to its menial task of clearing the main road through and beyond the village of Fuentes de Onoro, the brigadier would watch for any opportunity that would allow him to release his superbly trained and hard-fighting men to a task more suited to their skills. His journey across the plain was placid. The fighting boiled at the top of the pass above the village, but the British guns seemed not to notice the advance of a single small brigade. A couple of round shots struck his infantrymen, and one case shot exploded wide of his grey dragoons, but otherwise the Lou Brigade's advance was untroubled by the enemy. The brigade's two infantry battalions marched in column either side of the road. The dragoons flanked them in two large squadrons, while Lou himself, beneath his savage wolf-tail banner, rode in the centre of the formation. Juanita de Elia rode with him. She'd insisted on witnessing the battle's closing stages, and Marshal Massena's confident assurance that the battle was won had persuaded Lou it was safe enough for Juanita to ride at least as far as the Dos Casas' eastern bank. The paucity of British artillery fire seemed to vindicate Massena's confidence. Lou dismounted his dragoons outside the village gardens. The horses were picketed in a battered orchard where they would remain while the dragoons cleared the road east of the stream. There were not many abstractions here to slow the progress of the heavy baggage wagons carrying Almeida's relief supplies, merely one collapsed wall and a few blackening corpses left from the British gunfire. So once the dragoons had cleared the passage, they were ordered to cross the ford and start on the larger job inside the village proper. Lou ordered Juanita to stay with the horses while he marched his two battalions of infantry around the village's northern flank so that they could begin clearing the main street from the top of the hill, working their way down to meet the dragoons coming up from the stream. You don't have to be careful with the wounded, he told his men. We're not a damned rescue mission. Our job is to clear the street, not nurse injured men. So just throw the casualties aside until the doctors arrive. Just clear the way, that's all, because the sooner the road's clear, the sooner we can put some guns on the ridge to finish off the goddams. To work! He led his men up around the village. A few scattered skirmishers' bullets came from the heights above to remind the grey-clad infantry that this was still not a battle won, and Lou, striding eagerly ahead of his men, noted that the fighting was still very close to the plateau's lip, and then a great cheer from the ridge announced that the battle could yet be lost. For the cheer marked the moment when a phalanx of red-coated infantry drove in the French attack and thrust it back across the crest. Now. Beneath their bright flags, the British counterattack was storming down the slope towards the village. French voltigeurs were abandoning the high rocks and fleeing down the slope to find safety behind the village's stone walls. A sudden panic had gripped the leading French grenadiers who were giving ground to the vengeful redcoats, but Lou felt nothing but elation. God, it seemed, was working to a different plan than Marshal André Massena. The street clearance could wait, 
for suddenly Lou's opportunity had come. Providence had placed his brigade on the left flank of the Irish counterattack. The redcoats were screaming down the hill, bayoneting and clubbing their enemies, oblivious of the two waiting battalions of fresh infantry. Behind the Irish came a disorganised mass of allied infantry, all sucked pell-mell into this new battle for mastery of Fuentes de Onoro's blood-glutted streets. Fix bayonets! Lou called, and drew his own straight-bladed dragoon sword. So, Masenia had thought to keep his brigade from glory. Lou turned to see that his pagan banner of wolf-tails hanging from an eagle's crossbar was held high, and then, as the counter-attacking British troops poured into the village streets, he ordered the advance. Like a whirlpool that sucked every scrap of flotsam into its destructive vortex, the village had again become a place of close-quarter killing. Vive la Brigade! Lou shouted, and plunged into the fight. Sharp eased the green jacket off the dead rifleman. The man had been one of the sharpshooters on the rocky knoll, but he'd been shot by a voltigeur at the high point of the French attack, and now Sharp pulled the bloody jacket off the stiff, awkward arms. Perkins, here! He threw the green jacket to the rifleman. Get your girl to shorten the sleeves. Yes, sir. Or date yourself, Perkins, Harper added. I'm not good with a needle, Sarge. That's what Miranda says, too, Harper said and the rifleman laughed. Sharp walked to the rocks above the village. He'd brought his rifleman back unscathed from their errand to the light division, only to find that Major Tarrant had no new orders for him. The battle had become a vicious fight over mastery of the village, its graveyard, and the church above, and men were not using ammunition so much as sword, bayonet, and musket stock. Captain Donoghue had wanted permission to join the men firing at the French from the crest's ridge, but Tarrant had been so worried by the proximity of the attackers that he'd ordered the Real Compagnia Irlandesa to stay close to the ammunition wagons that he was busily having harnessed to their horses or oxen. If we must retreat, he had told Sharp, it'll be chaos, but a man must be ready. The Real Compagnia Irlandesa made a thin line between the wagons and the fighting, but then the attack of the 74th Highlanders and the Connaught Rangers had eased Tarrant's urgency. Oh, my soul, Sharp, it's hop work. Colonel Runciman had been hovering around the ammunition wagons, fidgeting and worrying, but now he came forward to catch a glimpse of the turmoil in the village beneath. He gave his horse's reins to one of the riflemen and peered nervously over the crest of the fighting beneath. It was hop work indeed. The village, left reeking and smoking from the earlier battles fought through its streets, was once again a maelstrom of musket smoke, screams and blood. The 74th and 88th had driven deep into the labyrinth of houses, but now their progress was slowing as the French defences thickened. The French howitzers on the other stream bank had begun lobbing shells into the graveyard and upper houses, adding to the smoke and noise. Runciman shuddered at the horrid sight, then stepped back two paces, only to stumble on a dead voltigeur, whose body marked the deepest point of penetration reached by the French. Runciman frowned at the body. Why do they call them volters? he asked. Volters? Sharp asked, not understanding the question. Voltigeur, Sharp, Ransomman explained. French for Walter. Sharp shook his head. God no, sir. Because they jump like face, sir, when you shoot at them. But don't worry yourself about that one, sir. Harper had seen the look of worry on Ransomman's face. He's a good Voltigeur, that one. He's dead. Wellington wasn't far away from Sharp and Ransomman. The general was sitting on his horse on the bloody dip of land where the road crossed the ridge between the church and the rocks and behind him was nothing except the army's baggage and ammunition park. To the north and west, his divisions guarded the plateau against the French threat. But here in the centre, where the enemy had so nearly broken through, there was nothing left. There were no more reserves, and he would not thin the ridge's other defenders and so open a back door to French victory. The battle would have to be won by his Highlanders and Irishmen, and so far they were rewarding his faith by retaking the village house by bloody house and cattle shed by burning cattle shed. Then the grey infantry struck from the flank. Sharp saw the wolf-tail banner in the smoke. For a second he froze. He wanted to pretend he hadn't seen it. He wanted an excuse, any excuse, not to go down that awful slope to a village so reeking with death that the air alone was enough to make a man vomit. He'd fought once already inside Fuentes de Onoro, and once was surely enough. 
but his hesitation was only for a heartbeat. He knew there was no excuse. His enemy had come to Fuentes de Onuro to claim victory, and Sharp must stop him. He turned. Sergeant Harper, my compliments to Captain Donoghue, and ask him to form column. Go on, hurry! Sharp looked at his men, his handful of good men from the bloody fighting 95th. Hold up, lads. Time to go to work. W what are you doing, Sharp? Runciman asked. You want to beat our court of inquiry, General? Sharp asked. Runciman gaped at Sharp, not understanding why the question had been asked. Oh, I yes, of course, he managed to say. Then go over to Wellington, General, Sharp said, and ask his lordship's permission to lead the Real Compagnia Irlandesa into battle. Runciman blanched. You mean... He began, but could not articulate the horror. He glanced down at the village that had been turned into a slaughterhouse. You mean... He began again and then his mouth fell slackly open at the very thought of going down into that smoking hell. I'll ask if you don't, Sharp said. For Christ's sake, sir, gallantry forgives everything. Gallantry means you're a hero. Gallantry gets you a wife. Now, for Christ's sake, do it! He shouted at Runciman as though the colonel was a raw recruit. Runciman looked startled. Well, you come with me, Sharp. He was as frightened of approaching Wellington as he was of going towards the enemy. Come on! Sharp snapped and led a flustered Runciman towards the sombre knot of staff officers who surrounded Wellington. Hogan was there, watching anxiously as the tide of struggle in the village turned against the Allies once more. The French were inching uphill, forcing the redcoats and the Portuguese and the German infantry back out of the village, only this time there were no ranks of muskets waiting at the crest of the ridge to blast the enemy as they climbed the road and overran the churned-up graveyard. Runciman hung back as the two men reached the staff officers, but Sharp pushed his way through the horses and dragged the reluctant colonel with him. Ask him, Sharp said. Wellington heard the words and frowned at the two men. Colonel Runciman hesitated, snatched off his hat, tried to speak, and only managed an incoherent stutter. General Runciman wants permission, my lord, Sharp began coldly, to take the Irish into battle. Runciman managed to complete the sentence in a barely coherent rush. Please, my lord. Some of the staff officers smiled at the thought of the wagon master general leading troops, but Wellington twisted in his saddle to see that the red-jacketed Real Compagnia Irlandesa had formed column. It looked a pathetically small unit, but it was there, formed, armed, and evidently eager. There was no one else. The general looked at Sharp and raised an eyebrow. Sharp nodded. Carry on, Runciman, Wellington said. Come on, sir. Sharp plucked the fat man's sleeve to pull him away from the general. One moment. The general's voice was frigid. Captain Sharp. Sharp turned back. My lord? The reason, Captain Sharp, why we do not execute enemy prisoners, no matter how vile their behavior, is that the enemy will reciprocate the favor on our men, no matter how small their provocation. The general looked at Sharp with an eye as cold as a winter stream. Do I make myself clear, Captain Sharp? Yes, sir, my lord. Wellington gave a very small nod. Go. Sharp dragged Runciman away. Come on, sir! What do I do, Sharp? Runciman asked. For God's sake, I mean, what do I do? I, I'm not a fighter. Stay at the back, sir, Sharp said, and leave everything else to me. Sharp scraped his long sword free. Captain Donoghue! Captain Sharp! Donoghue was pale. General Wellington requests, Sharp shouted loudly enough for every man in the Real Compagnia Irlandesa to hear him, that the King of Spain's bodyguard goes down to the village and kills every goddamn Frenchman it finds. And the Connaught Rangers are down there, Captain, and they need a morsel of Irish help. Are you ready? Donoghue drew his own sword. Perhaps you would do the honour of taking us down, Captain. Sharp beckoned his riflemen into the ranks. There'd be no skirmishes here, no delicate long-range killing, only a blood-soaked brawl in a godforsaken village on the edge of Spain where Sharp's sworn enemy had come to turn defeat into victory. Big Spanets! Sharp called. For a second or two, he was assailed with the strange thought that this was just how Lord Keeley had wanted his men to fight. His lordship had simply wanted to throw his men into a suicidal battle. 
and this place was as good as any for that kind of gesture. No training could prepare a man for this battle. This was gutter fighting, and it was either born into a man's bones, or it was absent forever. And forward! Sharp shouted. At the double! And he led the small unit up the road to the ridge's crest, where the soil was torn by enemy round shot, then over the skyline and down. Down into the smoke, the blood, and the slaughter. Chapter 11 Bodies lay sprawled on the upper slope. Some were motionless, others still stirred slowly with the remnants of life. A highlander vomited blood, then collapsed across a grave that had been so churned by shell and round shot that the pelvic and wrist bones of a corpse lay among the soil. A French drummer boy sat beside the road with his hands clasped over his spilt guts. His drumsticks were still stuck in his crossbelt. He looked up mutely as Sharp ran past, then began to cry. A green jacket lay dead from one of the very first attacks. A bent French bayonet was stuck in his ribs, just above a distended blackened belly that was thick with flies. A shell cracked apart beside the body, and scraps of its casing whistled past Sharp's head. One of the guardsmen was hit, and fell, tripping two men behind him. Harper shouted at them to leave the man alone. "'Keep running!' he called harshly. "'Keep running! Let the bugger look after himself! Come on!' Halfway to the village, the road curved sharply to the right. Sharp left the road there, jumping down a small embankment into a patch of scrubland. He could see the Lou Brigade not far ahead. The grey infantry had plunged into the village from the north and were now threatening to cut the 88th into two parts. Lou's attack had first arrested the momentum of the British counterattack, then reversed it. And to Sharp's right, he could see redcoats retreating out of the village to find shelter behind the remnants of the graveyard wall. A swarm of Frenchmen were pushing up from the village's lower houses, roused to one last brave effort by the example of Lou's brigade. But Lou's brigade now had an enemy of its own. A small enemy, but one with something to prove. Sharp led the Real Compagnia Elandesa through the scrubland, over a tiny plot of parched beans. Then he was leaping down another low embankment and running hard towards the flank of the nearest grey infantry battalion. Kill them! Sharp shouted. Kill them! It was a horrid, savage, and appropriate battle cry for the Real Compagnie Landesa was outnumbered, and unless they fell on the enemy with a hungry ferocity, they'd be repelled and broken. This fight would depend on savagery. Kill the bastards! Sharp screamed. Fear was huge inside him now, making his voice harsh and desperate. His belly was sour with terror, but he'd long learned that the enemy suffered just the same fear, and that to yield to it was to invite disaster. The key to this fight's survival lay in closing on the enemy fast, in crossing the open space where their muskets could kill, and so getting his men hard into the enemy's ranks where the fight would degenerate into a street brawl. And so he screamed his awful encouragement, even as he wondered if his courage would fail and drive him to seek shelter behind one of the broken walls. But at the same time he was judging the enemy ahead. There was an alley crammed with enemy immediately in front of Sharp, and to its left a low wall enclosing a garden. Some of Lou's men had crossed a fallen wall into the garden, but most were pushing through the alley towards the bigger fight raging in the village's centre. Sharp headed for the alley. Frenchmen turned and called him warning. One man fired his musket to shroud the alley's entrance with white smoke. Then Sharp crashed into the rearmost grey ranks and slammed his sword forward. The relief of contact was enormous, releasing a terrible energy that he poured into the wickedly sharp sword blade. Men arrived either side of him with bayonets. They were screaming and stabbing, men in whom terror was similarly being turned into a barbaric frenzy. Other guardsmen had gone to clear the garden, while Donahue was fighting his way into another alley lower down the slope. It was a gutter fight, and if for the first few moments Sharp's men found it easier than they had expected, that was because they'd assaulted the rearmost of Lou's ranks, the place where the men least enthusiastic about fighting like animals in narrow streets had taken refuge. Yet the longer Sharp's men fought, the closer they came to lose best fighters, and the harder the fight proved. Sharp saw a big moustached sergeant working his way back through the ranks and rallying the men as he came. The sergeant was shouting, hitting men, forcing the cowardly to turn and use their bayonets on the new attackers. But then his head snapped back and was surrounded with a momentary red mist of blood droplets as a rifle bullet killed him. 
Hagman and Cooper had found a rooftop from which to serve as sharpshooters. Sharp stepped over bodies, hammered muskets aside, then stabbed with his sword. There was no room for slashing strokes, only a tight space in which to jab and ram and twist the blade. The only leadership required of him now was to be seen fighting, and the Real Compañía Irlandesa followed him willingly. It was as if they had been let off a leash, and they fought like fiends as they cleared first one alley and then the next. The French retreated from a bitter attack, looking for an easier place to defend. Donahue, his face and uniform spattered with blood, rejoined Sharp in a small triangular plaza where the two alleys met. A dead Frenchman lay on a dung heap, another blocked a door. There were bodies shoved into the gutters, bodies piled inside houses and bodies heaped against walls. The piles of dead showed the battle's progression, with skirmishes from the first day covered with Frenchmen, then Highlanders, then French grenadiers in their massive bearskin hats beneath more redcoats and now loose grey uniforms made a new top layer. The stench of death was thick as fog. The ruts in the earthen road where they showed between the corpses were flooded with blood. The streets were glutted by death, and choked with men seeking to glut them more. Hagman and Cooper jumped from one broken roof to another. Boss is your left, sir! Cooper called from his eyrie, indicating an alley that ran crookedly downhill from the small triangular plaza. The French had withdrawn far enough to give Sharp's men a pause, in which they could reload or else wrap dirty strips of cloth round slashed hands and arms. Some men drank from their hoarded rum issue. A few were wholly drunk, but they would fight all the better for it, and Sharp didn't mind. Bastards are coming, Sharp! Cooper called in warning. Bennett's! Sharp called. Now come on! He drew out the last word as he led his men into the alley. It was scarcely six feet wide. No room to swing a sword. The first bend was just ten feet away, and Sharp reached it at the same time as a rush of Frenchmen. Sharp felt a bayonet catch in his jacket, heard the cloth rip. Then he was punching the iron hilt of his sword into a moustached face. He was fighting a grenadier who snarled through bleeding lips with yellow rotted teeth as he tried to kick Sharp in the crutch. Sharp hammered the sword down, but the blow was cushioned by the black, greasy fur of the thick bearskin. The man's breath was fetid. The grenadier had let go of his musket and was trying to throttle Sharp. But Sharp seized the upper blade of his sword with his left hand, kept tight hold of the hilt with his right, and rammed the blade hard into the Frenchman's throat. He pushed the grenadier's head back so far that he could see the whites of his eyes, and still the man would not let go of his throat. So Sharp just slid the blade to his right, slid once, and his world turned red as the sword sliced into the Frenchman's jugular. He clambered over the twitching body of the dying grenadier. Rum-crazed guardsmen were slashing with bayonets, hitting with musket stocks, kicking and screaming at an enemy who could not match this ferocity. Guardsman Rourke had broken his musket and had picked up a blackened roof beam instead and was now ramming the heavy timber forward at the Frenchman's faces. The enemy began to edge backwards. An officer from Lou's brigade tried to rally them, but Hagman picked him off from a rooftop and the enemy's grudging retreat turned into a sudden rout. One Frenchman took refuge in a house where he lost his head by firing from a window on the advancing guardsman. A rush of Irishmen stormed the house and killed every French fugitive inside. God save Ireland! Harper dropped down beside Sharp. Jesus, but it's hard work. He was breathing hoarsely. Christ, sir, have you seen yourself? Drenched in blood, so you are. Not mine, Pat. Sharp coughed blood out of his eyes. He'd reached the corner of a street which led into the village's heart. A dead French officer lay in the centre of the street, his mouth open and crawling with flies. Someone had already cut open his pockets, seams and pouches, and discarded a crude chess set with a board made of painted canvas, court pieces of carved wood, and pawns from musket balls. Sharp could smell the corpse as he crouched at the street corner, and tried to divine the battle's course from the tangle of noise and smoke. He sensed he was behind the enemy now, and that if he could just attack to his right, then he'd be threatening to cut off Lou's grey infantry and the bearskin grenadiers who were now inextricably mixed together. If the enemy thought they were about to be surrounded, they'd probably retreat, and that retreat could lead to a wholesale French withdrawal. It could lead to victory. Harper peered round the corner. Thousands of the buggers, he said. He was carrying a spontoon that he'd picked up from a dead Connaught sergeant. It snapped off four feet of the pike to make it a handier weapon for the grim business of killing in a confined space. He looked at the plundered French officer in the street. 
No money in that chest set, he said grimly. Do you remember that sergeant of Pisaco who found the silver chessman? He hefted the spontoon. Just send me a rich dead officer, please, God. No one will get rich of me, Sharp said grimly, then peered round the corner to see a barricade of dead grenadiers blocking the street with a mass of French infantry waiting behind them. Who's loaded? Sharp asked the men crouching near him. To the front, he ordered the half-dozen men who raised their hands. Hurry now, we go round the corner, he told them. You wait for my word, you kneel, you fire, and then you charge like hell. Pat, you bring the rest five paces behind. Sharp was leading a mongrel mix of riflemen, Connaught rangers, highlanders, guardsmen, and casadores. Ready, boys? He grinned at them from a face smeared with enemy blood. Then come on! He screamed the last word as he led his men around the corner. The French behind the barricade obliged Sharp by firing straight away, panicked by the awful screams of the attackers into firing too soon and firing too high. Halt! Kneel! Sharp stood among the kneeling men. Aim! Harper was already leading the second charge out of the alley. Fire! Sharp shouted, and the volley whipped over the dead grenadiers as Sharp's men charged out of the smoke and scrambled over the warm heap of bloody dead. The French ahead of Sharp were desperately reloading, but their fixed bayonets impeded their ramrods, and they were still trying to load their muskets when Sharp's charge smashed home, and the killing began again. Sharp's sword arm was weary, his throat was hoarse from shouting, and his eyes were stinging from powder smoke, sweat and blood, but there could be no rest. He rammed the sword home, twisted it, pulled it out, then rammed it forward again. A Frenchman aimed his musket at Sharp, pulled the trigger, and was rewarded with a hangfire as the powder in the pan caught fire, but did not set off the charge inside the barrel. The man screamed as the sword stabbed home. Sharp was so weary from the killing that he was holding the big sword two-handed, his right hand on the hilt and his left gripping the lowest part of the blade so that he could shove it hard into the press of men. The crush of bodies was so great that there were times when he could hardly move and so he'd claw at the faces nearest him, kick and bite and butt with his head, until the damned French moved or fell or died, and he'd climb over another body and snarl forward with the bloody sword dripping. Harper caught up with him. The spontoon's foot-long sharpened steel spearhead had a small crossbar at its base to prevent the weapon being driven too deep into an enemy horse or man, and Harper was repeatedly burying the blade clear to the crosspiece then kicking and twisting to loosen the weapon before thrusting forward again. Once, when a French sergeant tried to rally a group of men, Harper lifted a dying man on the end of the truncated spear and used his thrashing body as a bleeding and screaming battering ram that he slammed into the enemy ranks. A pair of bloody-faced Connaught rangers had attached themselves to Harper, and the three were chanting their war cries in Irish. A rush of Highlanders came out of a lane on Sharp's right. He sensed that the battle was turning. They were attacking downhill now, not defending uphill, and the grey infantry of Lou's brigade was going back with the rest. He unclenched his left hand from the lower blade of the sword and saw he'd cut his palm open. A musket flamed from a window to his left, and a guardsman went spinning down, gasping. Captain Donoghue led a charge into the roofless house that echoed with shouts as French fugitives were hunted through the tiny rooms and back into the pig shed. A terrible roar of triumph sounded to Sharp's right, as a company of Connaught rangers trapped two companies of Frenchmen in a blind alley. The Irish began working their bloody way to the alley's end, and no officer dared try to stop their slaughter. Down on the grassland north of Pocovelia, this battle had seen the most delicate of drill manoeuvres save the light division. Now it was witnessing a primitive, wild fighting out of the most gruesome nightmare that might yet save the whole army. Left! Harper called and Sharp turned to see a rush of grey uniformed Frenchmen coming through an alley. The guardsmen no longer needed orders to counterattack. They just swarmed into the alley and screamed a wild, keening noise as they laid into the enemy. The Real Compañía Irlandesa had been caught up by the sublime joy of a victorious and killing fight. One man took a bullet in the chest and noticed nothing, but just went on stabbing and swinging his musket. Donoghue had long ceased trying to exercise control. Instead, he was fighting like his men, grinning horribly from a face made awful by blood, smoke, sweat, and strain. Seen Runcivant? Sharp asked him. No. He'll live, Sharp said. He ain't the kind to die in battle. And we are? Donahue asked. God knows. Sharp was resting for a moment in an angle of wall. 
His breath came in great gasps. Have you seen Loop? he asked Harper. Not a sign of the bogger, sir, Harper answered. But I'm saving this for him. He touched the clustered barrels of his volley gun that was slung on his back. Bastard's mine, Sharp said. A cheer announced another rush forward somewhere in the village. The French were going back everywhere, and Sharp knew this was the time to keep the enemy from holding or regrouping. He led a squad of men through a house, stepping over two French corpses and one dead Highlander to emerge into the small backyard. He kicked open the yard's gate and saw Frenchmen just yards away. Come on! He screamed the last word as he ran into the street and led his men against the remnants of a barricade. Muskets flared and flamed. Something slapped against the stock of Sharp's slung rifle. Then he was hacking the sword over the barricade, and guardsmen were hauling the carts and benches and burning straw bales aside. A house was on fire nearby, and the smoke made Sharp cough as he kicked his way through the last obstacles and parried a bayonet lunged by a small, wiry French sergeant. Harper skewered the man with his spontoon. The stream was just feet away. A French gun fired, blasting canister up the main road and twitching a dozen Highlanders aside. Then the French gunners were masked as a rush of Frenchmen tried to escape the vengeful Allied counterattack by fleeing back over the Dos Casas stream. A bellowing voice sounded to Sharp's right, and he saw it was Lou himself trying to rally the French. The brigadier was standing on the remnants of the old stone clapper bridge, where he swore at the running Frenchmen and tried to turn them back with his sword. Harper unslung his seven-barrel gun, but Sharp pushed it down. Bugger's mine, Pat! Some redcoats were pursuing the French over the stream as Sharp ran towards the bridge. Lou! You bastard, Lou! he shouted. Lou! The brigadier turned and saw the blood-soaked rifleman running towards him. Lou jumped off the bridge as Sharp splashed into the stream, and the two men met halfway, thigh deep in a pool made by a dam of bodies and discoloured by their blood. The swords clashed. Lou lunged, but Sharp parried and swung, only to have his own blow parried. He kicked at Lou's knee, but the deep water impeded him, and he almost fell and opened himself to a scything swing of Lou's straight sword. But Sharp recovered at the last moment and deflected the blow with the hilt of his sword, which he rammed forward at Lou's wall eye. The brigadier stepped hurriedly back, tripped, but gained his balance with another vicious swing of the sword. The wider battle was still being fought, but both the British and the French left the two swordsmen alone. The French were going to earth in the walls and gardens of the stream's eastern bank, where their first attacks of the day had started, while the British and Portuguese were hunting the last enemy out of the village proper. While in the stream, the two battle-crazed men swung their clumsy swords like clubs. They were evenly matched. Lou was the better swordsman, but he lacked Sharp's height and reach, and he was more accustomed to fighting on horseback than on foot. The two swung, stabbed, and parried in a grotesque mockery of the fine art of fencing. Their movements were slowed by the stream and by their tiredness, while the finesse of sword-fighting was wasted on blades as long and cumbersome as heavy cavalry swords. The sound of the two swords was reminiscent of a blacksmith's shop. Bastard! Sharp said and cut. Bastard! he said again and rammed the point forward. Lou parried the lunge. This is for my two murdered men, he said, and cut the sword upward, forcing Sharp to an awkward parry. Lou spat an insult, then lunged his sword at Sharp's face, making the rifleman stagger sideways. Sharp returned the lunge and shouted in triumph as his sword sliced into Lou's midriff but he'd only succeeded in piercing the Frenchman's sabretache that now trapped the point of his sword as Lou waded forward to give the killing blow. Sharp stepped forward as well, closing the gap to stop the lunge and butting with his head as he got close. The Frenchman avoided the butt and brought up his knee. Sharp hit him with his left hand, then wrenched his sword free and hit Lou with a hilt just as the brigadier's sword guard clouted him stingingly on the left side of his head. The two men reeled apart. They stared at each other. But they no longer traded insults, for they needed all their strength for the fight. Muskets snapped across the stream, but still no one interfered with the duelists, recognizing that they were fighting the battle of honor that belonged to them alone. A group of grey uniformed men watched from the eastern bank, while a mix of riflemen, guardsmen, rangers, and highlanders cheered Sharp from the west. Sharp scooped water up with his left hand and spashed it on his mouth. He licked his lips. Time to finish you! he said thickly and waded forward. Lou raised his sword as Sharp swung, 
parried the blow, then parried again. Sharp had found a new, desperate energy, and he gave the Frenchman stroke after stroke, huge strokes, great slashing cuts of the heavy sword that beat down Lou's guard, and followed each other so fast that the Frenchman had no time to disengage and turn his own blade into the attack. He went back, beaten by Sharp's strength, and blow by blow his defence weakened as Sharp, teeth gritted, went on swinging. One last blow rang on Lou's upheld sword to drive the grey Frenchman down onto his knees in the water and Sharp screamed his victory as he raised the sword for one last terrible strike. Watch out, sir! Harper called desperately. Sharp glanced to his left to see a grey uniformed dragoon mounted on a grey horse and with a plume of black shining hair hanging from his helmet to his waist. He was holding a short-barreled carbine aimed dead at Sharp. Sharp stepped back, checking the killing stroke, and saw that the black hair was not a helmet's plume at all. Juanita! he shouted. She would save Lou just as she had once kept Lord Keeley alive, and he should save Keeley to preserve her excuse for staying behind British lines while she would keep Lou alive for love. Juanita! Sharp called, appealing to that one memory of a grey dawn in a grey wolf's bed in the high hills. She smiled. She fired. She turned to flee. But Harper was in the shallows with a seven-barrel gun at his shoulder, and his volley snatched Juanita off her horse in an eruption of blood. A death screech ended before her falling body struck the ground. Sharp was also falling. He'd taken a terrible blow under his right shoulder, and the pain was already flickering like fire down his suddenly nerveless hand. He staggered and went to one knee, and Lou was suddenly over him, sword aloft. Smoke from a burning house wafted over the stream as Lou shouted his victory and brought the sword slamming down. Sharp hooked the Frenchman's right ankle with his left hand and tugged. Lou shouted as he fell. Sharp snarled and dived forward, going beneath the falling sword, and he grabbed his own saw blade with his blood-encrusted left hand so that he was holding the three-foot blade like a quarterstaff that he rammed hard across his enemy's neck. Blood from his shoulder was running down to the stream as he drove the brigadier beneath the water, drove him down to the stream's gravel bed and held him there with a the sword. He locked his right arm straight and held the sword tip with his left and clenched his teeth against the pain in his arm as he used all his weight to hold the smaller man down under the hurrying stream. Bubbles showed in the bloody water and were whirled away. Lou kicked and thrashed, but Sharp held him there kneeling in the stream so that only his head and bloody shoulder were above water, and he kept the sword hard over the dying man's throat to drown the Frenchman like a man would drown a rabid dog. Rifles and muskets splintered from the western bank as Sharp's men drove away Lou's infantry from the eastern bank. Those grey infantry had come forward to rescue their brigadier, but Lou was dying, choking on water and steel, blacking out under the stream. A bullet slapped the water close to Sharp, but he stayed there, ignoring the pain, just holding the sword hard across his enemy's throat. And slowly, slowly, the last bubbles faded. And slowly, slowly, the struggles beneath Sharp ceased. And slowly, slowly, Sharp understood that he'd scotched the beast, and that Lou, his enemy, was dead. And slowly, slowly, Sharp eased away from the body that floated up to the surface, as he staggered bloody and hurting back to the western bank, where Harper caught up with him and hurried him back into the shelter of a bullet-chipped wall. God save Ireland, Harper said as he eased the wet sword out of Sharp's hand. What have you done? One, Pat. Bloody well won. And despite the pain, he grinned, for he was a soldier, and he bloody well had won. Say still, man, for God's sake. The surgeon's voice was slurred and his breath reeked of brandy. He grimaced as he manipulated the probe that was sunk deep in Sharp's shoulder. The surgeon also held a small pair of tweezers that he constantly darted in and out of the open wound to give jabs of pure agony. The goddamn bullet drove in scraps of uniform, he said. Why the hell don't you wear silk? It doesn't fall to pieces. Can't afford silk, Sharp said. The church stank of blood, pus, feces, and urine. It was night time, and Fuentes de Onoro's church was crammed with the wounded of two armies who lay in the smoking rushlight as they waited their turn with the surgeons who would be busy with their hooks and saws and blades all night long. God knows if you'll live, 
The doctor plucked another scrap of bloody wool out of the wound and scraped it off the tweezer's jaws onto his stained apron. He belched a fetid, brandy-flavoured breath over Sharp, then shook his head wearily. Oh, the wound will probably turn septic. They usually do. It'll stink like a leper's latrine. Your arm will drop off, and in ten days' time you'll be dead. Lots of fever before then. You'll jibber like a lunatic and sweat like a horse. And you'll be a hero back home. Of course it hurts, man. Stop whining like a damn child, for Christ's sake. Never could stand whining bloody children. And sit still, man! Sharp sat still. The pain of the probe was excruciating, like having a white-hot flesh hook jammed and twisted into his shoulder joint. He closed his eyes and tried not to listen to the grating sound caused by the surgeon's probe scraping against the bone as he searched for the carbine ball. Ah, got the little bastard. All still? The surgeon found a narrow-nosed set of forceps and eased them into the wound after the probe. You say a woman did it? A woman did it, Sharp said, keeping his eyes closed. A prisoner from Lou's brigade had confirmed that Juanita had indeed advanced with the dragoons. No one in Lou's brigade had thought the French would be dislodged from the village and thrown back over the stream, and so no one had told Juanita the danger. Not that she would have listened. She had been an adventuress who loved the spell of fighting, and now she was dead. So was Lou. And with their death had died General Valverde's last chance of finding a witness to Sharp's confession to having killed the French prisoners and so precipitating the fiasco at San Isidro. There was only one witness left alive, and he'd come at dusk to the church where Sharp had been waiting for the surgeon. They asked me, Runciman had told Sharp excitedly. The colonel had been in the village throughout the fight, and though no one was claiming that the erstwhile wagonmaster general had taken a leading role in the battle, nor was anyone denying that Colonel Runciman had been in the place of greatest danger where he'd neither flinched nor shrunk from the fight. Who asked you what, General? Sharp had responded. Oh, Wellington, and that, that wretched Spanish general. Runciman gabbled in his excitement. They asked me directly, sweet my face. Had you admitted to shooting two Frenchies? That's what they asked me. Sharp flinched as a man screamed under the surgeon's knife. The amputated arms and feet made a grisly pile beside the altar that served as an operating table. They asked you, Sharp said, and you don't tell lies. Oh, so I didn't. Runciman said. I said it was a preposterous question, that, that no gentleman would do such a thing, and that you were an officer, and therefore a gentleman, and that with the greatest of respect to his lordship, I found the question offensive. Runciman bubbled with joy. And Wellington backed me up, told Valverde he wanted to hear no more allegations against British officers, and, and there's to be no court of inquiry either, Sharp. Our conduct today, I'm told, obviates any need to question the sad events of San Isidro. Quite right, too. Sharp had smiled. He had known he was exonerated from the moment that Wellington, just before the Real Compagnia Ilandese's counterattack on the village, had reprimanded him for shooting the French prisoners. But Runciman's excited news was a welcome confirmation of that release. Congratulations, General, Sharp said. So what now? Home, I think. Home, home. Runciman smiled at the thought. Maybe I can be some use in the, in the Hampshire militia. I suggested as much to Wellington, and he was kind enough to agree. The militia, he said, needed men with martial experience, men of, men of vision and, and men with an experience of command, and he was kind enough to suggest that I, I possessed all three qualities. He's a very kind man, Wellington. Haven't you discovered that, Sharp? Very kind, sir, Sharp said dryly, watching the orderlies hold down a man whose leg was quivering as the surgeon's cut at the thigh. Sir, I'm off to England, Runciman said with delight. Dear England, all that good food and sensible religion. And you, Sharp, what of your future? I'll go on killing frogs, General. That's all I'm good for. He glanced at the doctor and saw the man was nearly finished with his previous patient, and he braced himself for the pain to come. And the Real Compagnie Landesa, General? He asked, what happens to them? Kiddies. But they go as heroes, Sharp. A battle won? Almeida still invested, and Massenia scuttling back to Ciudad Rodrigo. Pon my word, Sharp, we're all heroes now. I'm sure your father and mother always said you'd be a hero one day, General. Runciman had shaken his head. No, Sharp, they never did. They were hopeful for me, I don't deny it, and well, no wonder, for they were blessed with only the, the one child, and I was, was that uh, fortunate blessing. And they gave me great gifts, Sharp, great gifts, but not, I think, heroism. Well, you are a hero, sir. Sharp said, and you can tell anyone who asked that I said as much. Sharp held out his right arm, 
and despite the pain shook Runciman's hand. Harper had just appeared at the church doorway and was holding up a bottle to show that there was some consolation waiting when Sharp's bullet was extracted. I'll see you outside, sir, Sharp told Runciman. Unless you want to watch the surgeon pull out the bullet. Oh, oh, good lord, no, Sharp. My dear parents never thought I'd have the, the stomach to study medicine, and I fear they were right. Runciman had gone pale. I shall, uh, I shall let you suffer alone, he said and backed hastily away with a handkerchief held over his mouth in case the noxious effusions of the hospital gave him a sickness. Now the doctor pulled the bullet free of the wound before ramming a dirty rag against Sharp's shoulder to staunch the flow of blood. No bones broken, he said, sounding disappointed. But there are some bone chips off the rib that'll hurt you for a few days. Maybe forever if you live. Want to keep the bullet? he asked Sharp. No, sir. Not as a keepsake for the ladies? the doctor asked then took a flask of brandy from a pocket of his blood-stiffened apron. He took a deep swallow, then used a corner of his bloody apron to wipe the tips of the forceps clean. I know a man in the artillery who has dozens of spent bullets mounted in gold and hung on chains, the surgeon said. He claims each one lodged near his heart. He's got the scar, you see, to prove it. He presents a bullet to every woman he wants to roger, and tells each silly bitch that he dreamt of a woman who looked just like here when he thought he was dying. It works, he says. He's a pig ugly scoundrel, but he reckons the women can't wait to claw his britches down. He offered Sharp the bullet again. Sure you don't want the damn thing? Quite sure. The doctor tossed the bullet aside. I'll get you wrapped up, he said. Keep the bandage damp if you want to live, and don't blame me if you die. He walked unsteadily away, calling for an orderly to bandage Sharp's shoulder. I do hate bloody doctors. Sharp said as he joined Harper outside the church. Meg Grandar said the same thing, the Irishman said as he offered Sharp the bottle of captured brandy. He only saw a doctor once in all his life, and a week later he was dead. Mind you, he was eighty-six at the time. Sharp smiled. See the same one whose bullock dropped off the cliff? Aye, I'm bellowed all the way down. Just like when Grogan's pig fell down a well, I think we laughed for a week. But the damn pig wasn't even scratched, just wet. Sharp smiled. You must tell me about it sometime, Pat. So you're staying with us then? No court of inquiry, Sharp said. Runciman told me. They should never have wanted one in the first place, Harper said scornfully, then took the bottle from Sharp and tipped it to his mouth. They wandered through an encampment smeared with the smoke of cooking fires and haunted with the cries of wounded men left on the battlefield. Those cries faded as Sharp and Harper walked further from the village. Around the fires, men sang of their homes far away. The singing was sentimental enough to give Sharp a pang of homesickness, even though he knew his home was not in England, but here in the army, and he couldn't imagine leaving this home. He was a soldier, and he marched where he was ordered to march, and he killed the king's enemies when he arrived. That was his job and the army was his home, and he loved both, even though he knew he would have to fight like a gutter-born bastard for every step of advancement that other men took for granted. And he knew, too, that he'd never be prized for his birth, or his wit, or his wealth, but would only be reckoned as good as his last fight. But that thought made him smile, for Sharp's last battle had been against the best soldier France had, and Sharp had drowned the bastard like a rat. Sharp had won, Lou was dead, and it was over at last. Sharp's Battle Historical Note The Royal Guard of Spain in Napoleonic times consisted of four companies, the Spanish, American, Italian, and Flemish companies. But alas, no Real Compañía Landesa. There were, however, three Irish regiments in Spanish service, the Irlanda, the Hibernia, and the Eltonia, each composed of Irish exiles and their descendants. The British army, too, had more than its share of Irishmen. Some English county regiments in the peninsula were more than one-third Irish, and if the French could ever have disaffected those men, then the army would have been in a desperate condition. It was in a fairly desperate condition in the spring of 1811, anyway, not because of disaffection, but simply because of numbers. The British government had yet to realise that in Wellington they had at last discovered a general who knew how to fight, and they were still niggardly in sending him troops. The shortfall was partly remedied by the fine Portuguese battalions that were under Wellington's command. 
Some divisions, like the 7th, had more Portuguese than British soldiers, and every account of the war pays tribute to the fighting qualities of those allies. The relationship with the Spanish was never so easy, nor so fruitful, even after General Alava became liaison officer to Wellington. Alava became a close friend to Wellington, and was with him indeed on the field of Waterloo. The Spanish did eventually appoint Wellington the Generalissimo of their armies, but they waited until after the Battle of Salamanca in 1812 had driven the French out of Madrid and central Spain. But in 1811 the French were still very close to Portugal, which they had occupied twice in the previous three years. Ciudad Rodrigo and Barajos barred Wellington's progress into Spain, and until those twin fortresses fell, in early 1812, no one could be certain that the French would not attempt another invasion of Portugal. Such an invasion became much less likely after the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but it would not have been impossible. Fuentes de Onoro was never one of Wellington's favourite battles, which were those that he could recall with some pleasure at his own generalship. Aceya in India is a battle of which he was most proud, and Fuentes de Onoro is probably the one of which he was least proud. He made one of his rare mistakes when he allowed the 7th Division to march so far from the rest of the army but he was rescued by the brilliant performance of the Light Division under Crawford on that Sunday morning. It was a display of soldiering that impressed everyone who witnessed it. The division was far from help. It was surrounded, yet it withdrew safely and took only a handful of casualties. The fighting in the village itself was far worse, little more than a slaughterous brawl that left the streets glutted with the dead and dying. Yet in the end, despite the French bravery and their one glorious moment when they did capture the church and the crest, the British and their allies held the ridge and denied Massenia the road to Almeida. Massenia, disappointed, distributed the rations he'd been carrying for Almeida's garrison among his own hungry army, then marched back to Ciudad Rodrigo. So Wellington, despite his mistake, was left with a victory. But it was a victory soured by the escape of Almeida's garrison. That garrison was being blockaded by Sir William Erskine, who sadly did not have too many lucid intervals. The letter from the horse guards describing Erskine's madness is genuine and shows one of the problems Wellington had in trying to prosecute a war. Erskine did nothing when the French blew up Almeida's defences and slept while the garrison slipped away in the night. The whole lot of them should have been made prisoner, but instead they escaped a feeble blockade and went to reinforce the vast French armies in Spain. Most of those armies were fighting guerrilleros, not British soldiers, and in another year some of them would be fighting an even more terrible enemy, the Russian winter. But the British too have their hardships to come, hardships that Sharp and Harper will share, endure, and happily survive. That was Sharp's Battle by Bernard Cornwall, read by William Gaminara.